Uh, we're really honored to have prominent scholars, experts, and community leaders with us today to discuss this important topic, advancing health equity and the role of law as a means to systemic change through the alteration of current power structures. This year's symposium serves to launch the law school's new health equity law and policy program. Its vision is to create healthier communities and populations by transforming structures grounded in principles of health equity, justice, and inclusion. The mission of this program is to create or enhance positive health outcomes through structural interventions built upon legal and policy analysis. This goal will be achieved through interdisciplinary and community collaboration and innovation in education, research, and service. When we became the 16th college of the University of Illinois Chicago just over two years ago, Amy Campbell joined the UIC law faculty as its inaugural associate dean for law and health sciences. Since joining UIC law and our faculty, associate dean Campbell has worked tirelessly to expand the law school JD curriculum and to create a JD concentration in health equity law and policy. She has worked together with UIC's Department of Disability and Human Development to create a certificate in disability legal studies. She continues to work with other UIC health science colleges to create joint degrees, including the joint JD Masters of Public Health degree. And she continues to develop relationships and to sponsor health equity and ethics initiatives within UIC. So thank you, Dean Campbell, for all of your work to bring this symposium together and all of the work you've done over the last two years. This is the 26th Braun Symposium. It honors the legacy of Mr. Joseph H. Braun and his wife, Belle. Joseph Braun was a prominent member of the Chicago legal community and held a number of positions of distinction. Throughout his career, he exemplified the highest standards of our profession. When Mr. Braun died, in 1989, he made a very generous bequest to the law school in support of a future lecture series. The inaugural Bell R. and Joseph H. Braun Memorial Lecture was held that same year. Since then, we have invited distinguished uh, panels and speakers on various topics, including constitutional law, criminal law, environmental law, international human rights, and technology law. The law school is grateful to Mr. Joseph Braun and the Braun Trust for its continued support of this very special program. Here with us today from the Braun Trust is Mr. Joseph Ament. Mr. Ament's list of accomplishments is extremely impressive. He is a prominent business attorney and a certified public accountant. He's an alumnus of the law school, class of 1962. He's taught tax and business courses at Roosevelt University, where he chaired the Department of Accounting and Taxation for 19 years, and where he was the Samuel W. Spectry Distinguished Professor of Accounting and Taxation. He sits on the Law School's Braun Bequest Fund Lecture Series Committee. Please welcome Mr. Joseph Ament. Good morning. As the Dean commented, my name is Joseph Ament, and I'm from the class of J62A. Good morning. I've been invited to welcome you to the 2021 26th Braun Memorial Symposium, Creating Health Equity, Transformational Opportunities in a Post-Pandemic World. My friend and co-representative of the Braun Fund, Lawrence E. Glick, passed away early this past summer of 2021. Larry's efforts were most influential in creating the Braun Gift and developing the symposium. May his memory be for a blessing. Joseph H. Braun was an alumnus of the John Marshall Law School class of 1918 in a most extraordinary career spanning nearly seven decades. He held positions with the American Automobile Association, the Chicago Motor Club, as general counsel, vice president, corporate secretary, and director. He wrote the Illinois legislation that eventually became the state's first driver license law. He personally put the operators of hundreds of illegal 
speed trap situations behind bars and developed the framework from which most of America's traffic laws were written. A Chicago Tribune reporter in 1968, writing about Mr. Braun's 50th anniversary with the American Automobile Association Chicago Motor Club, concluded that he made the world a better place in which to drive. In naming him a director and general counsel emeritus of the club, he was lauded for his vision, knowledge of the law, and ability to apprise all of the elements of a problem which enabled him consistently to select the wisest course of action. Early in his career, in the 1920s, he earned an excellent reputation for himself and the club by exposing all of these speed traps and unscrupulous authorities who set ridiculous speed limits to trap and fine motorists. As chairman of the National Committee on Uniform Traffic Laws and Ordinances, Joseph Braun developed model laws for cities and states across the country. In 1965, the American Automobile Association honored him with a special award for his lifetime of service as chairman and member of the American Automobile Association Safety Responsibility Committee and their Legal Advisory Committee. His long years of dedicated service were marked by his unmatched willingness to serve for the safety of the American driving public, their passengers and others impacted by the automobile. Mr. Braun attributed significant aspects of his success to the years that he learned his professional knowledge at the John Marshall Law School whereby he and his wife, Bell, remembered the law school by establishing a perpetual fund for programs such as the one that's being presented today. We are confident he would be supportive of the collaboration resulting in the merger with the University of Illinois, Chicago. We welcome you on behalf of Bell and Joseph Braun to today's symposium. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Mr. Ament and, and Dean Spanbauer. And again, my greetings uh, to everyone that's joining us today. Um, and my deepest thanks um, for what I think will be a wonderful day of conversation and insight. Um, I'm in awe of all of the contributing people that are contributing to our day and eager for us to learn and explore um, all the issues together. Um, again, my thanks to Dean Spanbauer and Mr. Emmett for their open room remarks. We owe much gratitude to the Braun Fund for the critical support of today's programming and their continued commitment to the law school. Um, and as the Dean mentioned, today also marks the formal launch of um, our new health equity law and policy program. Uh, which seeks to align the UIC law and UIC missions and visions to advance equity through law and through interprofessional and community engagement. Um, hence the natural theme really for today's symposium, focused on the role of law and policy um, in creating health equity through structural transformation um, and how more urgent a time to do this work, but during a pandemic. Um, when planning first started uh, many, many months ago, um, we hoped to meet in person and with the pandemic that at least was somewhat in our rear view uh, mirror. However, as Dean Giles, um, who will be joining us later today, clarified to me, we should not think of some point in time when uh, we're post pandemic, but rather consider how we exist and thrive in an evolving COVID context. And so today we look to do that specifically how we can see in these disruptive times um, an opportunity to rethink our actions in support of health equity um, and off stated goal. Um, and what better um, or more critical time to transform our approaches to realize those goals. 
Um, and so today um, will not be like a traditional sort of legal academic symposium, rather in keeping with our mission and vision, we will hear from a range of stakeholders, many from non-law areas, um, from diverse areas of expertise and experience who will engage our minds envisioning what could be from the what is. Uh, we'll spend the morning reflecting on the policy and health system context and defining our terms. Um, and the afternoon will pivot to thinking about within this context, the role of law and policy and public universities engaged in and with communities in this work. Um, I'll rejoin you at the end of the day to try to summarize what we've heard and learned today, um, at which I am sure I will stupendously fail, um, but and try to um, discuss some of our next steps. Um, and I'll offer up thanks to the amazing people who have made today possible. Um, I hope you'll be able to stay with us the whole day, but note we are recording this symposium um, for later viewing. And with that in mind, also just note that since we are recording it, you may um, turn off your video if you did not want to be um, visible. Uh, I've posted the agenda in chat that includes links, um, as you can see how the day is going to unfold. It also includes links to bios of all of our speakers, um, so you can sort of um, see that because we have such information filled sessions. We're going to try to keep those to mostly discussion, but we do have that posted for you to read about full bios. Um, another little bit of housekeeping before I turn this over to our first session. Um, we've placed you all on mute when you enter. Um, however, we do have the chat feature functional um, for engagement with other attendees and also to post questions to um, our wonderful panelists and speakers that you'll hear from today. So please do use that feature to engage with um, each other, uh, approximating however um, inadequately uh, the networking that might take place if we were in person. Um, we'll also have a built-in networking opportunity a little later, which I'll tell you more about then. Um, and please do the, use that chat feature again to post questions. Uh, each session is fairly jam packed with content and discussion, but we'll try to get to some of those questions during the sessions um, through our student helpers. Um, and we're also, they'll be saving the chat feature so we can try to address the themes that are raised in the questions in our post symposium work. Um, we also encourage you to use the chat to share resources or ideas that are stimulated by this discussion. Um, we do have some built-in breaks and we have a networking session at one. So we hope you can use that time to continue um, conversation with each other. Um, and with that, let's, uh, without much ado, I do want to um, kick things off with our first uh, panel of the day. Um, it's a policy focused discussion of kind of the context and, and a policy environment and with competing policy priorities of how to think about health equity, um, sort of pre-existing uh, the pandemic and now as impl impl um, influenced, sorry, by the pandemic. And so we're gonna have a wonderful discussion now with Cook County President Preckwinkle and State Senator Aquino, um, Special Assistant to the UIC Chancellor and former Cuppa Dean Michael Pagano will uh, facilitate this session. So Dean Pagano, with that, I'm gonna turn things over to you and I thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dean Campbell, for that uh, introduction. I, I am just honored to be part of this panel with uh, Senator uh, Omar Aquino, who is uh, from the second senatorial district and is also the majority ca uh, caucus whip uh, in, in Springfield, and also with uh, Tony Preckwinkle, the uh, uh, longtime serving president of the Cook County Board. Welcome to both of you. Um, and I would like to, to uh, kick this uh, panel off. This is the opening panel of an all day set of conversations about health equity and public health issues in Illinois and Cook County uh, and, and the nation for that matter. Um, but uh, I, I think that today, uh, or if we had had this conversation maybe five years ago, it would not have generated quite the interest that it has now. I think most everybody who's been in, um, in and around the, the city and the state for the last uh, 18 months understands what happens when a pandemic, a health pandemic hits and we shut down the economy. Um, and, and that we're now all concerned about access to vaccination and access to a, a safe work environment uh, and equitable access to a safe work environment and equitable access to, uh, to the vaccination. And so I'd, I'd like to, to ask you to, to put it in the context of Cook County and the state of Illinois or wherever else you feel comfortable in talking about the, the sort of the evolution of public health 
as a public policy concern. Um, it, it's only been well, more than a century, century and a half now, then we really thought of public health. Health was usually just an individual concern and, and uh, pandemics wiped out people as the plagues wiped out people and, and, and civilizations. Um, but we've learned that there are, there are direct interventions that governments can do to prevent the spread of and halt uh, the destruction of what uh, a public health a pandemic or epidemic might might do, and so I'd, I'd like to hear from your perspectives. Uh, when you know, 10, 50 years ago, where was public health in the public policy list of problems that you, as as uh, government leaders, had to confront? Not that you were there at that time, but then, and how has that shifted uh, after the pandemic? Clearly, this is at the top of your priority list, but I'd like to hear from both of you. Uh, a bit about um, you know uh, how this has evolved, how this as a policy issue has evolved in in your minds over the past uh, five years or 105 years for that matter. So with that, I, I'd like to start with uh, with um, our um, our resident historian on the panel, uh, Tony Preckwinkle, former history teacher. If you could uh, if you could tell us a bit about Cook County and or your your uh, uh, your your considerations and history uh, behind this, and then we'll turn it over to uh, Senator Aquino. Well, thank you very much, Michael. I'm grateful to be able to join you this morning. You know, Cook County has run a public health system for 180 years, almost two centuries. And I'm very proud of that fact. And throughout that time, we've taken whoever comes to our door. And that's the difference, of course, between public health systems and not-for-profit or for-profit institutions. Our first mission is to serve people and not to collect from their insurance or from their bank accounts. So. We've always served whoever came to our door, regardless of their race or religion or ability to pay or gender or sexual orientation. And as I said, I'm very, very proud of that fact. We run two hospitals and more than a dozen uh, walk-in clinics. Uh, most of them are ambulatory uh, primary care. Some of them are specialty clinics. We have a pretty extensive public health system. And historically, that system has uh, been responsible for about half of our expenses. Half of our budget has been public health. Now, within our health and hospital system, of course, there's a public health component. And I regret to say that like the rest of the country, we have not invested sufficiently in Cook County in our public health component, rather than our you know, hospitals and clinics. Um, and of course, that came back as it did across the country uh, to our detriment as we struggled with the pandemic. And you know, let me just say, so the history teacher can't help this. The last time we had a global pandemic was 1918, uh, right after or at the end of the First World War. And um, when I read about the, the pandemic in China, of course, the first thing I did is try to figure out when was the last time we had one of these challenges and, and, and was reminded of the 1918 pandemic. You know, I read a couple books on, on the subject and the main message was listen to your health professionals. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and you may be aware that in 1918, uh, St. Louis and Philadelphia had comparable populations. In Philadelphia, to celebrate the end of the war, the armistice, they had a huge parade, 100,000 people lined the streets. In St. Louis, the mayor listened to his health professionals who said, don't do this. Don't have a big celebration. Try to get people to stay in their houses and not be out on the street. And Philadelphia was decimated by the pandemic and St. Louis fared fairly well. So the main message I got from looking at history, both, both this was gonna be a challenge that was gonna be ongoing. Um, you know, I think COVID-19 is gonna be an endemic disease uh, going forward, but also the main thing that I needed to do as, as, a, as a political leader was pay attention to what my health professionals were telling me. Thank you. That, that's, a, that's a strong message today that we, we should be listening to our public health officials, which we'll get to in a few minutes because some people listen better than others. But I'd, I'd like to hear from Senator Aquino uh, from your uh, either your uh, senatorial district um, or the state or, or any perspective that you might bring to this as well. Sure. So my perspective is someone that has been serving in the Senate for, for five years. I'm, I'm the youngest person in the Senate and, and I'm not a historian. So I don't have uh, that much of a, of a few uh, uh, along WVB. But I would just say in terms of the work that we've been doing in the state uh, prior to COVID and, and during 
during, not post, but still during this pandemic, you know, it's, it's, <clears throat> we've, we've focused in, in on certain things, you know, and certain, certainly now, um, you know, getting originally getting people tested now with the vaccine, making sure that people get vaccinated and so forth. But much of the work and much of the discussions that we've been having haven't actually changed so much because, you know, we've been trying to tackle a lot of these racial and economic health care disparities that we've been seeing throughout in our entire state. And what COVID has done is really just highlighted those things that it can't be further ignored and, and, and not even just ignored, you can't deny um, the impact that COVID has had, especially on certain communities. Like COVID certainly is blind to, 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 to race and class and, and it can impact you know, anyone at any time. However, uh, because of social determinants of health and other uh, uh, issues, there are certain communities that we've seen that are more susceptible to, to, to being, uh, to, to getting afflicted with COVID and, and having an impact on those communities. Uh, and so we've seen that in poor uh, black and brown communities. And, and that's where we've seen even prior to COVID uh, issues with, with, uh, with, with uh, healthcare um, disparities and, 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 and gaps of coverage and, and quality of care. Um, that that we've seen, I think, as a response, you know, one of the things that's interesting is that we we I've, I serve on a group called the Medicaid uh, uh, Work uh, uh, Medicaid Workforce uh, Committee, uh, and it's a bipartisan, bicameral committee that sort of convenes um, HFS, uh, the uh, the MCOs, which is the managed care organizations, and providers into making sure that we are providing great care. Uh, in our Medicaid um, 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 uh, arena or healthcare coverage. And we were talking about a bill about healthcare transformation, even prior to, to, uh, to COVID, to this pandemic. And after, and, and we were working on this bill to really transform the way we provide healthcare coverage in the state of Illinois. And once the pandemic uh, started to occur, we realized we had to go back to the table and making sure that what we were putting into this bill, that the 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 um, the goals that we had that we wanted to see uh, were we weren't ignoring the obvious stuff that was happening around us of the of of, of COVID and its impact on our communities. And so, you know, I'm 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 happy that we've we, we've we've passed it. We're actually in, in in I think in the first phase of actually rolling those things out, and it's really just encouraging innovative partnerships at, at a local level uh, through healthcare providers uh, centered really through uh, uh, hospitals, but including clinics and other providers and community input to make sure that those that, um, that, that, that are having the most trouble in getting access and so forth, you know, our belief is that those are the ones that are, should be at the table, making sure that we're answering those questions. And so in terms of the, you know, the discussions on the state level, um, I don't, I think we've been having some of the, the, the similar discussions. However, we, you know, at, during and after COVID, we, uh, um, I think we are, 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 are trying to press and make sure that we are uh, trying to respond to this as, as, as soon as possible. And, and so I think uh, uh, both Senator Aquino and President Preckwinkle have uh, made very clear that, uh, that access to public health care and facilities um, it, uh, has, to, has to be, and it's currently, be, uh, especially in the last year and a half, currently has come to the fore that there are communities, uh, communities of color primarily, that have not had uh, adequate or equitable access to the, to the public, uh, uh, public health care facilities, um, which means it raises the visibility of this, of this policy issue, policy problem or challenge uh, to a level uh, that that requires resources to be augmented, and I, I know um, that the state, the city, the county have have put a lot more resources in public health than uh, maybe five years ago. I, and I'd, I'd like us to again back up just a bit and say, well, what was it that uh, that didn't put public health and equitable access to public health at the top of the of the list five ten years ago? And what is 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 anything being squeezed out of the um, uh, agenda where you're you're in, you're infusing public health with more resources. Is it coming from other places, or is it just that the the pie is expanding and that's where the new resources are going? Well, you know, I think the the pandemic has, uh, as uh, Senator Aquino has said, highlighted uh, endemic inequities in our society, and frankly, globally as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know the the infection rates in Black and Brown communities and the deaths that we've uh, 
that we've suffered with, you know, are double or triple in black and brown neighborhoods from the larger white community. So um, that's, that's a tremendous challenge for us as a society. But it's also true that, you know, we, if you look at sort of the Northern hemisphere versus the Southern hemisphere, mm -hmm. uh, the United States and, and Europe versus Africa and South America, you know, the infection rates are higher there. Um, they're still struggling. They don't have the vaccination rates that we do. And so the inequities are not only um, within our communities, but globally. And so it, it's, a, it's a challenge both nationally and internationally to try to figure out how we're gonna deal with this pandemic. And in particular, um, I would argue at the, at the international level, how the rich countries are gonna share the vaccine resources with, uh, with the, the rest of the world. <laughs> um, and, you know, we just honestly, we haven't done a very good job of that. We, we as a country should be very proud that we invested so much in vaccines. That's one thing I'll give Trump credit for. I'm furious about his um, disparagement of masks, uh, you know, disparagement of vaccination, I mean, whatever. But the, he was right to put a lot of money into developing vaccines. And now we have wonderful vaccines. We have three wonderful vaccines available for us. Um, you know, Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J. &J. And we need to share those with the rest of the world as well. At the same time, we're encouraging our own people uh, to be vaccinated. And one of, the, one of the challenges we face, of course, in our own country is the politicization uh, of, of mass wearing and of vaccination. And, uh, you know, of all the terrible things that Trump has done, that's the thing for which I think he'll be most damned. I mean, uh, the incredible irresponsibility and manipulation and God knows what um, that motivated him to turn responding to the pandemic into a political issue, I, you know, is beyond me. Um, and, and at the local level, of course, um, you know, we continue to struggle with this. If you look at at a map, and actually thanks to the New York Times, I have one in front of me uh, from September 28th of states and counties. And the redder the state, the less likely people are to be vaccinated. And it's true county by county too. It's not just state by state. Um, so the whole issue of responsible response to the pandemic has been politicized. And we're gonna struggle with this forever. I mean, um, I shouldn't say forever, um, for the duration of the pandemic. And as I said, I think it's going to become an endemic disease. So this is something that's going to be with us for a very long time. And for public health people, I know this is incredibly frustrating. Uh, my daughter is a nurse. And the idea that we have healthcare professionals in much of our country who are struggling to care for patients who did not choose to be vaccinated um, it's just mind blowing and so discouraging, I know, to people who are stretched thin um, with the effort to respond to the pandemic over the last 18 months. To, to pick up that point just a bit more, uh, there is um, there is a lot of, uh, there are anti-vaxxers for sure, and there are those who are making a decision not to get a vaccine because of information they think they have that is uh, that questions the um, the effectiveness or the efficacy of, of the vaccination. Part of that is a communications issue. Part of that is what are people, what informate, where do people consume the information from which they make these decisions to be or not to be vaccinated? And I'm, I'm wondering at the, at the county level and at the state level, um, is there a, is there a communications, what is the communication strategy to reach uh, people who are not not the anti-vaxxers who are against any vaccinate, but those who really think that they have good information uh, and that uh, to choose not to have a vaccine is, is the right thing to do for not just themselves individually, which I think is part of it, but also for the general, the community of which they are a part. Senator Aquino? Yeah, so I'll speak for my community. So the community I represent is a working class community, majority Latino, uh, a, a high uh, Im immigrant population, many undocumented folks, and and even um, you know I previously to uh, last two years I had been the co-chair of the Latino Caucus in the state. So we really try to have a a perspective of of, of care for all Latinos that live in our state. And so language access um, is certainly. A, a, an issue, but it's not just getting information in, in the language and Spanish and so forth, but having it 
uh, disseminated by trusted messengers from communities um, as well. And, and that's one of the things that we've been trying to do. Uh, we've been putting more money into community navigator programs so that we have folks from the communities going out and reaching people to where they're at and incur, you know, and, and trying to get the right information to them and, 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 and combating this, this misinformation <laughs> that we see proliferated through social media. Like, as great as we are in a, in, in a communications uh, era of, uh, if, of being able to get uh, information out, the challenge is it's also too easy to get misinformation out, you know, via social media and other things. And so, you know, I think the, the approach that I've seen and that, uh, you know, that has, been, has worked well, but it, it takes much more work and much more resources is trying to get it at a very localized level and getting those, again, those trusted messengers like nurses and others. Um, and, and I, I too, um, I, I'm a bit frustrated when you hear about healthcare professionals that, 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 that choose um, uh, not to, to, to get vaccinated and so forth. Uh, my wife is, is a nurse as well, but she used to be the president of the Nurse you know, Association of Hispanic Nurses. And nurse, she likes to remind me all the time that nurses have a higher um, uh, uh, favorability uh, rate than politicians. And so what we tried to do in, in the district was always partner with our, our, our local nurses at our healthcare, uh, you know, uh, events and so forth, because that's who people go see day in day, you know, when, when, when they're ill, uh, they spend more time with their nurses than they do even with their physicians and doctors. So uh, we try to, uh, to work with all, all these types of groups um, to make sure we're getting the right information out. We, uh, we in Cook County have, have undertaken a public relations campaign to try to encourage people to be vaccinated. And um, we did some polling. And as the Senator said, um, the most trusted um, spokespeople for, for vaccination are not public officials, are not elected officials, they're healthcare professionals. And so we had the doctors at, at Cook County um, speak both in commercials on television and uh, in ads and print media, basically trust us, you know, we're your doctors, we're responsible for your care, we're sharing with you how important it is for you to be vaccinated. And so our, our multimedia campaign, social media, you know, TV, print has been focused on our doctors and the, and the doctors speaking directly to patients saying, it's critical that you be vaccinated for yourself, for the people you care about, for our communities. Um, and, and I hope and pray that that has encouraged people to, to get their vaccines. And, and so, Gano, I just, if, if you don't, sure. um, your, your previous question about the pie got bigger, when I just wanted to make one, uh, a couple points on that, if you don't mind. Um, one of the things that I think that is, is, is changing the, the, the discussion, at least that I've seen in terms of health care and, and, and public health, is that, you know, because of, of COVID, you know, again, it, there's no denying the, you know, the intersectionality between healthcare and especially our economy, right? Uh, here locally uh, and, and as a state, like in, 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 in our country, but globally, you know, we, have, we live in a global, uh, uh, you know, economy and, 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 you know, this pandemic quite literally shut down uh, the country for, for a time in our state, uh, except for, you know, our essential workers that had no choice of their own, but having to go to work. But uh, many of us, like we are here today, had to end up uh, um, um, in, being innovative, and now we have these virtual meetings, and we can, you know, meet and do. Many of us still work from home, but you know, those are some of the things that I think have changed the 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 narrative in terms of discussion on public health. Is realizing that it is important for my neighbor to be healthy uh, in order for me also and my family to maintain our own health. Um, and at least on a state level, you know, it used to be sort of how to redivide the pie in the rural and the suburban folks and us and on the north side, the west side, the south side, trying to sort of fight for dollars here and there. And there's a, there's, I think there's a, a true realization of like, you know, we cannot recover from this if southern Illinois and central Illinois is not recovering. You know, it can't just be Chicago. It can't just be the suburbs. It really takes us all. And so I, I do think that, you uh, there has been, even though there is, I won't say that there's not some partisan discussion and it's uh, um, certainly uh, uh, frustrating to have some of these partisan uh, discussions. Uh, uh, however, there, I do think there's a realization from most that um, in order for us to get past this in some way, um, we need to all be recovering and, and, and even if it's outside of our own communities. If I could, if I could add something just to, to piggyback on what the Senator said. I think one of the challenges that we have is, of course, the disparate impact that the pandemic has had on various uh, 
communities uh, within our, our, our county, within our country. Um, and, you know, just frankly, black and brown people are in positions where we're less likely to be able to work at home. In a way, working at home is a privilege, you know, of white collar workers and, um, and folks who, you know, um, may be already privileged, right? <laughs> um, but if you're a bus driver, you know, if you, if you work in healthcare, and it's not just doctors and nurses, it's the people who clean our hospitals and work in our, in our kitchens, um, you know, you could, not, you could not be at home doing your work remotely, you know? Um, and so partly because of historic inequity and partly because of, of you know, the, the positions that we find ourselves, the jobs we find ourselves in the present economy, and of course that's historical too, um, you know, our black and brown people were out in the, in, in the pandemic and less likely to be home and sheltering in place. And that had a devastating impact on our community. So it wasn't just access to healthcare, it was exposure. And exposure was a function of, your, of the nature of your employment. So, you know, the, the, I, I read in one of the books, you know, the 1918 pandemic um, showed that the, 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 the terrible impacts in a lot of ways of colonialism, and that's not so much what we're struggling with now, but capitalism as well, and, and the inequitable distribution of wealth and access to opportunity and how that played out uh, and your susceptibility to the pandemic. Yes, th <clears throat> thank you. I think I think the uh, a key to understanding uh, is the issues that confront us today are rooted in the kind of work that people have, where where many of us have an option to work from home or to not work at home as often as we need to. Where others, that just isn't part of the equation. If they're if they want a paycheck, they have to be out in, in front, and th those tend to be uh, people. Uh, of uh, of color and, and low income, uh, in particular in the service in industry, also the healthcare, the first uh, um, the first line providers uh, of of both the, the the medical profession and the service professions as well. Um, uh, President Prakoko, you mentioned uh, having uh, you have in front of you the the map of the United States from New York Times with the counties and the colors and other, and and I'm wondering if if we could speak a bit about because what I hear from from both of you is that there is a uh, th there's a communication strategy of reaching out through trusted people, through primarily the nurses, the medical profession, the trusted people in the communities. And, and I'm, I, I know that was, you were speaking from your perspective in Cook County in the city of Chicago, that th these, are, these are trusted people. And uh, the, the, the positivity rate is down, the vaccination rate is up. What is it about Chicago that as you, or, or Cook County or Northeastern Illinois, uh, compared with the rest of the Midwest, or at least those sections where the, uh, the vaccination rate is, uh, is nowhere close to where it should be, uh, and certainly nowhere close to where it is in Cook County. Is there a, and I'm, I know I'm asking you to speculate a bit outside your, uh, your geographic zone of representation, but, but what are, are we just doing a, uh, are you as political leaders doing a great job at getting the word out and they're just doing a poor job elsewhere? Or, or is something else going on that, that explains the, uh, the uh, it's not, a, it's, it may be an access issue in some places, um, or, or is it an information issue? Or what, what do you attribute the general success of getting the vaccination rate high in, the, in Northeastern Illinois compared to uh, a lot of other places in the Midwest? Our, our urban areas, which are also more likely to be democratic, are doing better than our rural areas. And to the extent that a large proportion of the population of Illinois is in Northeastern Illinois, a more urban area, and we're doing better. You know, the, the same New York Times um, graphs that I referred to earlier showed that, you know, in red states, the death rate from the pandemic is basically three times what it is in blue states. Three times. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, this has become, as I said, a politicized and ideological issue to the great detriment of people in Republican states. I mean, I you can't say it anymore succinctly or brutally than that. Uh, and if you have a governor, you know, DeSantis or Abbott, I'm sorry, DeSantis in Florida, Abbott in Texas, you know, who threatens schools that want to have mask mandates, you know, um, discourages people from good health, public health practices, you know, you're going to be devastated. That's just the, uh, that's just the consequence of not paying attention to your public health professionals, you know. 
Um, and you know, if you if you look at a map of the United States, as I said, those states that are Democratic more likely to have high vaccination rates. Those states that are Republican lower vaccination rates. And ironically, uh, this graph that I've been referring to, um, you know, states like Georgia, where we barely won, um, and uh, Michigan uh, and and um, Arizona show that they're kind of in the middle, you know, and the states that are overwhelmingly red, high un rates of unvaccinated people, the states that are overwhelmingly blue, low rates of unvaccinated people. I mean, it's, um, it's heartbreaking. Is this a, um, we are a, uh, a federal republic in which states are, are sovereign in many areas, including public health. Are we in, are we in a, uh, a place whereby uh, public health expenditures on public health in Illinois and in Cook County are uh, substantially greater than they are in st uh, areas of Florida or, or Texas? And if so, does it matter? And if, well, how does it matter? Well, you know, um, not every state in the country, and I'm sorry, I don't know exactly which ones haven't, but not every state in the country has taken advantage of the Affordable Care Act and the expansion of Medicaid. So God bless him. Dr. Ram Raju, who was head of our health and hospital system uh, early on in my tenure, in the decade that I've served, came to us from New York and said, um, the Affordable Care Act allows public health systems to start their own Medicaid managed care programs. And we've done it in New York, and you should do it here. And so we worked with our state legislature and then the federal government and the Obama administration uh, to start County Care, which is our Medicaid expansion program. And what that enabled us to do is enroll people in a federal program, a federal health care insurance program, who had previously been uninsured. And most of them were people we were already serving. It's just that we were now able to get reimbursement for their care. But they also had a card, an insurance card, that they could take anywhere, not just to our clinics and our hospitals, but to any, um, any health care institution. And the Affordable Care Act provided coverage so that now in Cook County, almost one out of every 10 of our residents is covered by our county care program. So, and we provide health care for them. So this, you know, it's been, a, it's been a blessing and it's expanded access to health insurance, but not every state and, you know, the Republican states are more likely not to have joined this Medicaid expansion than Democratic ones. Not every state has done that and, and increased access to health care coverage and insurance for their population. So again, this is another way in which ideology is playing out in a way that's detrimental to those individuals who happen to live in states that are led by the Republican. Republican Party. And I'm sorry to turn this so much into a partisan discussion, but it is basically a partisan discussion in terms of our reaction to the pandemic. Senator Aquino, do you see Illinois as a leader in promoting good public health uh, by pouring resources into it? Uh, in uh, Again, uh, a, a beacon in the Midwest, or are, are we just a, a blip and, uh, and the influence that Illinois might have on other states is, is uh, pretty minimal? No, I, I mean, I think we've been a trendsetter even prior to, to, to COVID, and I think we've continued. Uh, uh, in speaking, again, uh, my perspective of, of the work that we've done uh, is of Latino Caucus. We've had, uh, you know, Kids Care All Kids in the state of Illinois that has provided, you know, health care coverage for all kids for, you know, I don't know, even know how many years now, which is inclusive of undocumented children as well. And uh, just last year, uh, we had, uh, we passed in our budget, the ability for undocumented seniors to have Medicaid coverage. Just this year, a year after, a year later, because as what uh, Madam President had mentioned, uh, the fact of uh, black and brown folks are more likely to be essential workers and not have the ability to work uh, remotely. Uh, we made sure that uh, that we expanded that to 55 year old uh, uh, and, and folks that are on document 55 years and older that can be eligible for Medicaid can get that coverage. And so those are just a few different points there of, of, of showing that the work that we've been trying to do and we were the first state and still, I believe the only state, not even California and others that people think of in terms of you know, the immigrant population and whatnot, still hasn't caught up uh, to the work that we've done. Um, but yeah, just to kind of piggyback on what Madam Pre uh, President was, was, was saying, it, I, so in my work as the, in Medicaid work group, 
Um, I've been able to attend prior to the, the pandemic some national conferences and spokes and things like that with other colleagues throughout the, the country to talk about specifically Medicaid. And the amount of, of, of um, the senators and representatives, uh, especially from Southern uh, states that have high um, uh, healthcare gaps um, that were, were not opting into Medicaid uh, expansion and coverage um, and, and, and the reasonings behind it were just purely political. Um, it just, it, it blew my mind because they're literally getting, we're having discussions and we're putting up graphs on, uh, you know, and charts on, 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 on PowerPoints that are saying, these are the states that, you know, can benefit most and, 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 and your communities, you know, right now are, are suffering at this month. And they were the ones, ones that were most ardent uh, against uh, expansion because at that time it was something that you know President Obama did and so they didn't they didn't want anything to do with that and so we've moved forward to a time where you have you know uh, President Trump who um, tries to take um, um, uh, at a CPAC convention tries to take uh, um, credit for uh, getting the the vaccine so quickly but in the same breath basically is, 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 is almost telling folks not to, to take them, you know, so it, it's really, it's, it's difficult. I mean, it's, it's, it's unfortunate that it really is a political conversation, but I think that's, that's the reality of it. I mean, here in the state of Illinois, we have a governor that is, 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 is taking questions. I was just with the governor yesterday of like, oh, why wouldn't you lift a, the, uh, the, the, uh, um, the mask, you know, mandate and, and things like that. And he's like, well, because people are still dying. We've had 700,000 people in, in this country that have passed, that have died through this pandemic. And so uh, rather than in other states, as, as mentioned earlier, of um, governors that are, are threatening their school boards for, for, for you know, uh, it's an interesting to me that a lot of Republicans like to ha talk about local control, yet when their own school boards vote to try to keep their kids safe and make sure that they're, they're utilizing their mask, you know, one of the smallest things that you can do to make sure you can try to keep people healthy, then local control is not good. You know, they, they want to even penalize their, school, their own school districts. It's just... Um, it's a it, it's a difficult thing. I you know I, I sometimes don't understand it, but we we push through, and that's why I said earlier, like you know, this state is not going to recover not only through health and our economy, um, if the entire state isn't recovering. And so that's why it's important that we know and and track what the uh, uh, what the numbers and rates are uh, and the hospitalization rates are in Southern Illinois and Central Illinois, uh, uh, even here in Chicago, and, and making sure that we're doing things to try to protect those folks in those critical access uh, hospitals, uh, critical care hospitals um, as well. So it, it's, it's baffling sometimes. So you, you, you've identified a whole other area we can get into, which is outside the scope of this, which is state preemption of local, uh, local autonomy. And that's a big, big issue that's especially in the last 10 years have, uh, has uh, colored, I think, a lot of the, the, at least a lot of the scholarship in the area of local government and local government autonomy, where states are preempting local governments from doing what they would like to do. I, I, have a, I want to push a bit on a question that, or an issue that, uh, that is part of uh, Medicaid expansion, is part of, of any kind of, of public health expansion of any sort, and that is that, uh, that it costs money. How do, you, um, how do you address the issue of uh, enlarging, um, the, um, uh, in, enlarging the pool or shifting resources around but, or, or raising, uh, raising taxes or, or whatever? How do you address the, um, the resource part of it? So I'll, I'll be brief so that um, the man perhaps can answer this, but I would just say this, it costs us money to do nothing. Um, you know, if someone is sick, if they have the ability, uh, you know, if they're, if, if they have health coverage or not, uh, you know, they are going to show up to our, to our, to our hospital. Sometimes that ends up in charity care. And, and, at, and at, at some point it impacts, you know, um, uh, the bottom line, not for just those hospitals, but also for us, you know, someone's paying for that. So it costs money to do nothing nevertheless. And I think that you want to make sure that you're providing people with Medicaid coverage so that you can find them a healthcare home so that they're not frequent flyers in, a, in a, an emergency room or even end up at a long-term care facility which eventually is going to cost all of us a lot of money. And again, going back to like, you know, it, it's important for my neighbor to be safe so that my family can be safe and healthy. And so I think sometimes it does take some investment to do that, um, to provide the, that, that, that level of care for them. I think to go back to Dr. Raja, he was always talking about herd health. 
and the fact that you want to just be not just be healthy yourself, but you want everybody you ride the bus or the train with, everybody you work in the office with, everybody who works in the restaurant where you go to get your lunch uh, to be well as well. That's the only way we can all stay healthy is if we look out for each other and try to be sure that our, our herd human beings are healthy. And that's one of the reasons, frankly, that we're the, the, the COVID-19 is gonna be endemic. I mean, because we haven't been able to make real um, impact in terms of herd health, we're not quite at herd health here in this country, but in much of the rest of the world, in South America and Africa, you know, the, the percentages of, of Asia, you know, India and Pakistan, I mean, if you look at the percentage of people who are vaccinated, it's really modest. And so as long as the virus can bounce around in those populations, we're not gonna be safe either because, you know, there are no, <laughs> there are no 20 foot walls around our country that keep people from coming from other places where the pandemic may still be raging. So we've, we've got our challenges ahead for the foreseeable future. I, I'm reminded of well, one of the reasons that uh, malaria control was uh, a, a global thing, and that is that a mosquito can't tell a rich person from a poor person, so it has right. to be done at the community level. Uh, uh, just a couple of notes, uh, Alan Schwartz uh, put a, in the chat um, the, the New York Times map, if you would like to um, look at it, the one that uh, President Preckwinkle has been speaking to. And we have a question from, uh, uh, from Amy Campbell. And her question is, in these highly partisan times where such divides seem to stymie federal efforts to do big things that help communities and families, are there bright spots more locally where we are seeing or could see positive policy change to advance health? Well, uh, let me tell you what we're doing in sort of a hyper, our hyper-local strategy. Okay. Um, I mean, for me, I, I discovered in the course of this pandemic that, um, first of all, that we weren't funding public health very well, just mm -hmm. in general, and especially in comparison to other large um, uh, cities in the country, cities and, and counties in the country. So, so I made a commitment that we had to invest more in public health. That's that's one thing. Um, we also are pursuing a, a hyper local strategy. So, in in the zip codes in which we find the most unvaccinated people, um, we're doing things, you know, like like you're doing a campaign. We're calling people and encouraging them to come up, come to pop-up sites where we will have, you know, mobile vans to give out vaccination. We're knocking on doors to encourage people to uh, to get out and get vaccinated. Um, you know, we're doing the kinds of things you would do in a political campaign to support a candidate, except we're trying to drive people to to get vaccinated. Um, and as again, we're we're focusing on the zip codes, and those are black and brown zip codes by and large where the, the vaccination rates are lowest to, to, to concentrate that effort. Um, and, and, you know, that's what we have to do globally too. We need to be concentrating our efforts in places where the vaccination rates are lowest. And those are, you know, not the United States and Europe, they're Asia and Africa and South America. Yeah, I, I mentioned a bill that we worked on earlier uh, for the last couple of years, which is the health uh, the uh, healthcare transformation. Originally, it was a hospital transformation, and then it sort of uh, uh, became the healthcare transformation because we were really trying to transform not just one hospital in one area, but really whole communities. And so, in that bill, what's interesting is that you know we put certain pools of of monies. Uh, for different efforts. And specifically, you know, there was a pool of money for critical access uh, hospitals, which are primarily, I mean, they're in rural communities, which are primarily in, 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 in Republican, you know, areas uh, represent, represented by Republican folks. Um, as a, as a juxtaposed to, you know, in, in the, the inner city where you have um, uh, community hospitals, safety net hospitals that are usually in, 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 in urban areas. And so, and uh, usually represented by Democratic folks. And so we, we in, 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 in that healthcare transformation uh, negotiations and, and bill making, we realized that we certainly had to have pools of dollars and large pools of dollars for both to make sure that we were trying to solve for issues and of, of access um, in, in our rural areas, but that although the, the access uh, issue for rural folks is, is really geography and how far uh, place, uh, places can be in, in, in providers, in the city, even though we're closer to places, the access issues can be quite high as well because of, of um, right now, a lot of the specialized care is not in in, 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 in communities. It's really in, in certain uh, places like the, um, the, the um, um, 
uh, hospital uh, 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 community area and, and downtown. And so people have to go and leave. And so the other uh, innovative thing that I think that we've been working on that has been really bipartisan is, um, is expanding telehealth. I think all of us agree that telehealth can be is something that our our our, our uh, healthcare industry is is moving towards. Uh, I think really that's the the future of healthcare uh, and making sure that we are 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 are, are um, um, uh, uh, shrinking those those healthcare coverage gaps. And again, I think it's a beneficial thing not only for obviously for rural folks where you know there's a challenge of getting uh, to someone a healthcare provider, but also in urban in areas where you might not have somebody uh, close to home and it might be difficult you, for you to leave your community based on the fact that you, you can't afford to go downtown, pay for uh, a, a, a $15 parking space or whatnot to go see your specialist. So those are some of the things I think that in the state that we've been working on that had some bipartisan support. All right, that, that's, uh, that's interesting that, uh, well, if there is trying to find silver linings in, in all of this, right? If there, if there is a silver lining, it's recognition of the importance of telehealth which um, as, a, as an access to, to medical services, but it also raises issues about uh, is access limited because of distance or because of uh, a, a lack of broadband coverage or other kinds of, of infrastructure issues. So, so I'd, I'd, I'd like to expand this question just a bit from just uh, public health to other, um, other public policy issues that the state and the county have been addressing and how they link to public health. I, I think you've, you've identified one, Senator Aquino, which is which is uh, broadband access uh, indirectly because of telehealth. What, what are the others uh, that public health uh, touches on or speaks to or interacts with that that where you where you, you can't be thinking of public health in a stovepipe way in which it is segregated from all of the other uh, uh, public policy uh, problems and issues that you're that you're addressing? Well, let me let me come back to Senator Aquino's point about um, about telehealth. So, if you're gonna uh, if you're gonna interact with your doctor in a, telephonically, uh, you need access to the internet. But a quarter of the families, one fourth of the families in Cook County, don't have broadband access. So, prior to the pandemic, um, we recognized this is a challenge, and we were investing in fiber optic cable along the. Um, highway right of way for I-57 to extend it into the south suburbs, broadband access into the south suburbs and southwest suburbs uh, that many of those communities didn't have, have, have broadband access. So, um, and we got a grant from the state for which we're very grateful uh, to Senator Aquino and, and to the executive branch um, to do more of that work. It was a matching grant and we're gonna extend the fiber optic cable work that we were doing previously uh, further south. Um, but when a quarter of your families don't have access mm -hmm. to broadband, um, you know, it's a, the telehealth part is a real challenge, not to mention um, remote learning, e-learning during the pandemic or remote work. Um, and it's not just broadband access. So once you have broadband access, you have to have an affordable internet plan, right? And then you have to have tablets or laptops or whatever. So if you're going to have a government strategy that deals with um, the digital divide, then, then you have to address all three components broadband access, internet access, and devices. And uh, that's the, the uh, kind of constellation of issues that we've been, been working on in Cook County. So that's, um, how can I say that? That's a, that's a, it's clear that we have, to, we have to utilize telehealth more to provide people with access, but in order to get them access, we have to work on broadband, broadband access. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I think there's so many things that we, we could talk about that impact of healthcare and, and so forth. But I mean, I, I'm going to focus on on two things. One, education as it as it as it goes towards a pipeline of folks in the healthcare uh, industry, uh, be it providers from you know um, your your physician to your nurse to you know to those in the executive level in in, um, in in hospitals and hospital systems. I think more and more people need to look like the communities that they're in and that they work in. And again, it goes back to those trusted um, you know uh, messengers. And um, you know, right now uh, it, throughout our entire country, there's a there's a nursing shortage. And it's sort of like the chicken or the egg argument because it's like, you know, is it, is it, do you have so many uh, that are going to, to school uh, for nursing yet when they, there, there's a, there's, 
there's, you know, the, the, um, the retention though for nurses is, is, is not high and, and, uh, but yet the, the, the programming, even at, at, at universities, um, you know, you don't have a lot of, you know, like in many uh, academia settings, you know, there's not a lot of folks that are, that, that are, you know, nursing prof professors, uh, tenured and, and so forth, that look like black and brown communities of where you want to make sure that we're, we're even um, the, that nursing shortage is even greater, you know, especially in our, in our safety net and uh, uh, hospitals here in the area. The other thing, so I think uh, education, you know, throughout, uh, especially as a pipeline to, uh, uh, to, to um, um, healthcare, but, you know, you, it's hard to be healthy if you don't have a home. And so affordable housing and housing is a, is, is, is a huge issue. Um, you know, I, you know, I think there's, 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 there's stats out there that, you know, housing instability quite literally takes, you know, years off your life. You know, it's, it, it is a, it making sure someone has a home, uh, a place that they can call home and a stable housing uh, can save a life. And so those are some of those, you know, social determinants that, you know, we are really trying to look at when we are, you know, um, working on these, these healthcare issues is, is understanding that you know you can't work on these things on, in, in a silo, you know, and 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 in a vacuum. You you need to be working on all these other things that impact someone's uh, healthy life. And you know, again, you go to someone being able to have a good job and all these other things. But I think those are two you know big things. Is 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 for someone to stay healthy, they need a home. And in in order for us to uh, try to have a healthier society, we need people uh, to be working in those industries to look like the communities that they, they, they work in as well. Yeah, you know, Senator Aquino has quite rightly talked about the importance of, of safe and secure affordable housing. Um, food insecurity is also an issue. And uh, we partner with the Greater Chicago Food Depository, God bless them, uh, in our health and hospital system. And we started having um, monthly visits of food trucks to our clinics and have our uh, physicians uh, prescribing food <laughs> um, mm -hmm. so that our patients could go to the food truck and get healthy uh, fruits and vegetables to take home with them and as, as part of their um, visits to our clinics. Um, and so we're, we're grateful to the Greater Chicago Food Depository for that partnership because, um, you know, health is medicine. I mean, food is medicine, right? I mean, um, Good food can contribute, of course, to good health, and, and not eating well, of course, contributes to bad health outcomes. So, a good good housing policy for the homeless, a good education policy. I, I understood that it as more uh, higher education, which I think in the nursing profession, which of course I think it's a great idea. Um, and we we also have the uh, the the challenges of uh, food. Uh, food access and adequacy in, in the area. Three broad areas that that overlap with this whole issue of um, of uh, uh, equitable access to public health. Um, we are we are uh, just about ten minutes away from our time to to close up. Uh, I'd, I'd I'd like to 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 ask the the two of you to to uh, to to think beyond where we are today, I, I think as President Preckwinkle had noted, that this may not be a pandemic, but it certainly would be an epidemic. And I think that's what, what we're gonna be hearing in the panels in the rest of the day, that uh, we're, we're never gonna be out of this. It's gonna be around all the time uh, in, in a different, God willing, a different form than it is right now. Uh, but what do you see in the future, the role of uh, public health in uh, in the state of Illinois and in Cook County, the role of public health, is, is it, are we at, um, are we at the peak of our interest in public health and that it will gradually, it will atrophy over the, over, over the next several years as we get, you know, we get used to, well, it's just, uh, you know, it's COVID in a different form, uh, three, five years, six years from now, um, or, or is there something about this event that, ha that will keep public health uh, at the, uh, and, and health equity at the top of the policy uh, priority list of state and county governments, and therefore with resource allocation to to uh, to public health. So I, I'll, I'll start with uh, since President Preckwinkle is already unmuted. I'll start with President Preckwinkle. You know, I think um, in this country we have pretty short attention spans. <laughs> mm -hmm. I say that as a teacher of history, but anyway. Um, so that's that's a real challenge. You know, are we three five years from now just going to be a dim memory? And we're just going to go back to the 
our, our thoughtless ways of, of behaving previously. Um, but I think there are a couple of things that, that might uh, indicate that this will be a little different. Uh, one is the conjunction of the pandemic, the healthcare crisis with an economic crisis and a, a reckoning around racial justice. So kind of um, three streams that came together uh, in, in a moment. So it wasn't just the pandemic that we, we, we were struggling with, but of course the economic collapse that followed and then the murder of George Floyd and how that triggered uh, across the country demonstrations and, and a focus on racial equity. Mm -hmm. So I'm hopeful that we might have a more thoughtful outcome uh, to this crisis than maybe we've seen in the past, just because there these uh, these other strains that are in the mix as well, um, and the pandemic sure hi surely highlighted inequities in healthcare. The economic crisis highlighted inequities in the economic structures in our country that meant for dis disparate impacts, both in terms of financial uh, challenges and exposure to the virus. And then, of course, the, the, the murder of George Floyd and the way in which that illustrated the um, how endemic white supremacy is in this country, uh, that, a, that a white police officer could just murder a black man without emotion on his face. Um, anyway. And so uh, I hear a, we're the keepers of the flame kind of approach that we, we hope that in the future we will have remembered what we're doing today. Are there are there institutional features that you propose or you think will be uh, that will exist to ensure that the keeping of the flame continues beyond just this moment? Well, in our, in our budget for 2021, um, we started a health uh, an equity fund, not health equity fund, but health is part of it. Uh, and put $100 million in it to try to figure out how we could address inequities uh, in our county. And uh, with the federal resources that are available, we're going to be um, allocating them with an equity lens. So I think there's an opportunity with this tremendous once in a lifetime, probably federal resource to invest in recovery, to do that in as equitable way as possible. Thank you, and I'm glad you you brought the uh, the ARPA question in, and that is there is a, there is a lot of federal funding for the first time, uh, for the first time uh, it, at least to this magnitude. Uh, Senator Aquino, the, the the state, same question. What do you see in the the future, and how can we keep uh, being more than just the the carriers of the flame? Sure, and, and and as I began, I am not the historian, and so Madam Pre President, is, and I'm probably going to butcher the the uh, the quote, but you know those that don't remember our past are doomed to you know uh, to repeat it. And it's an, unfortunate, uh, it's an unfortunate thing, though. I, I'm optimistic that I do think that though this we we as as she mentioned, uh, a, un, uh, there's a uniqueness to this time, and I do hope that some of the things that we are implementing now. Uh, will be sort of normalized for future generations and that uh, healthcare and, and caring for each other and, and, and understanding that uh, to have a vibrant society and, and economy and so forth, we need to make sure that all folks are healthy. Um, uh, as, 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 as was stated earlier, in the bus that we take, in the, in the place that we go eat, um, uh, that it's important for all of us to, to, to truly thrive. And, um, you know, I think that, again, I, I, I point back to, I'm really excited about this healthcare transformation fund that we have. It's $150 million for uh, the next five years, uh, uh, 150 each year for the next five years that we are going to um, have as, as sort of an RFP out there for communities to come together and providers to really have these innovative partnerships to really transform and reimagine the way that uh, we provide healthcare to really try to um, um, answer some of these, you know, these uh, these um, generational issues of of, of healthcare disparity, um, uh, much of which based off of socioeconomic, you know, and and, and determinants. Uh, so, like how, as mentioned earlier, uh, as I said, with housing and and food insecurity and other things uh, thought of. I mean, those are those components are actually in in the bill. Um, uh, you uh, actually can. 
if, 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 if you have a housing component to it, there's a pot of uh, dollars that we have in there. If there's an IT component to make sure that broadband uh, access is, 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 is going to be part of your plan, there's, there's monies in, uh, in, in, in this bill, uh, in this law now that are, you can access and, and go in there. And so we wanted to make it broad enough because, you know, so that all different types of communities in this state are able to benefit from this in a way that, you know, um, you know, what may work in the, I live in the Humble Park community, what may work here in Humble Park may not necessarily work in Cairo, Illinois, in, in Bentonville, and in Rockford. And so we wanted to make sure that as a grassroots sort of level and, and from the communities themselves, that they are answering the questions that they have been dealing with, uh, living with, and working with on for, for years. And who better uh, to, to have the, the answers to the, to the problems that, that, that folks have than themselves. And so we didn't, we really didn't want to have sort of these, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 superhero approach of people sort of, uh, you know, coming these organizations just coming in and saying, oh, we know what's best for you rather no, let's make sure that there's partnerships with, with all. And so that's why when we went back, um, you know, we've had this discussions even prior to, to, to 2019 and really started, um, uh, earlier in the year in 2019, if not before then. And when we came back in 2020 to, to sort of finish out this bill, you know, all of us agreed, like we have to really reimagine even this conversation, because if we are not trying to address, uh, you know, what has absolutely been highlighted through COVID, then we are, um, this is not going to do anything. And so I, I'm excited about that because I, I think that what the, the goal is, is that if we can find things that are successful, that we can hopefully be able to replicate it, not only in other parts of the state, but also be uh, set precedent and have other places in, 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 the, in the U.S. and in the world that can uh, look to Illinois uh, as a model. Um, and, but we'll see. I'm fingers crossed. Thank you. Uh, I, I think we have just two minutes left, and, and I would uh, like to, uh, if you would like to take 25 words or less, what should the takeaway be from your perspective about the role of, of uh, equitable access to public health in Cook County and the state of Illinois? Uh, where, where do we need to push to make sure that, it, that it, it happens, it happens immediately, and that we remember this 10 years from now? President Preckwinkle, I'll start with you. Well, you know, I've talked about our public health system at some length, and you know, we have a an eight billion dollar budget for the upcoming year, and 3.8 3.8 billion of it is in healthcare, so about half of it is in healthcare. But you know, one of the real challenges we face is that um, we have two hospitals, Provident and Stroger, out of I think 64 hospitals in Cook County. Mm -hmm. But we provide in our two hospitals, and it's mostly Stroger because Provident small, half of the charity care that's delivered in the entire county. Mm -hmm. So we've got, we've got issues, of course, around our own public health system, but we've got a broader challenge in the healthcare uh, ecosystem that the, the burden of care for those who are indigent disproportionately falls on our public systems. And we've got to figure out how to get other actors in the healthcare arena to step up and share that responsibility uh, because it's unsustainable for our healthcare system to, to continue to provide uh, such a disproportionate amount of the, of the care for those who are uninsured and underinsured. Um, we've got to get some help. Thank you. Senator Aquino? Uh, <clears throat> the thing I think about is we, have, we must care for each other. And in order for us to all um, thrive, you know, each one of us has to be healthy and, and, and so forth. And so um, you don't have to be a healthcare expert or even in that arena to, to have an impact on public health. As we mentioned, um, a, a, a affordable housing, having somebody to have a, a roof over their head and helping them with that can impact their health. Education, uh, uh, food access, broadband access, all there's so many other, there's so many things that impact um, the health of, 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 of people in our, in our society that I just encourage folks to, um, to, to go out and, and, and do something, help, some, help, help a neighbor, help some, in some way. I actually was just yesterday at an organization, the Spanish Coalition for Housing, and um, they were putting on their new board. And, you know, it's just, it, you know, saw all these, prof these leaders in their own industries that are, you know, being a part of, of, of such a great organization. And it's just, 
it just reminded me of, of, you know, you don't necessarily need to be an expert in one, in one thing or the other to have a great impact on something. So get out there, you know, um, in, in whatever capacity you can and, you know, just uh, put, put, your, put your little work. There's a lot of things that can be done uh, here locally that can have a global impact. Thank you, President Frankwinkle, Senator Aquino. I think the message from both of you is that we all need to step up and we are all in it together. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Dean Campbell. Thank, thank you so much. And again, uh, just a round of applause, uh, you know, virtual applause or whatever to our wonderful speakers. Thank you so much, President Preckwinkle and Senator Aquino. I know you have super busy schedules, so it's really wonderful for you to share your insights today. And thanks, Dean Pagano, for a great facilitating for a really interesting conversation. Um, we now have um, 15 minutes break, so I encourage people to get up and stretch, get that second or third uh, cup of coffee or whatever we might be on at this point, um, and, and come back at 10.15. We're going to um, be joined by Assistant Vice Chancellor Marcus Spetz, who will facilitate a conversation where we're going to talk about the importance of uplifting community voices in this work and hear from some of our wonderful community advocates uh, working in this space. So I'm excited. So take a little break, um, but, but don't log off, and, and please rejoin us at 10.15. And again, my my thanks to such a great way to start the day. On the front end, I am Marcus Betts. I'll be facilitating um, here today. Um, I'm happy to uh, be joined by our esteemed panelists, Dr. Arturo uh, Carrillo and uh, Mr. Richard Wallace. Um, if we can, I know the bios were sent out uh, prior to this, but if, if I could ask just uh, both of you, just for a, a minute or two, just to give sort of a, just introduce yourself a little bit about uh, who you are, what you're working on, um, and then we'll dive into uh, into our discussion. And I'll I'll start since I see you here uh, first, Richard. I'll start with you, uh, Mr. Wallace. Oh well, thank you, Marcus. Um, my name is Richard Wallace. I'm the founder of an organization called Equity and Transformation Inc. We're a non a nonprofit organization whose mission is to build social and economic equity for Black workers engaged in the informal economy. And I'll get in more in depth with what that means and how we go about doing that. Uh, I guess I'll pass it to my comrade Arturo. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm so happy to be part of this panel with Richard. I mean, amazing organizer and somebody I have deep respect for in the work. Um, so my name is Dr. Arturo Carrillo. I have a PhD in social work and have been a licensed clinical social worker throughout my professional career. You know, part of my uh, work that I'll, I'll discuss today in, at this, in this conversation will be revolving around the Collaborative for Community Wellness and what we've done to organize around mental health access and understanding just how uh, structural inequities are built into a system that allows mental health care for some and not for others, right? So we're going to really uh, unpack that today in the conversation and I look forward to doing so. Well, thank you both. And so you know, we'll dive right into this. Uh, the, the, the goal here today is to uh, really just share some of our real world, real life, uh, real world experiences in dealing with health equity, uh, pre-COVID, pre-pandemic, post-pandemic. This will be very conversational. Um, I'll, you know, I'll jab in there, jump in there a little bit. I might push back a little bit. I might play devil's advocate a bit, but um, feel free, gentlemen, this will be a more uh, conversational as we, as we sort of work through this, and I'm sure we'll have some questions as we go along. Um, so I'll get us started here. Um, a world-class city is a world-class city, a world-class county, a world-class state. It's only as strong as its weakest communities. Tell me a little bit from your uh, work experience about some of the things or the circumstances that existed pre-pandemic that have either uh, been made worse or some or have presented additional opportunities for us to be a better society. Uh, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll start with you, Arturo, if that's okay. Sure, yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> wow, there's so much to say about that. I mean, just let's start with the fact that as you point to, right, um, this city, as much as it is a world-class city, is really two different cities, right? It is a tale of two cities, right? We have certain communities and affluent neighborhoods that have an abundance of resources, support, safety, right? You could just go down the list 
and socioeconomic and, and socio-emotional indicators uh, show the, the difference, uh, even as, as simply as put as life expectancy, right? We see the biggest disparity in life expectancy in this city, uh, more so than any other city in this country, right? So we, we do have a reality in the city that we have to acknowledge and really have to embrace, not that we have to accept it, but we have to acknowledge that this is a tale of two cities. And so, you know, in my work, you know, as, as a clinician, as, as a community organizer who's working around mental health access, you know, it's, it's abundantly clear before the pandemic, there was an enormous disparity into who has access to mental health services. Um, as a result, you know, we, we, we've mapped out the data, we've seen the numbers. Uh, before the pandemic, uh, we, we did this uh, analysis and we've done it also uh, after the pandemic or since the pandemic started. Um, and the numbers have not changed. The ratio of therapists who can provide mental health supports for individuals going through any sort of personal situation, crises or the rest um, is much more much more available in the affluent community areas. The ratio actually is about 4.3 therapists per 1,000 community residents. So for every 1,000 community residents, uh, they get to share 4.3 therapists um, in affluent neighborhoods. That's an average, right? So we have, of course, neighborhoods that have much more than 4.3, upwards of 50 therapists uh, in some neighborhood areas. Whereas in low-income communities of color, probably 73% of the city's population lives in community areas that have uh, 0.2 therapists per 1,000 community residents. Right again, 0.2 therapists are shared by a thousand community residents, and so that disparity is is it was big, it remains big. That that needle has not shifted since the pandemic. What has shifted is what we've seen is just as we've assessed mental health needs throughout you know the last four years, uh, is the number of mental people needing and recognizing the need for mental health supports has always been high. And it's just as high now, if not a little higher since the pandemic started. And that's definitely understandable given everything that's going on, uh, what people have unfortunately had to deal with during this pandemic, which again, those impacts of the pandemic have been most uh, marked in low income communities of color, right? Let's, I could talk about that as well. Um, but what, we, what we've seen when it comes to mental health concerns uh, is that now in our citywide survey that we conducted this last year, 94% uh, of Chicagoans we surveyed, and this is a representative sample of 45, awards of Chicago's 50, 94% um, of Chicagoans are in this situation looking for mental health supports, right? 87% of them recognize that there's not enough mental health support in their neighborhood, right? And so what we're seeing, of course, is that, you know, there's, there's, there's a structural deficiency here that's been created by our, our, our design, our system of design. We have both a confluence of capitalism, right, where where money is and capital is available, we have a, a labor abundance of therapists who want to, you know, set up private practice in neighborhoods. Non communities of color who do not have that sort of capital do not have that same access to those therapists, right? Because again, who's going to pay for sixty to one hundred and twenty dollars an hour for therapy? At the same time, we have a legacy of disinvestment, and this has been a very clear neo neo neoliberal agenda that has sought to disinvest in the public sector to distribute the the remaining the remaining funding, uh, if at all, into the private sector. And as a result, the safety net, the social safety net this city once counted on with 19 public mental health centers has been uh, diluted down to five and those five centers are also understaffed, right? So what we see of course in, in, in this confluence of, 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 of um, high need and low uh, and scarcity of, 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 of supports in low communities of color is that we have uh, unfortunately the highest rates of uh, behavioral health hospitalizations in black communities on the west side and the south side of Chicago as well as the highest rates of uninsured populations on the southwest side and northwest side of Chicago. And what that translates to is that people's access to mental health care is, is who do not have access to, to this professional preventative support that affluent communities do, it means that we have to then funnel people into two very damaging systems. Uh, we have people either receive care in, 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 in the carceral state, right, through Cook County Jail, uh, through police interactions, or through a, a highly diagnostic and, and, and over-medicated system, which is uh, unfortunately uh, also the other option we have, which is the emergency room, right? The, 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 the medical systems, right? So both of these systems are, are unfortunately the only option for people who are dealing with crises uh, as the system is designed today. And of course, we, we as a coalition are working to change that and, and have proposed many different proposals uh, to expand the safety net. Well, thank, thank you, Arturo. And I, I want uh, Richard to jump in here, but I do have a follow-up sort of uh, 
I don't know, observation or, 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 or question for you. You mentioned that the data was uh, very similar uh, after the pandemic uh, to before the pandemic. Now, if we're looking at this with an equity lens, an ec not, not an equal lens, but an, but an equity lens, given, the, the, given the, the circumstances in our communities with crime and all the disinvestment, then those numbers should actually go up exponentially after the pandemic, not, not e and not even at the same type of rate, but, but given the additional crisis, it should actually go up. So in essence, it sounds like this is, this is that much worse if the fact that it's equal. So equal isn't, isn't acceptable. If I'm, I mean, am I, am I, you're the expert here. Am I, am I, yeah. am I on? You know, it's it, we. So all I can speak to is the data we've collected, and and what we when we conducted this survey survey in 2017, and it was on a on a swath of the southwest side, we found that 80 percent of respondents there were looking for mental health services back in that time. We replicated this in North Lawndale and a smaller subset of, of of sampling, and the rates there were about 67 percent of people were looking for mental health supports, um, in that time. You know, it's 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 high to begin with, and absolutely since the pandemic uh, and now doing the citywide survey, we see it's gone just that much higher. Right now, it's at ninety four percent. Right, so so you know, it, it was a problem before, and it's still a problem. But it's 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 as close to one hundred percent of people. Like I've never seen data that that shows almost uniform. Uh, universal acceptance for uh, for single issue in this city, right? Like, I don't think we get 94% of Chicagoans agree on anything, uh, but seeking mental health supports right now is, is definitely what we're seeing. And yeah, it's it's unfortunate because as we've sampled to your to your point, you know, those indicators in the areas of, of highest need were already high to begin with and going even higher just speaks to a level of, of um, unfortunately, uh, of crisis and crisis care that's absolutely needed now because things were bad before and now they're getting worse, right? As a clinician, I could tell you, uh, you just see that, unfortunately, that, that devol <clears throat> devolves into crises of different types. Let's put a pin in it. Richard, go ahead and jump in there. You've, you've been waiting patiently. Yeah, no, I appreciate the conversation. Um, and it just highlights for me that in the city where we see over 700 so odd murders, majority of homicides, and the majority of which happened in Austin, Inglewood, West Garfield Park, or we saw 214 babies who were shot. Um, mental health resources need to be applicable or need to be accessible by everyone in those communities. And I think that the state and the city of Chicago should be ensuring that those people, those, those, those family members are um, engaged in therapy. I think a lot of people, when they saw the statistic, I think it said 215 or so children were killed in Chicago. So they're saying that more pe more children were shot in Chicago than have died from COVID, right? Um, and it was just like mind blowing. And, and just imagine, so the trauma, it's traumatic reading those statistics, just imagine being those people, right? And so I think that there's, there's more than enough evidence that the resources should be, should be um, sent to those communities. I'm gonna pivot a little bit just to talk about my experience in organizing during the pandemic, right? So Eat, like I said, is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to build social and economic equity for black informal workers. Um, we do that through structured organizing and building sustainable alternatives to harmful state solutions. And so what we call the informal economy, you look it up in the textbook, it's gonna say a diversified set of economic activities that are unprotected and unregulated by the state. Um, it is for, for me and my upbringing, um, it is ride sharing, it is the candy lady, it is the hair braiding, it is the childcare, it is the selling loose cigarettes. If anybody is a parent on this call, you know how much it costs for childcare. If you live in a community like West Garfield Park where the average per capita income is $11,900 a month, a year, I'm sorry, not a month, a year, let me get that right. Um, then you understand that you there's no way in the world that a family in that area can can afford childcare. Um, and so it is really how the informal economy, which they don't show a lot of, you know, I think when we started our initiative, I think the reason why that was driving me to do it is that there was very little um, acknowledgement of black informality. There was, there was a law, there was a, there was a vast, um, <laughs> there was vast, uh, I guess, uh, statistics to expose our reason for being in the informal economy, like the unemployment rate, the wealth, the wealth gap, et cetera. 
Um, and, and, and highlighting what I think Arturo brought up is that we're, we're stuck in a wage-based economy. Um, and so when you see high rates of unemployment, please understand that um, they're paired with that are high rates of informal activity, right? Like there's no way you can't buy food. You can't buy groceries with hope. You need actual tender, right? You need wages. Um, and so our folks are hitting the streets to make ends meet. It is where for many black Chicagoans that are boxed out of the formal labor system due to things like anti-black racism, transphobia, homophobia, sexism, ableism, um, and the mark of a criminal background is where we make lemonade out of lemons. Um, and so it, it is, it does look like drug trade. And I think we, I think we, I think everybody that, that was part of the, part of the state in 2018 has got pie in their eye because now a large part, a large segment of that informal economy has been formalized and recreational cannabis, right? So it was criminalized right then and now it's, and so what we do is that we notice the trends and that a lot of things that were once informal, they get formalized. And when they do get formalized, there's a, there's a lack of retention in black bodies on the opposite end of the spectrum. So what that looks like is that bootleg and alcohol. When it was in the informal economy, right? You had easy access to black folks, Jack Daniels stole a recipe, you know, all of that good stuff, right? And when it becomes formalized, there's a lack of retention in black bodies. So, that's just a little bit about eat and, and who we organize. And, and I, I think the vision in which we build interventions through from, I think where you're aiming from is also important. So in March of 2020, uh, March 16th of 2020, uh, we began planning for the emerging COVID-19 pandemic. I think like most of the folks on this call, we were kind of like, we hear about it, but it's out there somewhere, right? Um, it didn't really hit home. Um, and, but we, we knew in the door when we started hearing um, the discussions around work from home, self-quarantine, people were running to the Walmart and stealing all the toilet paper, right? Like if you couldn't get toilet paper, couldn't get hand sanitizer. We knew for a fact it was going to be detrimental for our communities and that's black informal workers, right? And so a lot of our work happens, happens in the Madison-Pulaski corridor, but we also operate in Inglewood and West Garfield Park and also Joliet. And so, um, when I think it was on March 25th, the Senate voted unanimously in favor of the, the CARES Act, right? Um, and through the CARES Act, U.S. workers were entitled to a stimulus check for, I believe, about $1,200, unless they had passed due debt, including child support, bank debts, private loans, um, or they hadn't filed their taxes. Um, and so we did a focus group with Black informal workers. <laughs> Nine out of 10 were ineligible. Right. And so through that, we deem this as a racist policy. Right. And so I've, I've said oftentimes that like racism today doesn't look like it does in the past. Like we're not going to see whites only water fountains. Racism now is enacted specifically in the Midwest. Right. And quote unquote liberal places through eligibility criteria. Right. And so when you exclude people. Right. We believe that the people who needed the resources most were people who had hadn't worked in the last five years, who didn't have the resources to pay child support to take care of their loved ones, because we believe that no matter what, people want to take care of their children, right? And, 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 and those that were in debt, right? So we produced this digital life kit intervention um, for COVID-19, because we also knew that on top of everything, one, folks that were in the street can't quarantine, right? Like if, if you depend on the streets in order to provide subsistence, there is no quarantine. You get what I mean? In addition to that, there are victims of domestic violence. But what does that mean for them to quarantine if they got to go home to their abusers, right? And so the streets were their refuge. And at the same time, you started seeing the state also implement things like, uh, like curfews um, and dispersal orders, um, et cetera, et cetera. And you started seeing tanks on the west side of Chicago. It was really real during the middle of that pandemic. Um, and so for that reason, we, we, we decided to hit the streets. Um, we built out a community distribution hubs in Austin, Inglewood, West Garfield Park to distribute information about the reality of COVID-19 because it wasn't reaching the community, right? Um, and, and then also in the community, we were also battling the ghost of Tuskegee. People don't want to acknowledge that, but that was a fact. People don't trust the state for just reasons, right? The state has done some very dramatic and harmful things to Black bodies. And so there's, there's a lack of interest. And then on top of that, there was a digital divide. Right. And so we were like, all right, we got to get into the streets and actually do this. So we started distributing life kits, which was like a, a, a manual that also talked about how we can, you know, 
eat food and stuff like that, right? Like what foods we should be able to preserve, et cetera, et cetera. And then we built out this thing called Produce and Protest where we connected with black farmers and brought fresh food into the communities. And, the, and we cre created this pod mapping. And so the pod maps uh, served three core purposes. One was to establish a community care network. Two was to deepen community con connectivity. And three was to educate the community on how individual decisions impact the whole of the community. It, our, our analysis is not, you can't just go in a, in, a, in a community and be like, you gotta get out the street. It was more or less like, hey, you know, this pod map, right? You put yourself in the center. Who are you connected to? Your mama, your auntie, your cousins, right? And what are they connected to? They're, when they, when an emergency happens with them, where do they go? The county hospital, this, da, 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 da. Okay, so if you get sick, everyone in that, that outer bubble, go, and the outer bubbles get sick, Right, and then that what happens to that medical center, right? Then it's then it's it's at capacity, right? And then you have long waiting lines, et cetera, et cetera. So we really were not like out telling people what they needed to do. We just told we were just out there educating them on what the impact of the decision could be. Um, and so up, that's really uh, yeah, that's really what, I'm, what, what, I'm what we were into. Go ahead. No, I'm done. You you have touched on so much, Richard. <laughs> you touched on so much. I've, um, but I'll I'll just pick. I'll just pick one of these points to 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 sort of build on. Uh, you talk about the informal uh, the informal economy. One of the biggest challenges in COVID, I served I have I, I serve I chaired uh, the marketing subcommittee for uh, the the mayor appointed a, a racial equity rapid response team, which was an immediate the city's immediate response to the high mortality rates in the most uh, impacted uh, communities where we saw. Uh, mortality rate seven times uh, the rate in the in the black community initially. Um, one of the biggest challenges that uh, that we we saw that we had was when you say informal community or informal economy. I think about the hard to reach population, the folks that are not necessarily looped into academia or looped into mainstream media, but it, and it makes up a large portion of of, of our communities. Um, tell me, what do you all think? Why do you think there's been such a breakdown in communication from our uh, from our entities that are our public health entities that are responsible for getting this information, that critical information, life saving information, to the uh, people that need it the most? Why do you think that that disconnect is so great and in, and it exists? I can say, I'll just say, I'll be brief. I think is that like most of us, we were sitting in our houses assuming the change was gonna happen, right? Like we had to literally get ourselves out of our comfort zone, out of our quarantine and hit the streets, right? We had to bring it to the people. And I think that throughout the course of the pandemic, we saw some shifts in the city's approach to how to reach the people that were most impacted, right? Whether it was like digital hubs to sign up for vaccinations and actually being like, okay, first we're gonna make the app, right? And then folks didn't use the app because they realized that there was a digital divide. Then it was like, okay, well, maybe we'll do this and we'll open up the clinic. And then it was like, you know what? We're gonna build mobile clinics in the community, right, right, right? Um, and, and that we're gonna actually have folks that are in the community also be part of that intervention because it takes one to know one, right? Um, and so I think that we need to start at the end, right? As it relates to the city, like the city goes through each step Right, and then they kind of mark off, but as time ticks on, you have less and less people that have gotten in, right? And so if we want to, we need to start with like community-centered approaches, opposed to thinking that the community needs to come to you. Good, thank you. Arturo? Yeah, I have so much to say about the mayor's rollout for uh, COVID response. I mean, you know, I, I still don't understand with the amount of resources and knowing full well the amount of vaccines that were going to be available uh, upon FDA approval, how we ended up vaccinating so few black and brown people in the city of Chicago, right? I will also never understand, and I, 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 we of course had conversations with the Department of Public Health about this, but for example, I work for Brighton Park Neighborhood Council. Consistently, 60632, of which Brighton Park made 70% of that zip code, it makes up 70% of that zip code, uh, had the highest infection rate in the state throughout this, you know, the, the large waves that we went through. And yet it was not part of the six, the 15 community areas uh, that the city prioritized in their uh, Protect Chicago Plus plan. Uh, that was baffling. 
you know, and, and unfortunately, I think I'll just add to what Richard said, because on top of the fact that they don't prioritize community input early enough, there's this kind of gatekeeper mentality, right, where certain allies and nonprofits that are al allied with the mayor will have privileged access to information data and, and, and actually planning. planning. Um, and so base building and community input from the base is not happening. And so this, this kind of like stifles input because it kind of it goes through like a handful of nonprofits that have good relationships with the mayor's office. At the same time, this city operates from a scarcity mentality, right? We don't have enough money for anything, but even when the money's there, they're still operating from that scarcity mentality. Again, we're only choosing 15 of high priority community areas when vaccine rollouts, we know were necessary in at least 35. And, and unfortunately, right, it's this mentality of scarcity and, and, and people distrust that, right? I think at the end of the day, people are gonna just fend for themselves in the way they can. Um, and, and I'll just kind of like, just kind of round off my, my point by going back to the original uh, issue I brought up. You know, we also have an, a scarcity mentality because the city prioritizes, prioritizes its investment in the city's budget by spending about 40% of our general revenue on policing. You know, when, when we think about how over-policed communities are, the city of Chicago's main social service that it provides is policing through our budget. That's a political decision. You know, we fund about 14,000 police positions and about 20 therapist positions for the city of Chicago. I mean, this is the reality we're living in, which causes, of course, harm in communities of color. And then somehow we're expecting, you know, marketing campaigns to change that uh, perception of low income communities of color who are over policed and, and harassed on a daily basis by our city, again, by funding 14,000 police officers, right? So, you know, I, I think our parties have been completely distorted. Um, we, our campaign has been focused on changing this year's budget to increase investment and reopen public mental health centers. We have a $10 million budget amendment that uh, was introduced yesterday. Uh, we have pressured many aldermen and we have 27 co sponsors as of this morning. We're looking to get back to baseline on public mental health investments. Um, this is the mayor's campaign promise and we're looking to ensure that that sort of investment can start shifting, right? We had a defund movement and this city chose not to go in that direction. Very much political, that was a politically motivated decision not to do so, right? And, 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 and if hyper-policing and investment in police would work and make communities safer, you know, some of the community areas that Richard uh, mentioned would be the safest communities in the city. And that's not the reality, right? The reality is that the most resource community areas in the city are the safest, not the ones that are most policed. So th these are these are good points. And uh, if I, uh, if uh, Dean Campbell, if, I, if we need a time check here, there's so much to, to go into. This is so juicy, but just just give me a signal, a, a, a smoke signal or something. Three minutes to solve this all. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, uh, Aturo, great points. Um, I will say uh, very quickly that uh, in terms of the city's response, because I was actually, I was very deeply involved in that. Sitting at that table and trying to figure this thing out when even our health professionals, hospitals, emergency responders, doctors were trying to figure out what was going on. People were dying. We're trying to figure out how to respond to that. It was probably one of the most stressful um, and complicated um, things that, that I've ever been a part of and had an, uh, the, the privilege and responsibility to see. Um, I can say that in this case, with the model that was created with the racial equity rapid response team, I actually thought, uh, given that I've seen how these things have worked in the past, that this might have been a breath of fresh air in terms of being community led. Uh, hey, you pick, you have to choose uh, some organizations to work with. Not everybody can get at the table. You have to expand and build on that. But in terms of decisions being made with true community voice at the table, I can say that in this particular process, that that did happen um but you know it's just a step it's a step it's one step in the journey of a, of a, of a thousand miles in this process so um but you know the work that you do the work that richard do does on, in terms of advocating and continuing to keep pressure on our uh, electeds is critically important for this process to continue to grow um with the last minute or two that we have um and it's a big question but hopefully you can keep it kind of concise here what role would you say uh, our public institutions need to play, must play in this process, this journey towards equity? I guess I'll just be quick and brief on this point. And, and of course, Richard could definitely add to this. 
You know, I think we have to really understand how investment in public systems and public infrastructures matters. I think this pandemic has showed us, right? You know, let's not kid ourselves. And this is a conversation we had with Commissioner Arwadi prior to the pandemic. The Department of Public Health was woefully underfunded before this pandemic hit. And, and that did not allow us to have the, the structures in place to support community uh, when this crisis uh, emerged. So we were behind the eight ball from, begin, from the start. Um, I think our public institutions can really, really, really do more to talk about what defunding and reinvestment looks like, to, to learn from our mistakes and to establish the structures uh, in the communities that need it the most. If we're really about equity, then we have to build the systems and, and use tax dollars to increase capacity and, and, and public investment in these community areas before the crises hit and as long-term remedies, right? One-time investments do not change structural oppression. We need to find more permanent solutions and permanent investments. Thank you. And I see Dean Campbell is there. Richard, 30 seconds. And Okay. I think the, the crisis response needs to be permanent and that this is until the conditions actually change. Our people have been in crisis for way longer than the pandemic. Right, and so the, the same way that folks were nestled around tables making rapid response decisions, ensuring that the community was resourced, they need to stay in that tendency until the conditions change. Um, and that is just the necessary, I think, I think the necessary posture for, for us in this moment. And with that, that will be the last word. Uh, gentlemen, thank you both for this uh, vibrant uh, discussion. Certainly, uh, we probably would never have enough time. Uh, I see hands going up. Yes. Oh, that's a clap. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Campbell and uh, the USC School of, 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 of Law uh, for pulling this together. Good morning. Uh, first off, I want to thank the University of Illinois Chicago School of Law for hosting such a dynamic event. It is super exciting, uh, the space that we're in right now as a country and around this issue, and to uh, be able to partner and collaborate with uh, the law school, another unique opportunity to bring these types of events to you. With that being said, I know that we've got a short time frame here, and I'm super excited to uh, introduce the speaker. Uh, Dr. Braven has been a champion of healthcare equity, quite frankly, long before it was sexy. Uh, her work speaks beyond her professional accomplishments, but it really speaks to the heart of her advocacy and commitment to moving the needle uh, as it relates to disparity in healthcare. And so it is my honor to uh, be able to facilitate this and to introduce her. I encourage you all, uh, as Amy mentioned, to refer to her bio, but I think that you are really all in for a treat today to be able to take advantage of the work that she's done and her insights on this topic. So with that, um, uh, and without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Braveman. And again, I encourage everyone, if you have questions and if we uh, have some time on the end, we will try to make certain to address those questions. And if not, I've been assured that we will be able to save a snippet of the chat and the questions and try to circle back to all of you. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Paula Braveman. Well, thank you so much for your kind words um, and thanks and congratulations to UIC for organizing uh, this event. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, uh, how we define the concept of health equity. Next slide, please. Okay. And so first slide I want to show you um, shows these two gentlemen, uh, very well fed looking gentlemen uh, uh, in what looks like a men's club. Uh, and one is saying to the other, well, the poor are getting poorer, but with the rich getting richer, it all averages out in the long run. And um, what I like about this um, about this this picture is that it what, what it brings out is that when we're talking about the concept of equity, and this is equity in general, whether health or in um, some other sector, when we're talking about equity, we are not talking about how it all averages out uh, in the long run. We are talking about how uh, groups who have been marginalized and excluded are faring um, both in absolute terms and in relation to more privileged groups. Next slide, please. 
Okay. So why spend time discussing um, definitions? Um, there are a lot of different definitions of health equity. And um, for some of them, the, the distinctions uh, you might say are, are more semantic, some are more poetic and compelling, um, but there are some real substantive differences um, uh, between some of the, the definitions of health equity that have been uh, advanced. Um, and uh, when you think about what it takes to achieve health equity, um, you're talking about a, a, a very long a process that needs to be very strategic and it's going to be uphill um, and it needs to engage very different kinds of stakeholders who will have very different kinds of agendas. Uh, and so under those circumstances, if, if you don't know where you're going, there's a lot more danger of getting uh, detoured um, onto, uh, onto side, side paths and not not going in the direction that you want, want to go, even um, with the, the best of intentions. Next slide, please. So what are some of the common um, pitfalls um, of definitions of health equity? I'd say the major one, the most serious one, um, is uh, when they remove the social justice content. Um, and now let me say a little bit more about that. M many definitions of health equity rely on the concept of health disparities. And I'll be talking more about how those two fit together, the health disparities and the health equity um, a little bit later. Um, but I would define health disparities as differences in health that, are, that adversely affect marginalized um, and excluded groups. Um, but some definitions of health disparities, which, which then shape the concept of, of health equity, define those health disparities as including any dif health differences across any social groups. Um, another common pitfall of definitions of health equity is <clears throat> when uh, a definition relies on uh, having to make a causal inference um, that may be very difficult to support with evidence. And I know a legal audience um, can be very uh, uh, sympathetic to, you know, the notion of how hard it is often to, um, to attribute uh, causality. Uh, and then just in general, many definitions lack a firm um, conceptual basis. Next slide, please. Okay. So when we look at how health equity has been defined, um, we have to sort of go at it from different directions. And um, uh, sometimes things are defined by their opposites. Um, so health inequity um, uh, is a concept um, that was defined by Margaret Whitehead um, from the UK. And she defined a health inequity as differences in health that are not only avoidable and unnecessary, but that they are also unfair and unjust. Um, and I don't think anyone has ever um, come up with a more compelling and clear um, definition of the essential notions um, uh, relevant to the concept of health equity as a whitehead uh, has, and she, this came out in 1991, and it's been used around the, around the world. Um, but there are some weaknesses, and the weaknesses are that, of course, your idea of fairness and your idea of justice and your idea of avoidability may be very different from my ideas of those same. Um, and so that can be a real problem and leave a lot of a lot of wiggle room. Um, uh, and um, related to that, this definition doesn't guide measurement. And why, why is measurement important? That without measurement, you don't have any accountability. Um, uh, and so that's a, that's a limitation of this definition. But this is the most um, widely used around the, the globe. Next slide, please. So um, uh, 
uh, the CDC for many years and many um, federal agencies for many years defined health disparities simply as health differences across different population groups. And what's the, what's the problem with that as a building block for a definition of health, um, health equity? Are all, are all differences in health between any groups um, unfair? So it, if I tell you that skiers are much more likely to suffer arm and leg fractures than non-skiers, um, does that fill you with outrage at the injustice of it? Um, I doubt it. Uh, if I tell you that uh, wealthy people in Manhattan had an illness that wealthy people in Beverly Hills did not have, I don't think that's going to make you weep with, um, with concern about the, the injustice or fill you with outrage. Um, but now this next one is, got, is trickier. If I tell you that younger adults are generally healthier than the elderly, I think most of you would say, well, that's, that's fair. That's just the way it is. But, but I have to confess that the older I get, the more unfair I think that one is. Um, so who determines what's fair and how you know, on the basis of what, what criteria? Uh, and I think a definition of health equity that has legs needs to, needs to address um, those notions. Next slide, please. See, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so uh, some definitions of health disparities, and again, as a building block for definitions of, of health equity, um, some of them have defined health disparities as health differences caused by social injustice because they wanted to make sure they got that con the concept in there of social injustice. And the strength of those definitions is that it's very explicit about the values, you know, unlike what I showed you previously. Um, and it's also very intuitive. Um, but the weaknesses are that it's very, very difficult to prove a causal link between social advantage and many health outcomes. Not, not in every case. There are some cases in which I think we have it nailed. We have centuries of evidence, centuries or, and or decades of evidence. But for many health outcomes, we don't. And it's very hard to prove a causal link. Um, and so you are, if you have a definition uh, that relies on that causal inference, um, you, you, may be in, you may be in trouble. Um, and uh, for many, uh, many health disparities, um, and for example, a health disparity that I, work, I look at a lot in my research, which is the black-white disparity in preterm birth, the causes um, are not fully known at all um, and or they are um, highly contested. And yet you wouldn't want to have um, disparities in um, those outcomes, for example, preterm birth, which is an incredibly important um, health outcome, predictive of infant mortality and childhood disability and adult chronic disease. You wouldn't want to um, take them um, out of the arena of what should be addressed by efforts for health um, equity. So next slide, please. So I um, uh, have worked with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to develop a definition um, attempting to address the prior weaknesses, um, knowing that what we came up with is not perfect um, either, but, um, but hoping that it addresses some of the key um, uh, the key concerns. Um, and so it's a two-part definition. And the first part addresses measurement. And again, you need without measurement, you don't have accountability. Well, that's really crucial. So for the purposes of measurement, I've defined health equity as um, reducing and ultimately eliminating disparities in health and its determinants 
that adversely affect excluded or marginalized groups. I want to sort of underscore that and its determinants, its determinants including but not limited to medical care. And then the more intuitive part of the definition for the folks who don't relate a lot to, um, to uh, measurement, which is most of the, most of the world, um, uh, they, that more intuitive part um, uh, goes like this. It says that health equity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. This requires removing obstacles to health, such as poverty, discrimination, powerlessness, and their consequences, including lack of access to good jobs with fair pay, safe environments, and quality education, housing, and health care. And so you'll note um, that this has that the same weakness that I pointed out for the Whitehead definition, and that it, it um, talks about being about fair and just. Um, here it's fair and just opportunities. But what we had hoped, um, and we uh, we felt that that was a, a, a crucial concept that needed to be part of it, but that by being more specific after that about what that means, um, that that um, closed some of the um, the big. Um, the big loopholes that are there when you just talk about fairness and justice without um, without saying that this is what fairness and justice um, looks like. And I want to call your attention to this um, uh, concept here of, of re um, this requires removing obstacles to health. Now, and I'll talk about that more in a, in a minute. So next slide, please. Okay. So this is a slide that came out of the Norwegian Ministry of Health and Care Services um, uh, quite a while ago. I really like it because it illustrates this notion that some groups of people have more obstacles to health um, than others. Um, and that that is the um, the responsibility of a society is to remove to remove those obstacles and to, to equalize um, equalize the the obstacles where they can't where all obstacles cannot be um, el eliminated um, and that um, particularly the responsibility is to do that to remove the obstacles for those groups who have experienced more obstacles marginalized and, ex and excluded groups. Next slide. Uh, so um, this slide talks about um, actually all co concepts from international human rights law, um, uh, which I think are a very, very important basis for defining the concept of health, um, health equity. And one um, of the very important principles in international human rights law is the principle of non-discrimination, um, uh, which says that it's not just intentional bias that has to go, but also de facto bias. Um, and this is what um, so it's, this is the, then the obligation to address, for example, structural racism, which is built into structures and policies um, and, and institutions uh, and can uh, keep going and perpetuating um, uh, discrimination and unequal treatment uh, even uh, even in the absence of any um, individual, particular individual intending to um, discriminate, um, so that's a, a, I think a, a very very um, powerful notion that's um, part of the, the health equity um, concept. Um, so from international human rights laws, there is the societal obligation to prevent and to remediate discrimination. Um, and so again, that discrimination can uh, not just the in intentional discrimination, but de facto discrimination. Um, 
And this concept of the obligation to remove avoidable obstacles to health, especially for groups facing more obstacles, um, uh, I really got that I mean, in, in crafting the, the definition of health equity that I've proposed. I crafted that really from the um, principles in international human rights um, law. And I think it's a very, very powerful notion. And um, then an, uh, another very powerful notion coming from international um, human rights laws is that all rights are in connect, interconnected. They cannot be separated. So you cannot realize the what's been called the right to health without realizing the right to decent living standards, the right to education, the right to um, and, and uh, civil rights. And this is the concept that brings in um, the notion that it, it is all determinants of health that need to be addressed in pursuing health equity, not just health care. So it's about uh, food and housing security. It's about education, freedom from discrimination, that, um, uh, that you cannot um, you, you cannot achieve health equity without addressing the, um, the rights and the lack of rights um, in, you know, in all of these um, important sectors, the so-called social determinants of health. Next slide, please. Okay, so the basic elements of health equity um, that I would, I would say are first justice and next the, this concept of removing obstacles to health for groups that have been disenfranchised, marginalized, um, uh, and or excluded. And this notion of addressing all determinants of health, all imp obviously important determinants of health, not only health care. So next slide, please. So um, in th thinking about that, then the the, the obligation to address the social factors that influence health. What's the, you know, what does that rest on? Um, number one, we can invoke international human rights law, but in addition to that, we have centuries of evidence on the health impact of poverty and the correlates of, of poverty, such as hunger and inadequate education and housing and powerlessness and crime. Uh, and we also have decades of evidence, not centuries, but decades of evidence on um, racism and health and how racism uh, 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 damages um, the health of people of color. Uh, and here I've just highlighted, you know, four different um, pathways, causal pathways through which racism harms health, um, for which we have evidence. Um, one is insofar as racism constrains the economic opportunities of people of color, so leading to economic um, disadvantage. Uh, and the, the link between economic disadvantage and health is, um, is incontrovertible. I would say we've reached that point in the history of the, the study of, of these issues. Um, we also know that racism leads to disenfranchisement. Uh, and um, that there is a very rich literature on the health consequences of being powerless. Um, uh, 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 also, if we think of disenfranchisement in terms of, you know, literally um, deprived of the vote, then if um, people of color are, are deprived of the vote by different efforts at voter suppression um, or gerrymandering, then that means that they don't have, they don't have the representation um, uh, in uh, lawmaking bodies um, to, uh, uh, to address to, uh, to address those, uh, what the, the conditions are um, in, their, in their communities. Um, so uh, we also know that racism leads to a host of harmful exposures and experiences. Um, 
of people of color and uh, just uh, you know, a couple of examples. One is environmental injustice. Um, and that's very, it's very clear that the um, disproportionate citing of toxic, um, toxic waste dumps and, um, and toxic materials in uh, communities of color, largely com um, communities uh, of color. Uh, and uh, an Another example, um, uh, which would also be an example of structural racism, uh, the harmful exposure um, to uh, biased policing and sentencing, which leads then to mass incarceration, which inflicts health harms not only during imprisonment, but uh, condemns uh, the prisoners to a life of, of economic hardship because they're, sti they're permanently stigmatized and there are tremendous implications for the families um, and, the, and the communities. So, and it, so uh, the, the health effects um, ripple um, out uh, in many, many ways. And then lastly, but certainly not le uh, least, um, uh, the, uh, we know that racism produces um, uh, uh, stress, uh, stressful experiences, and there's a body of literature looking at the physiologic effects of racism-related stress uh, and what its consequences are uh, for health. Next slide, please. Okay, so I think we're in a, a, a very different um, position now talking about health equity and talking about the social determinants of health than we were even 10 to 20 years ago because there have been some huge um, advances in, in science. Um, uh, and um, among the most important of those advances has been advances in neuroscience that have indicated how social factors like income and education and stress and diverse experiences of racism, how those actually get into the body to damage health. And I'll um, say a little bit more um, about that uh, in, in a minute too. Um, uh, we know uh, among those scientific advances is that now we know that chronic stress, much more than acute stress, but chronic stress is likely, is very likely um, as a major contributor both to socioeconomic disparities in health and to um, uh, race-related uh, disparities in health. We've also learned that childhood experiences shape adult health in very, very powerful ways. Um, and then the, uh, there's been an accumulation of, um, of uh, research on um, racism, and so an increase in the understanding of how racism shapes health um, uh, across an individual's life course, but also across, across generations, and even an, an, a new awareness of the concept of historical trauma that could um, explain how slavery the experience of slavery, 250 years of slavery, um, what that could do uh, to uh, the, uh, the physiology of, uh, of African-Americans that could, in, in, in a, a, a damage that could, uh, that, that could endure. Um, and that has to do with a, a, an, a, an area of scientific advance um, called epigenetics. Uh, um, also um, referred to as gene environment um, interactions. And, uh, and the idea here is it, with epigenetics is that, our, that the DNA doesn't change. Your genes are there. They don't, they don't change. But whether they get expressed or suppressed um, uh, can be a function of the of experiences that you have. Um, including um, stressful experiences and in different environmental um, exposures. And there's this great quote from Judith Stern um, at UC Davis, where she said that genes load the gun, but the environment pulls the trigger. 
um, which I think says a lot. Next slide, please. Um, so just to dig down for a, a, a couple of minutes in some individual social determinants of, of health, um, uh, income uh, or accumulated, um, accumulated wealth are among the most powerful uh, um, forces, of, you know, influencing health. And there's um, a, uh, an evidence base for each one of the links that I'm talking about in this slide. So for example, we know how your income or your wealth can shape whether you get medical care and, you know, and what quality it is. A, a healthy diet is more expensive than, a, than an unhealthy diet. Um, your options for physical activity can vary depending upon whether you live in a neighborhood where it's safe to exercise or you can afford a gym membership. Uh, the, um, your income and your wealth um, very much determine your options for housing and, um, and for the kind of neighborhood in which you're going to uh, bring your kids up and what services um, that you can that you can access determined largely by how much money um, you have. And then in turn, all of those um, can affect your stress levels. Um, uh, so the absence of the services, the being in um, uh, difficult neighborhood uh, conditions, not having the physical activity options, you know, not being able to get medical care, all of these can be stressful. And then stress, we know, affects family um, stability. And the family uh, stability then, um, or instability, can, uh, then becomes another source of, of stress. Um, we also know from the literature that the income and the wealth um, that parents have um, very powerfully shape um, their offspring's education. And education is the um, strongest determinant of the kind of occupation that, um, that one will get. And then, of course, your occupation is the biggest determinant of the kind of uh, income that you, you'll be able to earn and wealth that you'll be able to um, to accumulate, and this is not even talking about the whole issue of who has um, who has uh, intergenerational wealth. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So I had said that your you know your options for the neighborhood uh, where you can live. Um, are really shaped by income and wealth. We know that concentrated poverty creates unhealthy places, lots of literature on this and just listed um, some of the many sort of aspects of, uh, of neighborhoods that are affected by concentrated poverty here. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to read, um, I'm not going to read them, um, but I am going to comment that um, racism tracks black people into poorer neighborhoods than whites of similar income. So if you're reading a study and they've controlled, uh, they've uh, controlled for household income, family uh, income, uh, and um, they're making whatever claim about um, what, what uh, the racial differences might, might represent, um, if they haven't measured the um, the neighborhood, the if they don't have a measure of the neighborhood level of poverty, they've you've, they've got an incomplete picture. And furthermore, if they don't have a measure of the childhood and lifetime experiences of um, of economic uh, hardship or or privilege, um, they don't have. Uh, a, um, a full picture and their conclusions may be very, very um, uh, off, off track. Ne next slide, please. So this slide, um, I, I know that it's, you know, the, um, the fonts are too small to, 
and, and we don't have the time <laughs> to read all the contents of it, but I wanted to show it to you just to make the point that um, there is a huge literature on how education affects health and it does it in many different ways. And one of those ways is by increasing our health knowledge and our health literacy and our coping ability. Um, but, uh, and that's the way I think that most people think about if they think about the, the link between education and health. But um, I think that there is reason to believe that other pathways, other causal pathways are much more important. And in particular, how education influences health because education um, determines the kind of work that people get, which then determines their income as well as their work-related resources and their working conditions, um, et cetera. So uh, 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 a, a large literature also on how education affects health. So next slide, please. Um, uh, I mentioned this um, before, but want to underscore it, that, the, um, that advances in neuroscience in the last 20 20, 25 years um, have really um, uh, shown us how stress damages health in a way that we didn't know um, before. And it has revealed that, that how that neuroscience has revealed how chronic stress um, due to social determinants like income and education and racism how they can lead to uh, chronic disease. And there are many um, different physiologic um, mechanisms. I'll, I'll show you, you know, one in particular in the, in the next slide, but it's not the, um, it's not the only one. This is the one that I'll, I'll show you involves cortisol. That's what I think most people have heard about, but there are other physiologic mechanisms. So the, the causal pathways have been traced from stress to health, and there is no reason to believe that uh, the cause of the stress, um, uh, you know, uh, should be a determining factor. It's, you know, whatever is causing that stress, but there is reason to believe that it's, it's the stressors that are chronic that are affecting uh, a person over time, even at even if they're at a fairly low level, that's what seems to be most toxic physiologically, the chronic stress, which I think is counterintuitive for a lot of, um, for a lot of people. But I think it is really understanding that, how chronic stress, even at a low level, um, uh, damages health, I think that that has increased our understanding of how racism um, damages health. So next slide, please. So this is just a little uh, pictorial uh, illustration of one way, just one um, sort of physiologic pathway through which stress um, is known to damage health. And so um, uh, please ad advance the animation, thank you. So we experience, a, we have a stressful experience and that stress then gets registered in one part of our brain, the hypothalamus. Now, next animation, please. Yeah, and the, the, that part of our brain sends a chemical signal to another part of our brain, the pituitary gland. And next, please, um, which then sends a chemical signal so next, thank you, uh, uh, sends a chemical signal to the adrenal glands. And uh, finally, the, uh, then the adrenal glands pump out cortisol. And uh, it looks like acute um, uh, bursts of uh, cortisol are not damaging to health. But what is damaging is when there are chronic, when there's a chronic uh, uh, elevated levels of cortisol, and that this leads to damage to multiple organs and systems, and that produces chronic disease, it, pro it produces inflammation, it produces 
um, suppression of the uh, of immune function. Next slide, please. So um, racism as a chronic stressor, there is a, an extensive literature now um, on that. Um, and um, we know that structural racism produces economic disadvantage. Uh, uh, it um, consigns people of color to the, the, the children um, uh, of color to inferior schools, which then consign them to a lifetime of economic um, disadvantage. That's a very, very powerful way in which um, social disadvantage gets um, perpetuated um, uh, by racism. Uh, having um, uh, exposing uh, be because people of color face more. Um, obstacles to um, economic uh, opportunity, um, uh, they experience more economic hardship with fewer resources to cope, that's stressful. And if it goes on over chronically over a period of time, um, that can result in health damages. Um, and just another example, unfair uh, lending process, uh, practices that lead to low home ownership um, levels among people of color and the um, inability to lower levels of, of wealth, because for most um, people in, in this country, their home is the main, that's the main wealth um, is in the home. Um, and then that uh, uh, leads to stress through many different, many different pathways. Um, that economic disadvantage generally is um, is stressful. Um, uh, Dr. Braveman, this is Shannon. I'm wondering as we wrap up and for the interest of time, we have one question that is really relevant to the remaining slides. So perhaps you can address that as we bring it to a close. I will read the question and I, and I just sure. have to insert myself because it fits nicely uh, with where we're going with this. But the question is, in our divisive times and with an often individualistic ethos permeating our policy actions or inactions, do you have recommendations based on your work and years of experience for how to invigorate the collective responsibility necessary to achieve your robust vision of health equity? And I just, I think that fits in or ties in nicely with the last two slides. So uh, I, I thought it was such a good question. And as we bring this to a close, if you could address that, I think that would be amazing. That's, um, I, I, let me make sure that I, uh, that I understand the, the question. Could you repeat the last, the last sentence of it? Absolutely. It really is. Do you have recommendations based on your working years of experience for how do we invigorate the collective responsibility necessary to achieve your robust vision of health equity? Okay, well, that's, I think that that's a, I think that that's a, a great question. And it's partly the, um, I, th I think it's sort of, it's the biggest challenge facing our facing our society um, and uh, I, I think that the experience early experiences are um, probably key and so that um, solutions that involve big um, investments in early childhood education um, that it and it's early childhood education that is done in a way that um, that invigorates uh, the sense of um, collective responsibility, to use the um, the words of um, uh, of the person raising the the question. I, uh, that you know, I I think that we can. I, I think we look for opportunities with adults. Um, uh, with older children, adolescents, and adults to um, sort of win over minds to a, a sense of we're, you know, we're all in this, um, and to a, a, a commitment to anti-racism. Um, um, but I 
think in the end, the, the biggest payoff is going to be um, when we invest in, in early childhood education and make, make sure that there are contents of the curriculum there that, that, um, that, that do that. So I'm, I'm not saying we abandon efforts in older, in older people at all. We need to, we need to do that. But um, uh, yeah, but I, 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 I think that it's, it, I think it's, I mean, this, whoever raised that question has, you know, put their finger on, I mean, it's the central, it's really, it's the central problem, right? If you don't, you have a, a society that does not feel that we're in this together, you, you have limited um, stuff to work with at all. And, and so we have to look for ways um, uh, to do that. I think for me, some of my, you know, the, uh, my own, um, in my own research, uh, I have tried to, um, I've tried consciously to sort of appeal to that sense of we're in this together and the collective responsibility. Um, but, um, uh, but I can't judge what the, you know, what, what the payoff is from that. I, you know, say another example is insisting that the concept of health equity, saying, let's not let that get hijacked <laughs> because right. we have right. been, there have been multiple attempts to hijack the, the concept and remove all of the social justice content. So for me, uh, sort of being engaged in, uh, you know, work to define health equity has been, has, has been about, about that, but seeing that as, you know, as a tiny, tiny fragment of the, you know, of the whole of what needs to get done. Um, but well, I guess- Dr. That, Dr. Braveman, what I will say is that while you may not be able to be the judge of that, I think that we can all be the judge of that your work speaks volumes for really sort of a blueprint for, for all of us. And so we are grateful for the presentation today. I know that this has been unbelievably insightful and I'm certain that there will be uh, many who will refer back to this and who will um, hopefully from a collective perspective uh, work to move the needle. So I want to thank you for uh, this really insightful presentation. And again, I wanna thank um, uh, our host. And with that, I will turn it back over to Amy and team. Again, thank you, Dr. Braveman. This yeah. was a wonderful session. Okay. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Braveman. And I love, I, I so appreciated that final slide too, when you you sort of challenge law and policy. Um, I think sometimes we don't realize our role in creating um, obstacles and barriers to equity and our resp collective responsibility to address that. Um, and, and uh, you know, that last, uh, that question, I think really is, is the challenge as we go throughout the rest of our day and, and really what our, our program is about to think about how can we um, laws and policies reflect collective will and how can we engage collective responsibility for um, addressing these inequities. So I think we've learned so much. So my deep appreciation for just an amazing morning. I, you know, I don't know how the afternoon's gonna top this. We, we've got our work cut out for us, but um, I just wanna let you know, we have another um, little break time and at noon we'll, we'll gather again. Um, to sort of take what we've learned this morning and especially pivoting from this um, excellent uh, presentation on defining health equity um, and thinking about it much more um, holistically and deeply and thoughtfully um, and with that justice in mind to situating that within our evolving sort of pandemic context. And we'll have an opportunity to hear from the commissioners of health at the city and, and state levels, um, as well as the leader of the Cook County Health System uh, with facilitated by Dean Giles um, and introductory remarks from Dr. Barish, the vice chancellor for health affairs. So I'm really excited for our noon session. I think we've had such a great lead up into the day. And so I hope I, I send you um, away just again for uh, refreshments or somewhere so sorry we're not all together they would be you know more concrete refreshments that I could offer you but uh, take a break um, and we'll meet up again at noon um, and thank you again so much Dr. Braveman and Ms. Andrews for just really a, such an informative informative session thank you
So it really is a great pleasure to be with you today and welcome our distinguished leaders, such as Dr. Awadi and Dr. Ezeke, and I'll get to uh, uh, Israel Rocha soon too, but I have to say uh, to, to uh, Ziki and Allison, thank you so much for leading us through this pandemic, all the early morning and late night calls that we've had, and also Wayne Giles at the School of Public Health. We can't thank you enough for everything you've done. I mean, it's just an amazing job and uh, you've saved so many lives and both the city and state really are a great debt of gratitude to the two of you. So Israel, welcome, welcome to Chicago. And uh, it's, it's really great to, to have you here and we're really looking forward to working together with you. And we're excited about your, your leadership at Stroger. So thanks for being on the panel today. So I think I speak for everyone when I say we're, we're great, great looking forward to the panel conversation today and hearing about your experiences firsthand during the pandemic and as we move into a new era and into our future. I'd like to recognize the efforts of UIC's Health Equity Law and Policy Program. Amy, you've been fantastic, specifically Professor Amy Camp for bringing us together for this discussion today. And thank you for this opportunity to share and connect with one another. Without a doubt, the COVID-19 pandemic has drastically shifted how we think about individual health and the wellness of our community at large. Prior to the global outbreak of COVID-19, UIC's academic health enterprise, UI Health, has been a critical voice in the understanding and development of structural and policy level solutions to address the complex issues that influence the health and well being of our patients and communities. Although the national conversation is indeed shifted to account for this intersection of the effects of COVID 19, racial and civil unrest, political divisiveness, and health inequity, this is a space that UIC and UI Health has worked on for decades. Our direct connections to the community and civic leaders has always informed our approach to addressing social determinants of health and innovating in areas that may seem non-traditional for a healthcare enterprise. Programs such as Better Health Through, Through Housing Initiative, the oldest in the country, is a shining example of this concept put to work. This program established through our emergency department aimed to identify frequent users of our emergency services and found that many of these patients were homeless. UI Health set up a program to find and place individuals in a stable home environment of their own to better serve the whole health of these patients. Indeed, to this day, the program is celebrated as a national model for how health systems can structurally serve the needs of their patients. Further, we share a rich history of programs such as the Urban Health Program, the oldest in the country, the Federally Qualified Health Center Network of the Mile Square Health Center, and it was named Mile Square because in that square mile were the worst health statistics in the United States. The Jane Addams College of Social Work and many other programs. This history and expertise informs our approach to social inequities and our collective understanding of how we can change and influence structural change to better the health of our neighborhoods across the state and beyond. The recent addition of the School of Law to the university immediately offered great promise to complement the robust ex expertise of our academic health enterprise. Indeed, the addition of this professional ex uh, expertise to our conversations about public health and wellness for the future is sure to add value and insight into transformative pursuits for many years to come. And by the way, we're opening up uh, a new health, uh, Federal Health, health Center in Auburn Gresham, and we hope to have a uh, UIC uh, law school there to provide services to the underserved. It's very exciting for us. So we look forward to engaging conversation with our distinguished leadership today. And once again, thank you. We look forward to the insights and discussion for this incredible panel. I would now like to welcome Dr. Wayne Giles, our simply outstanding Dean of the UIC School of Public Health to introduce this afternoon's panel, Dean Giles. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Barris, and thank you for your opening uh, remarks um, as well. I'm really excited about today's panel. We've got a great group of uh, leaders uh, at the state, uh, county, and city level, all who have come together um, to really to talk about sort of the work that's gone on over the last 18 months uh, with COVID, and more importantly, or most importantly, where we think we're going to be going as the pandemic continues to evolve, and sort of the important impact that health 
uh, and health policy and law um, can have on all of that. And I just also want to echo what Dr. Barish said about not only your leadership, but your staff's leadership at the state and at the county and at the city level. They have been amazing. They have been true heroes in keeping all of us safe. And just a huge thank you uh, on all of our behalf to them as well. Um, so on our panel today, you have Allison Arwadi. She is the commissioner for the, the uh, Chicago Department of Public Health. Uh, you have Dr. Ngazi Azike, who is the director of the Illinois Department of Public Health, and Mr. Israel Ro uh, Rocha, um, who is the CEO of Cook County Health. All of their bios, which are very extensive, are um, in the chat. So I encourage you to look at them um, uh, through the chat. I also want to encourage all the uh, all the folks in the audience, if you have questions or comments, please um, post them in the chat. And we've got two students who will do a great job sort of helping us to facilitate the questions. I'm going to, we're, we're going to take about the first uh, 25 to 30 minutes sort of with a facilitated conversation. And I want to start off with the first question, which really is a little bit of looking back. And it's when you consider the past 18 months of the pandemic, what challenges have you specifically faced and what experiences, uh, what successes have you experienced? Uh, so uh, if each of you could take about five minutes for that, that would be great. And I'll start with you, Dr. Azika, at the state level. Great, um, thanks so much for, for having me. It's a pleasure to be on uh, with this esteemed uh, group of panelists. Um, I just, I think, there, there's a lot that we have uh, obviously been through together. I think what is so key is that we are in this position where we are experiencing double vision, right? We are experiencing double vision, uh, visually hallucinating, if you will, between what we actually see, what is here now, versus what we know we should be seeing. Uh, and, and the goal is as we you know, unpack all of the lessons learned uh, from this pandemic, which is really just a, a mirror of so many other things that we will be able to, to correct that double vision and, and get our vision to what we know it should be, though it's not there yet, but what we are visually hallucinating the, the ideal that we will get closer to that. Um, and I think you know, this kind of event where we are encouraged to, to look to what it should be um, and, and, and identify that, that difference between where we are and what it should be, uh, that delta, if you will, pun fully intended, that that delta, uh, that in there lies our charge uh, for doing the, the work across all of these different systems with so many different stakeholders to, to get to uh, where we know we should be from all these in, uh, incredible lessons that we've learned and, and forge these new questions. You know, for example, it's not about, oh, where do you go get tested you know, for COVID-19? You know, the questions had to become so much more complex and in depth. It was, why would this person not wanna be tested? Is the location that the testing is at, is it accessible by public transportation? Do people have paid leave that they can get tested without impacting their, their household income for the week? So being able to understand the, the proper questions that need to be asked, that's been one of the biggest lessons and making sure that we're asking those questions up front to help create the solutions that are necessary so that that initial simple question becomes easier for everyone to, to partake in. Thanks, that's great. I, and I really like uh, the vision, the, right, that double vision that you talked about, because that's really sort of where we are uh, in many ways and, and asking the right questions. So that's good, that's great. Mr. Ro Rocha, your thoughts in terms of both successes and challenges from the Cook County perspective. Sure. You know, at first, I, I want to thank you for again for hosting this panel and giving us this opportunity. I also want to take a quick moment to to thank 
uh, Dr. Nsika and Dr. Awadi for being amazing partners. I think throughout this entire pandemic, their collaboration across the state and county has been unprecedented and has been uh, you know, incredibly helpful for everything that we have done across the board. And, and most of all, I wanna thank both of you for taking some tough stance in times when we didn't know what the, the things we needed to do were, but you were there and stood fast on tough public stance like masking, on making sure we implement distancing even to vaccination mandates of today. Thank you for being great partners with us and everything that you have done. I think it has truly been a collaboration and uh, and through it uh, has been a work a partnership and developed great friends in the process as well so thank you for everything and for all your support uh could have would not have been the same without it so thank you you know i, I would say that it, it has been in a tremendous journey um, that all of us have been through and it has been uh and for for me personally it started in new york and now here in in, in chicago i would say it, it's difficult to compare it as as a timeline because we have evolved so much. And I think if there's one thing that can be taken away is the amazing resilience in our healthcare system. There's always questions about what we can do. And, and I wanna thank everybody across the whole country for what they have done. You know, to take a healthcare system that used to really focus on, on, a, on a micro level, patient by patient on the illness that they were dealing with at the moment, to have to address it so globally and so quickly with a disease that reminded us in many ways was so humbling. We had become so uh, you know, comfortable with our technology and our advances to when this disease first came forward, um, you know, I was at Elmhurst Hospital, which was one of the first hospitals that saw a big wave of those cases. And, and to be humble that you had to go back to just air and water. You were giving basically oxygen and hydrating the patients were the best things that we knew at the time till we were able to, to be able to advance the processes and to see our system work so quickly to go from that where we really had nothing and we're, we're grasping at straws trying to save people with what we had uh, in ventilation and hydration support to being able to quickly mobilize, create uh, you know, drug therapies and antibody regimens and launch new service lines to having now in our hands uh, a life-saving vaccine is tremendous. And I think it shows the collaboration and amazing rigor that was brought by our team and, and cannot discount uh, and cannot, and cannot uh, you know, really overstate more than anything else the importance of also the sheer will of our healthcare core across the country to, to go from you know, a, a work environment where it was you know, a rewarding work that you committed to to save lives, but you didn't necessarily think you would be putting your life in jeopardy to do so to have to do it every day, entering those buildings, putting yourself on the line, and they did it so courageously, I think was extraordinary. Uh, so I think it was humbling. It has reminded us of how much we have come forward, but in the same way of how quickly something can change. And we had to rethink everything uh, from, you know, not we have rules that had protected us like Mtala and EDs, how you need to do to immediately make some modifications to that to allow for rapid testing and triaging and assessments and onboarding and rules that have protected us, but to make leeways to be able to expand so quickly to have hospitals go from having 50 ICU patients to north of 200 at one time, all needing ventilator support and moving uh, staff and people around the country. Uh, all of it has been a tremendous partnership. And for us, it has been very special to mobilize our mission at Cook County Health to be a place to serve everyone, to really be there and to create things in partnership with Dr. Uh, Nzik and Dr. Arwadi on creating large, massive vaccine centers that help treat the city. And now we stand here having given directly about 900,000 vaccines and even 1.5 collectively through our health system and millions across through our partnership with the state and with the city. To have done that is amazing. And to be here in a time as a public health system to serve the public in a way uh, that was so so humbling, so inspiring, so rewarding all at the same time has been extraordinary. So I'd say it's been humbling. Uh, it shocked us and uh, the resilience of our team made us stronger. And to be sitting here, I hope that now we have a, a life-saving tool in our hand that can save lives through vaccinations. I, th I really hope we just continue on that journey. Great, thank you for that. And Dr. Awadi, your thoughts from the city perspective? Yeah, absolutely. And again, want to echo um, first, of course, my thanks to my colleagues, uh, and uh, you know, all 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 three of you are, are people that I've talked to very regularly. Um, and I want to, and I also really want to appreciate um, UIC Law for this new partnership, thinking about this space. 
Um, I, you know, I, some background just very briefly on this. Um, when I was pre-med, I don't think I even knew what public health was. I took an epidemiology class just for fun. And I was like, oh, this is the most interesting science I've ever done. And then I was like, let's try another thing. And I took a public health law class and I was like, okay, I'm sold. I was like, like literally those two um, really made, helped me make my decision that this was the field, even though I like practicing medicine and I continue to see patients and love it. Um, I love the work of public health. Um, for a lot of reasons that we've seen really come to life in this pandemic, because when public health is working well, it's very much in the background, right? You don't see the work. Uh, it's when we're having outbreaks and having issues that I think a lot of the, the things that folks in public health spend a lot of time thinking about really come to the forefront. And so um, here in Chicago, as I, I imagine most on this call know, um, we have already been focused, even before COVID, we were focused on the nine year racial life expectancy gap in Chicago, where black Chicagoans live about nine years less long um, than other Chicagoans. And looking at what are the root causes on that, sort of trying to work on that, but but not necessarily, I think, getting as much traction or attention to that way of thinking. And I do think with COVID, the whole world has started thinking very differently about root causes, right? We've been talking about crowded housing for a long time. It's very different when crowded housing becomes the difference between whether you quarantine safely, right? We've been talking about uh, nutrition, equity. It's very different if you have the resources where you only have to go to the store twice, you know, twice a month, or you can get your groceries delivered versus you're needing to go out and get food. The, you know, think about the word, uh, you know, essential workers, which has taken on an extremely different um, meaning for us here in COVID. And my hope, um, you know, echoing a little bit of, of what Dr. Zike said, is that where we've said, you know, we don't want to go back to normal, right? Like normal is not what we're aiming for here because normal was not giving people the opportunities that, that they deserve, frankly, to be able to live as healthy a life as possible. Um, and then, um, and then echoing uh, Israel a little bit, this, this partnership piece is also critical. Any success that we've had at the city level, at the state level, at the county level, is because wherever possible, honestly, we have tried to kind of keep the politics out of it and say, how can we bring different ideas together? How can we listen as much as we talk? And how can we fund trusted voices in community? Um, and so just to give one really specific concrete example, because um, I want to have time for the, the panel. Very early on here, um, we knew we needed to stand up contact tracing. And uh, you all know that government is not known for doing things quickly. And it was tempting to do what a lot of other states and cities around the country did, which was to uh, you know, contract with an existing call center or even contract with an academic center, like, you know, like UIC could have been a really good option. But we were like, this is an opportunity to hire 600 people who don't need specific training necessarily, right? Like the work of being a contact tracer is something someone can learn on the job. We've been wanting for years to build opportunities for people, particularly on the west and south sides of Chicago in the community areas that have uh, the most problems with inequities and the, often people need the most support, frankly, in terms of being able um, to access healthcare, but also more importantly, um, a lot of the other, the other work of public health. Um, and we knew that the community-based organizations in those areas were struggling already from a COVID perspective. And so worked with the Chicago Cork Cook Workforce Partnership and through about 30 different community-based organizations, in turn, they each hired, you know, 10, 12 um, contact tracers. And so we created this core of 600 people. The City Colleges of Chicago did all of the training. It was an earn-as-you-learn program. We specifically went for folks who had barriers to employment um, and, and, and not any particular education history. You didn't have to have a degree because we really, you just had to be sort of good at talking to people in your community and very much based. And I think that early decision, although it was a little painful at the beginning because it meant it took longer for us to get some of this going has just paid off in spades because it's meant that we've got this strong network now um, 
of community-based organizations who not only support us in theory, but have staff who are directly doing the collective work of, at the moment, vaccine. But where we want to be going with this is these same individuals who have just been doing amazing work. They went from contact tracing to, you know, the vaccine ambassador work, to the knocking on the doors, to the connecting people to services. Um, and this is some of the model that we're thinking about sort of post-COVID. Everywhere where we invest, we're trying to say, how can we invest in ways that address the issues that were here before COVID and that will last long beyond COVID. So from a law perspective, that's things like data access, right? There's major work to be done there. Um, that's things like uh, thinking about authorities um, and how can we shape those in a way that there's perhaps less debate about them uh, at a time of emergency. Um, it's opportunities like, uh, you know, where are, there, where are there possibilities to streamline policy to make it that if we need to very quickly um, be doing things for public health purposes, we can move faster than government normally moves. Um, I can give more examples, but th that just gives you a flavor. The My number one ask kind of in the post COVID way to the city of Chicago was that I needed lawyers because I didn't have dedicated lawyers at CDPH. And it's the thing we have leaned on in some ways the most um, during COVID. And so happy to talk some more, um, but any, any success here is due to, to partnerships very clearly. Thanks. Great. Um, thanks for that. And thank all three of you. Um, I, I, I want to pick up on one of the themes that was mentioned, which is sort of how all of this has evolved. And um, Allison, you mentioned early on, right, sort of it's not just about sort of test, and I think Israel, you as well, it's not just about testing, but do people have the right access to testing, et cetera, et cetera, right? So initially we were talking about distribution of PPE and testing, right? Um, we were talking about, you know, I can remember being on calls with community groups who said they couldn't get food delivered to their community, right? So we sort of, how do we address some of those barriers? But it has sort of evolved in many ways to sort of now we're in vaccines, vaccine hesitancy and uptake uh, uh, of that as well. And so sort of to, to, for each of you to think about sort of what are you doing around sort of, and how can partnership and policy and law help and as we evolve with the pandemic. And, and so that's question part number one. And part number two, I think as we think post pandemic, what can we do for, in terms of health and policy as well? Whoever wants to go for it. Allison, it's like you're unmuted. You want to start and then we can have the other. Yeah, sure. Um, so, right. I was already highlighting a little bit of some of, yeah. some, some of these partnerships uh, potentially. And I, I, I care a lot about preparedness, right? Historically, I think we thought a lot about preparedness in terms of stuff. And so the city of Chicago, thank God, had millions of N95s, you know, had ventilators, still not enough. We weren't planned to have to sort of do the entire system. We were really focused on, on hospitals. Um, but I'm extremely proud of some of the planning work that had gone in um, way before COVID here. And I, it was a big part, I think, of us, of us starting out on a reasonably strong footing. But I think some of the spaces where I think ahead about preparedness actually are in this legal space, um, as well as in not waiting for a crisis to build those partnerships, to hit the other part of, of, of your piece there. Um, and so we really at, um, you know, in, in the city, uh, we've created these six, uh, what we call healthy Chicago equity zones, which are a post COVID idea. Uh, the entire city has been divided into six, six regions. Um, and we are not just asking people to get together, but we are funding, we've done competitive opportunities. Um, and we have a lead organization, half of them are healthcare, half of them are community based organizations in each in each of those six regions. And then they in turn, are funding um, smaller community based organizations in every one of the 77 in um, you know, community areas. And they're starting with a focus on vaccine. We did that on purpose, A, because it's what we have the most funding for right now, uh, but also B, it gives this opportunity to kind of work very explicitly on who is still not reached, right? Where have those barriers still been? And those are gonna be different in you know, the far north side as they are on the far south side. There's different pieces. Um, and so we're, we've gotten it started with funding around vaccine, but looking ahead toward next year and the year after, uh, really, our plan is to take the lesson from COVID, uh, which was not to do so much 
we're bringing a testing site or we're bringing a vaccine site, but saying, you tell us, right? We've got resources, the, these tables that were set in different community areas, let us know what you need. Where do we do this? How do we do this? How do we change messaging? How do we get trusted voices out? And so we're going to be doing the same thing where these regions, um, we had the grant writing was a little bit tricky because normally you have to be very explicit about what you're doing. And we said, we don't know yet because each region is going to get to set its own priority in a post COVID kind of way. If one wants to work on breast cancer and one wants to work on nutrition security, like we're all for it, but it's got to be sort of with this public health equity lens. Um, and we've gotten some money for, for example, some like health disparities and health literacy grants and things moving forward. And we're trying to think ahead about how to funnel resources that let us have these strong networks in place to work on those inequities that were prior to COVID, but also that you can activate quickly. Because one of the biggest differences, the, the communities that we saw a lot of early success with vaccine rollout were those communities that had been very together already for Protect Chicago, and we'd knocked on 400,000 doors before there was a vaccine. Um, and we'd like to see that same kind of structure and jobs and funding, uh, real public health infrastructure, um, and then be more prepared prepared uh, to, to be able to respond to whatever's next. Um, Israel, your thoughts? Sure. You know, I, I would say that I, I agree in, in how we look at the system and how we're going to design something for the future. I think it's a conversation that's happening all over the country, because to be honest, and, and we have to take an honest, hard look assessment to know what didn't work and what did work. The way that we were structured left some gaps, I think, and we were able to, to come together and work on them very quickly, but there was either gaps that were identified by having social inequities exist throughout our, our communities, and so that is something that we have to move forward and address, not just for this, but take some long, hard stance about what we're going to do. Our health infrastructure, the reason that mortality was there, part of it was because of social risk factors that had been underlying health conditions. Part of it was that our infrastructure and our investments and access wasn't the same. There were communities that didn't have necessarily equal amount of ICU beds as others. We had always looked at everything by county, by state, by geography, and taking a very close regional look on that block by block, region by region area, looking at the proximity for ambulances, proximity for beds, and how that's structured across an equity perspective so that everyone has equal access to those systems are going to be important conversations going forward and how we address that. I think it's important how we look at systems. Also, the interplay between like public health departments and advanced care centers and trauma centers and others and how they integrate together to make sure that we have um, benefits and, and partnerships. And even within public health departments uh, across the country and health systems, even here locally in the communities, we have multiple departments, we have multiple areas, how we create regional coalitions to be able to mobilize faster and how we create a uh, streamlined planning. So we're really going to address diabetes because we have these new resources and a new way to do education. What are we going to do different this time? Because I think it was a good moment to stop and check our whole health system, what has worked and what hasn't. And there are amazing things that have helped. We, you know, we've been able to stop things like measles and tuberculosis have to have huge mitigation, but we still have things like diabetes and obesity, lack of access, challenges that still exist, disproportionate rates in cancer, massive comorbidities that exist. And, and for me, I think it's an important check-in to say, okay, separate, we have done great. What can we do together, integrated and structured in a way that could really drive that change? And that's not only our systems, but as, as you know, Dr. Awadi talked about, bringing in those community health centers and empowering them with information to use what they have. Bringing our most advanced comprehensive centers and saying, okay, we have these hot pockets of advanced disease and how do we really take uh, the care out of the clinic room and out of the hospital setting into the community in a way that is more mobile. And how do we take things like telehealth, telemedicine, and now these uh, advanced teams that we've been able to pop up and do clinics and be able to tack on some of those great challenges so that the work that we have been able to see supercharged overnight in one year, we went from not having one drug to dispense to having a vaccine and regimens and everything in between. To bring that kind of power to the things that have created those disparities long term is a huge opportunity that we want to make sure doesn't get ignored. And I think that's the most important pressing thing because we can go back all into our corners and, and remember COVID in a year from now, we really don't wanna do that. We wanna take what has happened 
and really supercharge what it has done. And I think now more than ever, there were questions whether you needed public health departments, public hospitals, public institutions. I think from New York to LA to Chicago and everything in between, you have seen that those public enterprises are very vital to community stability and health. And so we really wanna see how we can work together and continue that conversation and ensure that things go forward and, and, and see where we go from here uh, to solving some of these really difficult challenges uh, that we have faced and say, no more. This is our moment in time where we're gonna do something about it. Thanks. And Dr. Uh, and Ghazi, your thoughts on this as well? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'd love to build on, on what uh, Israel was saying that, you know, I, I am so motivated and everybody should be so motivated by the types of collaborations. You know, our normal suspects, of course, you know, IDPH is gonna partner with hospitals, gonna partner with, you know, FQHCs, uh, the local health departments, but these collaborations just took another level. And, you know, us as a governmental agency, we were forging uh, collaborations and connections with non-governmental agencies, you know, community organizations, groups, which historically we've just never partnered with before. The, the National Immigrant Justice Center, we were working to ensure that incarcerated immigrants and and non-immigrants in Southern jails and central Illinois jails that they were getting the vaccine. We have just made another push uh, in the last week where after we've done, after we've hit every single prison uh, in the state uh, early on and put them as a, as a priority population, we're making a second pass now to get uh, staff and, and uh, the inmates there to be vaccinated. The, the Council of Islamic uh, Organizations of Greater Chicago, they have been critical in assisting us in our outreach to specific members. Again, as Israel said, um, you, you, you can't just look at the county or the statewide numbers. You know, the law of averages will literally kill you and you'll miss so much. And so you have to get down uh, beyond the, the big averages, which can swallow individual pictures and individual pockets and work with these groups that can outreach to specific members of specialized populations and provide resources and culturally relevant information and education uh, to make sure that everyone is actually benefiting and that these average numbers are, are, don't include such vast uh, differences. You know, our support of organizations within the LGBTQ uh, communities uh, with grants and, and technical assistance to address the issue uh, for, for that population. So we are continuing to, to build uh, those relationships. And, and, and Allison says, we wanna make sure it's not like, okay, great, COVID's over. It was nice working with you, see, peace, see you later. Like that those are ongoing bridges with bi-directional communication so that all future you know, issues, problems, pandemics that we have to tackle, that we continue to work together to make sure instead of waiting for disparities to, to manifest that at the outset, we are, we are working to make sure that they're not created in the first place. I mean, I think people would be surprised to know that every weekly dashboard, when I sit down with the governor and show him the data, along with you know numbers of this, how many tested, how many vaccinated, how many deaths, how many hospitalizations, it was also you know what percentage of blacks have gotten it versus percentage of whites versus per percentage of Asian. Hispanics broken down by age groups, like all of that is, is equity and we care about that and we're going to continue caring about that and make sure that those uh, differences don't continue to exist. Good, thank you. Thanks. I want to, with this theme of partnerships, I do want to lift up a question that was in the chat, um, which is how can we implement higher integration between the legal and medical fields to achieve health equity, right? And I mean, I, mean, I think as we're thinking forward um, into the future, I, I'm also struck by Paula Braverman's uh, presentation earlier today, where she talked about the intersection with the social determinants of health, right? So to achieve health equity, right? That me means we need to make sure people have safe jobs, that they have quality education, health care, uh, employment opportunities, et cetera. So I guess your thoughts, one, about partnerships between medical, public health, and legal, but also sort of implementation of policies that get at some of those really important core social determinants of health. And whoever wants to take the first step, feel free to do that. It's like, it was really you've unmuted, so yeah. Sure. You know, one of the things that I would just say that I think we can, we'll get into the integration of it, but for me, it's really important. Words matter. And what I'm concerned about the conversation with the use determinants is that in some communities, it can give someone an excuse that you cannot resolve certain problems. 
where, where healthcare and law come in together is also in our socioeconomic policy, what we create in our reforms. If people have challenges with housing, that's a housing policy issue, not that someone because of their address is determined to have diabetes. I can tell you fundamentally, there is no gene that says that if you live in a certain street, you're going to have diabetes. That's not how it works. But when we tell people that, and we're, we need to be very careful with the word determined, it can mean a lot of things. If we had taken a lens that people were determined to get cancer, or we're determined to get any other illness that we've confronted, we would have very different solutions to what we have today. And I wanna make sure that that in itself doesn't become uh, a wedge in equity access because someone is determined to perceive that you come from a certain neighborhood or you look a certain way that it's gonna be determined that you're gonna have diabetes. So maybe I won't try as hard or because you know I've heard conversations and I've been on other panels where people have said, oh, this technology is very difficult because you know of social determinants, they don't have income or literacy. That's not true. We have the power to determine it, but we need help. And that help is all of us working together. Nothing is determined if we're willing to come together. So I really want to make sure that I understand we call it as a policy process, that it determines your health, but it can also be implied to believe that it's determined to happen. And we need to be careful. I know we use social risk factors more uh, pervasively in our institution just because of that. I don't want anyone to have an excuse to say, oh, they're determined to have diabetes or they're from a certain block or neighborhood or they look a certain way so I can try less because it's determined they're gonna have that. I'm gonna do my best, but you know, it's just determined. We need to be careful. And I think that's where law can come into effect. And so where healthcare and policy and law comes in together is addressing those social factors and identifying that they're more than just healthcare. There are in institutional events that we need to address. And that's how we can work together between different industries to come together and determine how we can help address housing challenges, how we can get more food or funding or social programs to go to certain areas. Public policy and healthcare must work hand in hand, and we have seen what can happen um, when it works together for the betterment of everyone. And I think that we need to do that very carefully uh, and methodically and have a journey that ensures that we're not creating se more separation, but more inclusion by ensuring that we see it as not just an individual personal responsibility in an area because I live in this part of town, but more globally that we have to come together and address that institutional issues have led to these events happening and we need to take them on one by one, whether it's racism or justice involved patients or any kind of other inequity, those big challenges that have been there, now is the time to fix them. And I think if we work together, we can do it by coming together between healthcare professionals, lawyers, public policy, and everything in between to address some of these challenges. Yeah, I think that's a that's an interesting point. I think uh, you know historically what we have seen across the country has been that barriers have been put in place that do determine sort of where people uh, live, you know, the types of jobs they have, et cetera, where they go to school, et cetera. And I think really what we're talking about is what are the policies that we can implement that remove those fundamental barriers and sort of what that that looks like. And I think that's an important theme. And I agree with you, words really do matter. But and Ghazi, your thoughts on this, and then we'll go to Allison. Yeah, no, I definitely words matter. And, you know, as we move through uh, this pandemic, words were some of the most important pieces uh, of this pandemic, whether it was using the right words to show people why the evidence uh, should lead them towards thinking more seriously about a vaccine or, or you know, just giving people the right information. Uh, similarly, with some of the policies, again, in, in our public health department, you know, Allison mentioned that, you know, ha having a maybe a deficiency of like legal expertise built in within the department now seems like something that has to be addressed. Even at the state health department, there is a legal department, but just not enough resources uh, to handle the challenges and need more people with that legal mind to be thinking through, you know, as we're moving from you know, policy to policy, from guidance to guidance, being able to look ahead and say, wait a minute, how could that be challenged later? How will they try to, you know, turn this upside down and, and throw it back in public health's face? We had so many problems with trying to, uh, people using public health against itself. And so you really need that whole public health legal team to be looking at every guidance we write and using that legal lens to say, wait a minute, 
we have to be careful with this word because this can be used by someone who's on the opposite side that wants to turn it upside down. Um, I know when we deal with the state's attorneys, when we have people challenging different things throughout the state, uh, the state's attorneys you know, don't have any kind of public health uh, legal background. And so they're just kind of at the mercy of who that, who's ever brought this uh, fourth, you almost can't even put together uh, a strong a strong defense because this is not any expertise that someone has. And so they kept looking to the state, uh, the state legal team to be in every single county battling all, all of the, the challenges, which was, which was impossible. So we know that that, that marriage between public health and, and legal and law has, has to happen in a very permanent you know, infrastructure, architectural way uh, as we move forward. Uh, yeah, so I mean, really, really interesting trying to think about how to fit in, be, in, be, in between those, those, those conversations a little bit. Um, I think, so an interesting thing here at the Chicago Department of Public Health, you know, I didn't have a dedicated lawyer per se. I had a HIPAA officer who thankfully was extremely interested in these issues and was helpful. And my, my leadership team, which is small, it's, you know, fewer than 10 people. I've actually got three lawyers on that team. They just are not working as lawyers, right? They're, they're working kind of in other spaces. Um, but I think there is something, you know, around people who have this particular bent toward um, toward kind of public health and law, because it, it is about what are the structures, right? Uh, yes, there is certainly need, and, and we're super supportive of the kind of work of making sure that individuals can access legal um, uh, resources, and that is really critical, like, like Israel was saying, you know, in these clinics, and that's been shown over and over again to be really helpful at the individual level. But we're also very interested in how you can actually change um, some of the, the code, right? The ordinances, the laws, the rules. Um, and I think COVID in some ways, for better or for worse, has opened the eyes across the country to the power that public health departments have or can have, um, particularly during a time of emergency. And if you want to talk about a word that's been thrown around and debated a lot, it's actually emergency and sort of what does it mean to be in a state of emergency and who declares that and right and it's got it's it's been used around funding debates, whether you're talking about FEMA, it's been used around um, declarations of, you know, when are we able to use more rapid contracting processes, it's been used, like, in this, this idea of how do we define when we can do things in a not normal way, who gets to make that decision, how does that fit in. And it's been, I think, for me, one of the more interesting parts kind of of this whole pandemic, I had not paid a whole lot of attention necessarily to the legal powers um, that I have as the commissioner. And it turned out, you know, there were a number of things that like I actually sort of on paper had more authority to do even than the mayor, right, than of the city of Chicago. But you then, you know, it was this interesting work with the law department um, to sort of say, you know, how do we use that power in a way that doesn't overstep because what we have seen all over the country is there's been this real pushback also against you know some really to my mind common sense things that people have been wanting to do uh to keep their population safe um and we've seen examples where uh you know people have used the law to say you cannot right you cannot have this mask on in this school you cannot have this vaccine you know you cannot um and do these things and we even saw it go like in tennessee for example if people were following this you know we saw the example happen where not only did the health departments have to stop promoting the covid vaccine they had to stop promoting all vaccines um and this sort of sliding of public health powers authority is something I'm really worried about post COVID because like I said, we are usually a little bit more under the surface. We, we do use our powers sometimes, you know, if I've got somebody with active tuberculosis, like I can require that person to be in a hospital, right? Like, um, and not be, not be, you know, and getting treatment or at least not spreading, but it's more, but on an individual level, I think with more of the kind of isolation and quarantine and school orders and vaccine mandates and, you know, all of these different things, there's this real push right now between sort of individual rights versus collective rights. And in public health, 
pretty much by definition, we're, we're first thinking about what do you do um, at the most basic level to, to protect the whole community. And that will more often take precedence over an individual's rights. But at the same time, you have to make sure that you are protecting the basics, right? And the privacy and all of these pieces. And so I just think it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating time that, you know, yesterday I was doing an affidavit related to this vaccine mandate lawsuit we're doing right now in the city. And, you know, we're looking at this 1905 ruling, um, which a lot of the vaccine mandates have, have really been using. So it's this exciting kind of area of law, but it's not an area that, um, like the city's lawyers also did not really have a lot of health, public health expertise. And that's why, you know, thinking of that as a particular field um, and one that there's so much room to grow in. And we, you know, we, we do, we do policy work all the time, right? We're, we're working on saying, you know, we're right now we're evaluating our rock crushing rules. Like that doesn't sound very interesting, but it has to do with, you can put policies in place that protect neighborhoods uh, and make air quality better. And, you know, it's a lot of this kind of getting the work done. The last thing maybe quickly is just, um, I, I, I think I would be remiss if I didn't bring up the, the data piece. I think COVID has highlighted that people in this country, in this city, in the state are very interested in data if they think that it is relevant to their lives uh, and that it is timely and that it is being used. And my hope, you know, we've put a lot of resources, as I know the county and state have, into things like public dashboards, and we're working with UIC, and you know, I'll, I'll, Wayne, I'll let you speak to that if you like. Um, but but with with the Chicago Health Atlas dot uh, org, where we you know we got this goal that people, I mean, it's crazy to me. A lot of people know the positivity right now. They know the case count. They know what these numbers are. And I would love to have people have that same sense of data. But it means moving public health from the the sort of field that is putting out a report report three years later, right? Here's the 2019 summary right now on HIV um, and having it be more real time. And then also much more, um, as, as both of my colleagues have mentioned, much tighter. So we're, we've got things on block levels and census levels and zip codes, as opposed to just the whole city. Um, and I think law it's gonna play an important part in this. We're working on, are there ways that we can set up better access and better data sharing in ways that are codified, um, that make it so that if a health system is reporting, uh, you know, by already is by law reporting data uh, to the state health department, for example, are there ways that, that local health departments can access that, that continues to protect privacy, et cetera, but lets us do more of that focused intervention um, and resource-driven work. And a lot of that, that, frankly, is the work of law. And it's something I'm super interested in seeing happen after COVID. One of the very first emergency rules like we passed um, here in Chicago was, for example, that um, here you had to report race and ethnicity when you were reporting anything related to COVID. We never had that before. You never had to report race or ethnicity. And the mayor from like about day three of this was like, what do you mean? You know, like we're doing this and we're going after this from a legal perspective, codifying it and then working, you know, starting there and then working for it to be something that people are not just assuming, but asking about having conversations about thinking about in the healthcare setting. And then we can collect that in ways that help us see these patterns and address them. Great. Um, there's so much in what you said, Allison, that, that is, uh, I want to follow up on, but I'm going to follow up just on one piece and I'm going to ask uh, um, Dr. Zeke if she wants to, but, and that's sort of what's happening in other states, right? So states, you know, uh, what's happening in Tennessee and more recently Texas, right, around uh, mandates. And, and I guess your thoughts on sort of how do we um, mitigate the, the chances of things happening and, and this sort of backlash around mandates, right? I mean, I think, I think about Mississippi, a state that historically has done really good work in childhood vaccinations and now no longer, right? The, the legislature's put, pushing for something that would sort of, uh, eliminate all vaccine mandates. So just thoughts on sort of how we can sort of mitigate that. And I don't know if there are any conversations with your other state health officials just about sort of how we, how, how, how we turn that around. Yeah, well, it, it's been very challenging as, uh, people may know we've had so many state health officials who have been in the grind trying to make sure that we forge the right path forward, letting uh, important public health principles be be honored. You know they you know they've been literally removed uh, from office um, and gotten caught in this political mire. So uh, there's a concern that if we don't have 
unfortunately, maybe some federal oversight that sets some baseline thing. I mean, we know that there's going to be different opinions, different views, state to state, but there have to be some some baseline principles that have to be adhered to by states so that we can't let the you know the political football that has you know played with the pandemic and cost lives we we can't let that take over from basics that we know about um and so I, i'm thinking that that's going to have to be handled uh with you know federal oversight and and federal uh you know legislation that will not allow some of this you know political wins to cause just an undoing of basic public health tenants that really will result in, in unnecessary loss of life. Thanks for that. Um, I'm going to sort of, we're sort of at almost at the end of the hour, so I'm going to close up. And I think you all have done an, a really amazing job sort of integrating some of this uh, into um, each, into the conversation, but just uh, really uh, being as concrete and specific as each of you can. Um, what would you say are a couple of things that UIC law can do to help you in your efforts? And we'll start with uh, you and Ghazi. Why don't you start and then Israel and then Allison? Just but two or three concrete things that UIC law can do to help you out. No, we, we have, again, you know, the state health department has worked with so many partners. Um, we would love to have uh, lawyers come and support, you know, Pro bono, come in and support, you know, the, the legal team at IDPH have, you know, to just to increase some of the bandwidth. You know, we'd love to start thinking about some of the the forward policies or, or legal statutes that we need to be thinking about putting in place to make sure that there can never be too much of a deviation from just some basic uh, public health, you know, tenants. Um, we know that the, you know, the quarantines and the isolation, that was, you know, when we think of, you know, telling someone, oh, you have tuberculosis, you, you need not be running around, you know, going to grocery stores and, and going to Lollapalooza, that, that is different than, you know, how, what we're facing now when you have people, you know, literally, you know, 20,000 people being diagnosed with this disease, um, you know, a week. And so being able to frame, like, what does it look like in, is, it, is there, is that a need for pandemic law, disaster proclamation law, and how we can, you know, maybe have a special carve out for these unique situations, which Hopefully won't be that often, but when they do come up, there needs to be some guidance and framework and maybe having that now against the next, you know, severe disaster uh, epidemic pandemic might be helpful to, to start building that infrastructure now. Israel, your thoughts? You know, I, I agree. I think that there's a lot of things that we could work together and whether it's creating healthcare clinics, um, you know, here that are health legal clinics for patients, whether it's working with our team members to review policy. I, you know, I think uh, both Allison and Dr. Uh, Nzika did a wonderful job with showing the huge diversity that exists in how law and healthcare can come together, whether it's looking at working with our clinical faculty to come in and take on how do we address them and, uh, you know, what we believe are intractable problems that have existed before in policy landscape, maybe proposing new regulations that exist on air quality, water quality, different types of illness that we may be able to mitigate, or even, you know, huge society societal issues like redlining, zoning, things that we are able to, to, to denote. And then you have things like the, being able to be here and talk about immigration status or others that would be able to have a local independent clinic for patients to seek help because, you know, you would be, I think we would all be surprised how quickly law and healthcare come together when you're seeking healthcare for certain things. And most recently as Unfortunately, politics has, has entered into the healthcare landscape. It is important to be able to have and know your legal rights for what you can have. And so from the individual patient perspective level to working with our clinicians, to whether it's working in clinical research to make sure that we can regain trust and ability and transparency as we go into further testing or ensuring that we have equity and access in a full spectrum of lens. I think that there is a blank canvas of opportunity 
opportunity between healthcare and law to work together at the micro level, at the policy level, and at the national level. And I think we're here to just say the partnership is here. We want to be able to partner. Come on over. We're eager to create those law clinics and programs and opportunities for rising leaders of the future to get started working with us today. Uh, yeah, and I would just I would just add, you know, there's a lot of concrete things that we are trying to work on right now at CDPH. So, you know, number one, um, if folks on this call are not familiar with the concept of health in all policies, um, this is something that we are pushing extremely hard at CDPH and getting some actually very good traction on as our profile has risen with COVID. It's this idea that as you are passing policies, uh, uh, not just at the health department, but across the whole city of Chicago, you are are considering health and in fact we're we what the the terminology we're actually using right now is doing these health and racial impact assessments herias and um really thinking about uh how do you put, put a health lens on everything that the city is doing? Um, and there is a ton happening there. We'd love to have help on it. People who are interested in projects, et cetera. Um, it ranges from everything from the food things to the zoning work to the environmental work. Um, uh, and that's one thing. And just the other, you've heard me say it a couple of times, but um, really trying to work on this, this data sharing piece, I think is a, if anybody's got interest in like informatics, um, how at the, the, the federal level, the state level, the county, the city, um, how we keep patient privacy and yet make sure we're able to see patterns within of diseases in populations that allow us to um, actually respond and do that in much more real time. I think it's a major growth area. And if anybody's got interest in that sort of IT informatics law health intersection, um, it's, a, it's another space we're really growing. Like I said, we're starting a little law department of our own here. And so we certainly will be interested in um, partnering projects, interns, et cetera. But regardless of whether you work directly with us, please stay interested in health policy um, and law because uh, it's a huge need, and I think it's such an exciting area for partnership. Yeah, no, that, that's great, and, and that's a great way to close. Uh, I guess the last thing I will say, sort of as I've gotten to know the law school over the last year or so, um, right, they're, they're, their location is just amazing, right? They're right across the street from the Chicago Department of Public Health. They're uh, you're around the corner from IDPH and, and Cook County as well. So I, I do think also for the students and others who wanna collaborate, just that geography really matters. And then, you know, just as we're thinking about the data piece as well, right? I, I think one of the things that we've learned with COVID is, you know, I like to say all public health is local, all data is local, and the more and more local you can get into this, this informatics um, topic that Allison, you brought up, I think is really important and really making sure our data is as timely as possible um, is vital as well. So I just want to thank everyone. This has been an amazing panel. You all, I just, you know, you all, I want to thank you again for your leadership, for keeping all of us safe. It's just been fantastic. Uh, and thanks for the panel. And uh, I'll turn things back over to you, Amy. Thank you so much, Dean Giles. And I, you know, my, I'm tired having like tried to keep track of everything that was being said, but I did catch that Dr. Arwadi enjoyed a public health law class. So when we're looking for, you know, I'm like, maybe I'll want to be faculty, uh, but, but uh, no, it's really, it was so energizing. Um, the, all that you've done, we are so appreciative, uh, you know, all of us and um, excited to collaborate and think about how we can help going forward. Cause we have a lot of amazing faculty and students across, you know, not just at the law school, but across who would love to engage and, and partner in this work. So thank you all of you for such an amazing session. You know, we this is really the meat of, of this, you know, the context of our symposium, thinking about law and policy and the role of it in creating health equity. Leading up to now, you're probably like we're trying to figure out, you know, why were we hearing from all these health people, but it was important to situate this work in a context and to understand the policy context, sort of the community voices context and the health system context for what we're doing. And it was also important to sort of define or at least begin to define our terms. We're gonna hear more of that uh, in the work that we're gonna discuss now. But I thought, for instance, Dr. Braveman's slide when she mentioned that law and policy is, is you know, 
has been implicit in creating um, some of the inequities. And so it's its role to actually address uh, these inequities. And so that's what we're gonna try to think creatively through for the next um, hour plus uh, together um, to think about that role of law and policy. Um, and just to remind you um, that again, to use the chat feature to ask questions and we'll have time um, later on to, to um, answer those. But we're gonna start up front uh, with individual kind of every person's going to have a little bit of time to offer their expertise and insight um, in thinking about sort of how law and policy is being used or could be used to advance health equity um, what what you know sort of efforts might or impediments might exist um, in that work and we're going to start first with the pandemic context and with that I'm, I'm going to have my co great colleague Seema talk about uh, the interesting research that she's been doing around um, racial inequity and health justice. Great. Thank you so much for having me here today. I'm excited to be part of this conversation. Um, and it's been a great, um, it's a great panel. So in a few minutes, I just wanted to provide an overview of some of the work that um, Professor Rakaya Yerby and I have been doing about uh, structural issues that have been causing COVID-19 disparities in death, infection, hospitalization, and even vaccination. And so you know, not everybody is impacted by COVID-19 the same. You know, we've we've seen throughout the pandemic that Black, Indigenous, Latino populations have had disproportionate infection rates, hospitalization rates, and death rates. And, you know, even with limited data, we're seeing that. And I say limited data because we don't collect this data in a systematic way. And every county, every state collects it in different ways if they collect it at all. But we've seen this countrywide Lately, the gap has closed a bit, but over the whole course of the COVID-19 pandemic, when we had analyses of federal, state, and local data, we've seen that people of color have experienced a disproportionate burden of cases and deaths. Particularly large disparities exist um, when we're talking about Black and Indigenous people, and in cases among um, Latino people compared to their white counterparts. And so when we have age standardized data, we see that uh, Latino, Black, and Indigenous populations are at least twice as likely to die from COVID-19 and their white counterparts, and that Latino and Indigenous populations are nearly two times as likely greater risk of COVID-19 infection than white people. And then there's large disparities in COVID-19 hospitalizations for all of these populations, for Indigenous, Black, and Latino populations. Now, these minorities are not being disproportionately uh, affected by COVID-19, not due to any kind of biological differences between races, which don't exist, uh, but rather as a result of social factors. And I know we've talked about this uh, throughout the day, but they're because of primarily historical and current practices of discrimination. And so at the same time that because of the infectious nature of COVID-19 that we have kind of seen how we're all interconnected regardless of class, race, um, immigration status, what have you. The, the reality is that the ability to shelter at home, the ability to socially distance, the ability to seek medical care, including testing and treatment and vaccination, and the ability to recover from the virus are very considerably due to structural discrimination. So, and what I mean by that, um, you know, as a definition is the way that laws and policies are used to limit equal access to resources such as safe housing, quality health care and high wage jobs. And so prior to the pandemic, we had racial and ethnic minority groups, especially women of color, disproportionately suffering from poor health outcomes due to structural discrimination. And as a result of these inequities, these groups were more susceptible to contracting and dying from COVID-19 compared to their white counterparts. And so if we're really serious about addressing the problems that have arisen from this pandemic, lawmakers have to act to break down these root causes of structural discrimination and um, Professor Yerby and I have been working in the areas of housing, healthcare, and employment, um, and you know, talking about how those sectors, particularly, uh, we've been focusing on on them and the laws related to them, how they they can be structured to protect 
um, minorities from harm and prov provide much needed support. But there's other structures too that we haven't necessarily focused on that also relate education, for example. But let me just kind of in briefly talk about you know, the areas that we focused on. So due to structural discrimination in housing, racial minorities are more often living in substandard housing. Um, according to the CDC, people of color are more likely to live in densely packed areas and in multi-generational housing situations. So that creates a higher risk for spread of highly contagious diseases like COVID-19. So living in crowded living conditions and apartments where one is forced to interact with others in an elevator or what have you, may makes it even more difficult to avoid uh, spreading to disease. And then, you know, we have, of course, have to worry about paying rent. <clears throat> you know, we have had some efforts with the CDC with the ev eviction moratorium. Um, but, you know, it, we just have to also just kind of think about the hierarchy of needs. Are people going to get tested or worry about COVID-19 if they're worried about a roof over their head, right? We need to think of public health as caretakers and Earlier in an earlier session, when we heard from the commissioner of public health in Chicago talking about contact tracing, you know, if the contact tracers that, for example, Chicago's hired are going to be effective, we need solutions to these kind of root cause issues. You know, whether it's hotels that are going to be paid for for people to be able to, you know, actually isolate, um, child care covered, rent, food covered, and, and you know, we need to think about this through a lens of an ethic of care, and, and that's what that uh, requires, right? Um, and, you know, there's very serious issues with structural discrimination that limit access to quality health care for racial and ethnic minorities at normal times, but even now, more, during, more now during this pandemic. And so things to think about are, you know, the closure of many health care facilities and high minority populations. Um, and so in terms of when, when the pandemic began, where were the testing sites? Where were they located? Where were the hospitals for treatment? Where are the places where people can go for vaccinations? Now, some cities have done a good job of actually coming to those populations, but even when they've had that effort, after three months, it's kind of shuttered. And we need to think about long-term how we're going to build, build this trust and it's kind of um, in a community that has already had poor experiences um, in with the healthcare system. And so, you know, structural discrimination also prevents some racial minorities from even accessing most healthcare services, like such as undocumented immigrants, most of whom are racial and ethnic minorities. They don't even have access to be able to purchase insurance through, for example, the exchanges and the Affordable Care Act. And, you know, we've had a history under the last administration of punitive immigration policies. And, you know, unfortunately there hasn't been as much change as we thought um, in this administration. And so, you know, when we think about undocumented immigrants, uh, they might be more likely to uh, avoid seeking care even when they exhibit symptoms of COVID-19. And so such lack of access is directly responsible for poor health outcomes and spread of the disease. And then we, we know that, for example, Black Americans have been subject to bias and poor treatment by healthcare providers. And so throughout the pandemic, especially in the beginning, we had a lot of uh, reports of people who see, are seeking testing being turned away because their symptoms were not deemed to be serious enough. Um, and when we think about the fact that Black Americans' health complaints are often dismissed and not believed, there's reason to be concerned uh, about access to COVID-19 related care, even when they are able to see a healthcare provider. And there's a documented lack of Black American, Indigenous, and Latino physicians in the United States, and that contributes to limited access to quality, culturally sensitive care. And, you know, when we're, we're thinking about, like, things like public health efforts, like contact tracing, in order for contact tracers to be trusted, we need people from the community as well. We need people that, you know, in, from the community to build trust to speak the language of the community, right? Um, and then I'll just briefly just talk about working conditions, um, which my colleague maybe, Rakai, Yeah, maybe about one minute and then we'll start to pivot. We'll bring back for the- Well, bulk. I can also, if you want, I can save that because that that's, um, I can save that and I'll, I'm happy to, you know, go in. So I don't want to, I want to give everyone a chance. Yes, pit a pit on that. We're going to come back to that because we're going to start to engage on reflections from each other. Um, but I do want to um, allow uh, sort of step back for a broader perspective because that's such important data and, and sort of research that you've been doing that situates 
um, you know, the inequities that have been, that have always existed, right, but that have been even further highlighted during the pandemic. Um, step back from that from a broader perspective and um, shift to Sarah. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Um, and I think Seema really was able to kind of um, set me up really nicely. So if, um, Natalie, if you can put up the slides, that would be great. Um, so I first want to just thank you all so much for inviting Change Lab and myself to share a little bit about our work and our perspectives today. Next slide, please. Um, my name is Sarah Degia, and I'm the CEO of Change Lab Solutions. And for those of you who are not familiar with Change Lab, if you can go back just one slide, that would be great. Um, we are a national nonpartisan nonprofit organization that uses the tools of law and policy to advance health equity. We have an interdisciplinary team of lawyers, planners, analysts, and other professionals that work with community organizations, governments, and anchor institutions across the nation to help develop and implement equitable policy policy solutions. Our focus is on demystifying law and policy because these are very powerful tools that can help to undo the historical harms that we're talking about today, but they can also affect a broader group of people and they really have a chance to engage change makers. Next slide, please. So as been teed up, um, health inequities are deeply entrenched in our society and they were growing before the pandemic hit, but I think COVID really helped to elevate just how much these inequities are affecting a certain population or certain groups of people, including um, Black, Indigenous, Latinx, Asian Pacific Islanders, um, LGBT communities and others. Um, and so we know as an organization, we've been really looking at a different perspective to help improve health and the need for all of us to start looking at the systems. Um, it's, it's, it is important to address the, the individual kind of levers, but I think we need to step back a little bit and look at the much bigger systems because those are the systems that really um, set up the resource distribution um, and they have, they, they really um, determine the ways in which our um, communities are shaped the social environments in which our communities live in. So we use these five drivers of fundamental inequities. Um, we consider these to be the forces that really create disparities. And we name them as structural discrimination and racism, income inequality and poverty, disparities and opportunity, disparities in political power and governance that limits meaningful participation. And for us, these are the these are an important way to talk about these drivers because this is how many individuals and communities experience and understand their life circumstances. And I wanna note that they're not distinct phenomenon, but they often overlap and they influence and create those systemic challenges. Next slide, please. So we're all here because we're talking about law and policy and we at Change Lab deeply believe that one of the most powerful risk factors for poor health are the laws and policies that have perpetuated discrimination, racism and segregation. And while they have contributed to, the, to today's disparities, they are also very powerful tools that can help to create positive change. So today I wanna to touch upon two legal frameworks that Change Lab has been looking at. And these frameworks really intersect um, or they, they kind of bring together the intersection of public health, equity and the law. And the two drivers that I think they really um, speak to in the five fundamental drivers are structural racism and discrimination and governance that limits meaningful participation. Next slide, please. So one of the pieces, um, one of the legal frameworks that we've really been delving into at Change Lab Solutions is equitable enforcement of public health laws. And there's been no greater time than the COVID pandemic to really lift up the importance of public health enforcement. Um, and we know that enforcement actions that are taken in the name of public health can actually discriminate against and harm or otherwise undermine health. Um, and we know that when enforcement is carried out inequitably, it can also exacerbate or maintain health inequities. So when we talk about inequitable enforcement, we're looking at two separate concepts. One is over enforcement and the other is under enforcement. And Seema talked a little bit about this in particular as we think about housing, uh, the under enforcement of housing laws and policies. It's a good example because 
these are laws that are there to actually protect um, the, the health of people that are living in um, public housing or other housing conditions. But often we find that these are the laws that are under enforced, oftentimes because people have to file a complaint in order to trigger an investigation. And there's many other reasons why this tends to be a force of um, under enforcement. We think about over enforcement and that's when laws are enforced more frequently or strictly in certain places or against certain people. And again, we saw evidence of this in COVID-19 where certain communities were targeted around social distancing measures or um, different types of curfews. But we know we've actually seen the data that shows that over enforcement can also directly impact people's health um, and actually lead to harming people's health. These two concepts also often work together to further undermine health. So you see certain communities where they are, there's over enforcement and also the same communities are often victims of under enforcement of public health laws. Um, so these are concepts that we're really thinking about um, at Change Lab, doing some research around to really understand how can we utilize enforcement in a more equitable way that's actually getting to the goal of protecting public health. Next slide, please. So the next concept I wanna talk about, which Amy mentioned a little bit is preemption. Um, and of course, preemption refers to when a higher level of government or a jurisdiction limits or eliminates the power of a lower level of government. And I wanna name that preemption is not a good thing or a bad thing. But what we have seen recently is that preemption has been used at the local level to stifle equitable and local solutions, such as expanding the minimum wage or paid sick leave or even broadband access. We are seeing, um, this also um, preemption was used during the pandemic where some states used it to regulate or prevent local mask mandates or other social distancing measures. But the thing I want to elevate here today is that there are efforts across the nation to actually limit the authority of local public health authorities across the nation. So looking at stripping local, um, local boards of health of their authority, requiring them to go to the state regulators. Um, so this is a phenomenon that we're seeing across the nation. So, but I do want to note a high point, which is that we just won a ruling in California um, that took away a very nasty provision that would allow um, cities and counties to try to challenge um, the use of local sugary drink taxes. So that is a, a victory or in the name of preemption. Um, and we are coordinating with local public health or public health experts across the nation to track, analyze, and create tools for local public health officials to try to defend or stave off some of these attacks at the local level. So the next slide is really just um, a a resource tool um, keep in contact with us we'd love to hear your ideas and i look forward to having more of a conversation with you all today thank you thanks sarah thanks that's such a great sort of um kind of grounding in a lot of the work and, and now as we think a little more about the tools that exist and sort of more clarity on the the, the um, terms that we use i'll turn it over to sydney so it's a pleasure to be here today and a pleasure to, to follow both uh, Professor Mohapatra and Sarah because my work builds on their work and I really appreciate this community we are in where our work informs each other. Uh, I like SEMA am working with Rakaya Yerby in my case on a project to examine how local governments, meaning cities and counties, are using racial equity tools to address systemic racism and improve the social determinants of health. Um, we've been talking a lot, you've been talking a lot today about what the social determinants of health are, how where we live, work, play, and pray impacts our health, how education and housing and employment, other factors play a key role in how healthy or unhealthy we as individuals and we as communities are. I want to take a few moments, though, to define an umbrella term, systemic racism. Uh, systemic racism identifies that there's a complex array of social services, social structures rather, government policies, institutional practices, and interpersonal interactions used by the dominant racial group, first to create a hierarchy that categorizes people into races. Race is not biological, it's socially constructed, and then using race as the basis for disempowering, devaluing, and differentially allocating societal resources to other, being the 
dominant racial group. And as you've talked about today, systemic racism operates on multiple levels, all of which implicate law. Structural racism is the way law is used to structure systems, whether it's education, employment, housing, health care, and it's laws that, again, advantage the majority and disadvantage racial and ethnic minorities. Institutional racism typically operates through race-neutral institutional practices and policies that in their impact reinforce this racial hierarchy and impose substantial harms. And interpersonal racism operates through inter individual interactions where a person's conscious and unconscious racial prejudice limits equal access to resources despite anti-discrimination laws. And I know during today, you've talked about many examples of how systemic racism impacts the social determinants of health. Let me just give a couple of examples uh, here because sometimes we forget how complicated this interaction here is and how important the history of law and policy is. So uh, Seema talked about uh, employment. You know, employment and structural racism is illustrated by all those Jim Crow laws that expanded collective bargaining for unions at the same time as it allowed unions to continue to either explicitly exclude people of color or to dem discriminate based upon race. This historical disproportionate exclusion means that minority workers are less likely to have paid sick leave, forcing them to go to work even when they're sick, a problem that's contributed to racial disparities in COVID-19 infections and death. In education, we know that local laws where we fund our school systems through local property taxes uh, disproportionately impacts communities of color, but is also informed by historical policies at the federal level that allowed redlining of, of minority neighborhoods and the depressed home prices and property values in minority uh, areas. In housing, I can do the same thing. Local laws, we see uh, local zoning laws that are neutral on their face. They encourage single family homes, the historic American way, but those race neutral zoning laws also reduce affordable housing and disproportionately shut out minority residents. And I think in this conference today, what you want us to start talking about is how do we begin impacting and changing these laws. And that's where I want to introduce to you a concept called racial equity tools. They're designed to integrate and op operationalize intentional consideration of racial equity into government decision making, including law, policy, practices, and budget. They offer a means by which policymakers uh, can engage communities and normalize conversations about race, operationalize new behaviors and policies, and organize to achieve racial equity. Racial equity tools can be used to evaluate existing laws and policies and identify harmful impacts. They can also be used to evaluate proposed and innovative approaches to see if they reduce racial inequities, improve health equity, improve racial justice. Two national organizations have racial equity tools designed specifically by use by local governments, by cities and counties. Uh, one was created by GARE, the Government Alliance on Race and Equity. It's called the Racial Equity Impact Assessment. The other was developed by PolicyLink. It's called the Racial Equity Framework. And I want to share with you today that Professor Yerby and I have just completed a research project examining how a pioneering group of 107 cities and counties across the country are using these two racial equity tools to address both systemic racism and improve social determinants of health. This project was funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Policies and Action Program, 
Our report will be released on November 1. I'm going to put my email in the chat if you want to get on our mailing list to make sure you get it. Please do. Let me conclude with just a few of the high points, and I invite you to ask me some questions during our conversation. One, we have identified this diverse group of cities and counties. It's 107 across the country, every region of the state. It is not an East Coast, West Coast, or big city phenomenon. There are tiny cities working on this, large cities, including Chicago, Cook County, and Peoria in Illinois. And among those many and diverse cities, many are using these racial equity tools to prioritize law and change to address systemic racism and the social determinants of health. I can share with you during our conversation some of the le legal mapping we've done to identify four evidence-based policies that both improve health and address structural racism. I can share with you some of the interviews we've done with these cities of counties showing how they've used these racial equity tools to directly influence change at the local level and talk more about what local governments can do. The, uh, Optimistic part of me shares with you that this research, we begin to understand how jurisdictions are working with GARE and Policy Link to use racial equity tools to address systemic racism. Racial equity isn't going to happen overnight, but we believe that this research helps identify one promising tool that communities can use. Thank you. I look forward to talking more with you. Thank you so much. I know we're gonna have a very rich conversation and, and I think we already are amongst ourselves generating some questions and some, some interest in dialogue, um, but we'll just do a few more reflections and, and then we'll, we'll certainly dive in. Um, now that we've heard some broad sort of tools and, and perspectives, we can start to look at also some examples um, and at a state level and, and um, Bria, I thought I'd turn to you for that. Um, sure, thank you so much. So I'm like thrilled to be with this group of incredibly uh, exciting and innovative folks. I harass Rakaya and Sydney all the time, like, when is it done? When is it done? And I can't wait for their research. It's, this is such important research they're doing. I'm so thankful for them for doing it. Um, so I wanted to talk about um, uh, the affected communities, the people who have been uh, harmed by structural discrimination. Um, the ones bearing the greatest burden of COVID, other pandemics, other kind of health threats, public health threats, uh, just daily discrimination. I wanna talk about those communities as leaders. Um, I wanna talk about the strength that resides in those communities as the folks who have to help us get out of this <laughs> um, and deserve the voice and respect to tell us what they need, the best way to deliver it to them, how they're being harmed and how they can be made stronger, what resources they need. So I'm gonna just give a few examples of where we see communities um, that have been harmed also serving in this leadership role, uh, either leaders outside of government or outside of the provider system, um, but often in partnership with policy groups, policy experts, lawyers, um, but also sometimes in partnership with providers, healthcare providers who we tend to think about oftentimes being resistant um, to issues of discrimination, being resistant to acknowledging them. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about three examples. One is called the Sacred Birth Study uh, for Black Mothers by Black Mothers. Another example uh, I'm gonna refer to as the use of racial impact statements uh, and legal shaming. And then the third is a, a centering equity in health delivery and payment reform guide developed outside of state, but for policymakers. Um, the sacred birth study is uh, primarily led by a researcher, a physician, somebody who had 20 years experience as a community-based obstetrician and gynecologist and self-proclaimed reproductive justice avenger. Um, the thing that's so important about the sacred birth study is it is research to develop a tool for quality measurement and improvement in maternal health for black women specifically. It is intentionally and affirmatively anti-racist 
And it tries to disrupt other forms of subordination that have marginalized and shaped Black women's experience in birthing and healthcare. So it is involving the community as partners in this, both in process and substance. So what I mean by that is um, the Black mothers were playing a role from the research design stage and then gathering additional information about what matters to women in terms of what defines good quality. Um, it, it's, and there were, this was also done with Black-led community partners like California Black Women's Health Project. But the researcher leading this was out of UCF, uh, UCSF. Um, the tool that they developed also centered patients' lived experiences in developing the measures for quality. Like what does good quality look like in maternal health? Um, so it not only used a theoretical framework that looked at the experiences of black women in terms of reproductive injustice and more specifically obstetric racism to try to help think through what questions should we even be asking, but then it gathered black women's specific experiences to help refine and keep telling them kind of what other questions to ask, how to refine these questions. And these were women from all over, not just focused on California. They developed a quality measure, uh, measurement improvement tool um, that is called SACRED. It's, it's, it's uh, based on, that's uh, the acronym, based on measures in safety, autonomy, communication and information exchange, racism and empathy um, and dignity, sorry. Um, one of the just things I want to highlight really quickly about this example is um, it's very different from the typical clinical measures of quality that we're used to. So if there's a kind of an un uncomplicated birth, uh, um, good birth outcome, that's considered a success by kind of clinical measures by the healthcare system. That doesn't tell us what was experienced by the woman throughout that made that more difficult for her, that made her fearful to go back that created additional stress during that time. Um, so that's one of the ways in which it really kind of helps to, to um, add to those experiences. Oops, sorry, sorry, <laughs> to add to those experiences. Um, another example is the racial impact statements, the way they're used. So Sydney referred to them. Um, they're gaining a lot more attention now, but they were starting to get used even pre-COVID. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of, um, uh, to, uh, point people's attention to a 2013 article um, written by folks from the Legal Services of Northern California, work done out of their racial equity project. Um, they have a whole host of examples that they use, but they were able to use racial impact statements um, to determine that Medicaid fee-for-service beneficiaries were not getting, uh, uh, racial minorities were not getting the same amount and level of psychiatric services as white um, members, Medicaid members. They use this, the legal theory was that once you're presenting this information to a government, um, they can't, they can no longer say that they're not aware of the racial harm. And if they continue to do nothing in the face of it, the theory is you can use that to try to show some evidence of pretext, possible discrimination, since that's what's required under Title VI. The reality though, is that it actually acts as a legal shaming. So whether or not that could be successful in court, they said they didn't end up having to litigate the course, the, the cases that they brought with these very clear, detailed racial impact statements because it essentially shamed policymakers into fixing the problem. Uh, the one thing I wanna highlight about this that they highlight is that these are community-based development tools as well. So these are legal services organizations facilitating communities developing these statements. The communities help develop the narrative, historical parts of the statement. Um, legal services can uh, engage academics for the harder data, that kind of statistics. They know where to get that data. And it is a partnership where they are bringing these and facilitating change. The last thing, and I, we can talk more about any of these later, I just wanted to highlight the Centering Equity in Health Delivery and Payment Reform Guide. That's a guide um, that was developed by the California Pan-Ethnic Health Network based on focus groups with patients, different diverse community groups. They then surveyed best practices. They brought in policy experts, other folks. It was a very facilitative bottom up um, partnership to develop recommendations that they're producing. And they say, California here, <laughs> right? You keep saying equity matters. We're gonna tell you what it looks like 
in quality payment, and how you engage patients in appropriate care, in health plan oversight, social determinants of health, and very specific what kind of care we need. I mean, this is a, this is a comprehensive policy recommendation for the policymakers developed in, in large part from community input and in, in that recommendation. Thank you. It's so interesting, and it's interesting to see things happening at such a local level. And and you know, we we had community voices earlier, and I'm especially appreciative of you saying we have to think about the strength of communities and and be incorporating that into the policies we develop. Um, I just you know, we have two more, that, and then we're definitely going to pivot to some communication um, uh, and and conversation with us. But um, also some more examples at a national level. I wanted to um, hand it over to Juliet. Hi there, welcome and, and greetings to everyone. Uh, in terms of health equity, I'm, I'm looking at a really, really good colleague, uh, Mara Udelman, uh, who is like virtually right here in Washington, DC. And I think in some regards, we're kind of tag teaming here in terms of the national level perspective. Um, let's see, I actually thought Mara might be speaking before me, uh, but I can tap dance here. Um, in terms of health equity and the tools that are in our toolbox, if I can frame uh, just a few of my remarks in that fashion, I do want to share, uh, number one, thank you, University of Illinois and our wonderful speakers that have already shared the, their insights. Um, at a really high level and briefly, uh, there's so much activity happening. Um, with regard to health, uh, health equity, both from the White House Biden Harris administration um, and the leaders that we see at uh, Health and Human Services, for example. I know some of our speakers have already talked about enforcement, compliance, community engagement, social determinants of health. And so I think if there are two buckets, I do want to highlight. We have so many new opportunities right here, right now, in, in large response to local and state level, community level, uh, community leaders are, that are speaking forward. But if I can uh, attempt to uh, highlight, I think, some promising practices in terms of effectuating advocacy for health equity. I just want to highlight and remind ourselves, uh, we, which we all know, that always, whether it's the federal level, the state level, the local level, um, and I think local and state is probably more important than federal, is that we really, really need to think about the executive branch, the le legislative branch, and the uh, judiciary branch, where we see a lot of litigation. Um, in terms of health equity, um, I think Mara may be highlighting this a little bit more. So I'm going to be uh, intentionally a little bit brief on this, front, uh, on this front. When it comes to the executive branch, right, this at the federal national level, this is the White House. And then it is the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and some of the tools, the policy tools in the White House's toolbox include executive orders. That does not always comport with legislative efforts out of the US Congress. That said, for uh, the White House, we have for a long standing fashion, over two decades, we've had the executive order 13166 that during the Clinton administration really addressed the barriers and obstacles that immigrant communities in, in, in lay terms, uh, but those who are limited English proficient, uh, the federal government created an opportunity to create a forum to really, really address how do we include communities who are limited English proficient in terms of accessing care uh, and public services, whether that's healthcare or other public benefits. I think here now in 2021, when we think about the diversity, vibrancy, and the unmet needs of immigrant communities, um, I will always advocate 
uh, on behalf of the Health Forum that the Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander communities we face and can contribute so much resiliency and vibrancy, but also face a lot of uh, obstacles when it comes to language access. But that said, I wanna be really, really crystal clear. The issue of language access is so important for all of our immigrant communities, including black immigrant communities and Latino immigrant communities. Number two, in terms of legislative advocacy um, and efforts to uplift our communities, um, when it comes to health equity, I do want to highlight and underscore for this audience today, virtually, um, and just in case there's like, you know, a written record here, is uh, the White House started out in January and I want to say January 20, the first day of this administration, an executive order on racial equity. And for all of us who are tuning in today, if you haven't had a chance to review that executive order, please do. If you already have, I would invite you to renew and review that executive order and think about how can we apply some of these federal executive orders to the state level and to the local level. All of you are leaders um, and what you do day in, day out as advocates for all of our communities. I think it's really, really important to understand what is the federal national landscape and in, in your state, in your community, in your jurisdiction, can you parrot copy paste, if you will, a federal executive order. And this is the first time we've had a national federal executive order issued by the White House and the president on racial equity on day one. Um, this is outside of like partisan politics conversations, but it's good for all of us to stay grounded in what is that framework? And are there elements wholesale or in part to apply and adopt at the state and local level. I'm a firm believer that innovation happens at the local government municipality level, and then it rolls up to the state level, but it must absolutely include, invite firsthand, not secondhand, our community leaders. Um, I think a couple of additional um, illustrations, if I can just spotlight in terms of where federal conversations, national conversations, which get uplifted by local and state advocates, family advocates, community advocates, uh, academicians, um, our colleagues in the private sector. I, I do want to spotlight you know, we're talking about health equity, particularly in the context of COVID. Um, and I'm going to draw from some experiences of, of, of course, absolutely, as a country is uh, experiencing racial reckoning uh, over the last 12, 18, and I hope many, many more months. Um, from what I do to handy out on behalf of the Health Forum, uh, we have also seen an incredible modern chapter of anti-Asian violence. Um, but to, to play it forward with community dialogue, with elected officials locally at the state and federal national level, we can see uh, inroads and uh, inroads being made where even we can collectively influence Congress because earlier this year, Congress did pass um, an anti-Asian violence uh, law uh, that you know, received bipartisan support. So uh, I, I'm so grateful to be connected with all of you um, and having this conversation in terms of the tools that we have in our toolbox when it comes to policy advocacy from the executive, legislative, and judiciary branches. Uh, and I am my dear, dear friend and colleague and mentor, 
Uh, Mara, I am so looking forward to what Mara has to share with us today. Thank you. Well, great transition because now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mara for um, even, you know, though we've really been looking at sort of a, a local kind of community focus throughout the day, as we know so much is, depends on what's happening at the federal level. So Mara, with that, I'll turn it to you. Great, thank you. And thank you, Juliet, for teeing up. Um, I'm really happy to be here. And I think I'm going to add um, another tool in the toolbox, both talking at the federal level and then how the local and the state um, work feeds into some of the, the federal work that we do. So I do work um, inside the Beltway in DC. Um, and I've been at the National Health Law Program about 20 years working on a range of healthcare access as well as civil rights issues. Um, the tool I want to talk about are federal civil rights laws. Um, we have a number of federal civil rights laws that often are unknown and underutilized. And I think it's really important to add those to our toolbox when we're talking about health equity. We have to address structural racism, as lots of other folks have already talked about, so I'm not going to sort of reiterate. And we have some tools that we can currently use in addition to what everyone else has said. So federal civil rights laws require or prohibit discrimination on the basis of race, ethnicity, language, immigration status, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender identity, disability, and age. Um, and really for the first time in the Affordable Care Act, we got one provision that recognizes all these types of discrimination can happen and the intersectionality of all of them. Because oftentimes it's hard to delineate, are you facing discrimination because of your race or your gender or your language or all of them and how that all interplays. And so we really need to be thinking about that. And when we're looking at what's happening in our institutions in the community, whether it's state health agencies or a community clinic or a hospital, um, these civil rights laws apply to virtually any entity that takes federal funds. And almost, particularly in the healthcare arena, almost all healthcare providers are taking some form of federal funds. And so we have these tools that we can use. The limitation, as I said, is that lots of individuals don't know their rights. And lots of healthcare providers don't know their responsibilities. So what can we do in addition to all these other tools we've been talking about of identifying where the problems are, um, collecting better data, because if we don't have data, how can we show and identify where health disparities and inequity happen, where structural racism is happening? So one of the ways that we want to help use these, um, the federal laws at the local level is to leverage them, like folks have been saying already, is how do we lift up the voices of the communities to identify what is happening, to identify where the gaps are, and also to seek redress when we're not getting the resolutions that we need working through policy, strategic, or other means. Um, so some of this, again, is, you know, first steps is, is data. What data is being collected in the entities you're looking at? What data should be collected? Data is really this foundation. And then how do we do the outreach and the education to help people understand how they can make their voices heard? What are their rights? It can be as simple, not as simple, but, you know, letting people know they have a right to an interpreter in healthcare. Many people don't know that. They're coming from um, healthcare uh, entities in other countries where you know, most of them were private. They didn't even have public health insurance. They didn't know that they could ask for an interpreter. Letting people know their rights, having them exercise that can also help change the policies of some of these healthcare institutions who all of a sudden have to respond to more people asking. Um, and then when change is not coming at the pace that we need, we do have an opportunity to file either administrative complaints or um, lawsuits in courts. And so I'm gonna talk about one example um, that the National Health Law Program filed recently. We did an administrative complaint um, alleging discrimination against limited English proficient individuals by states and localities with regard to COVID testing and vaccinations. So we heard earlier on about all of the huge disparities we've seen throughout COVID that people of color, limited English proficient individuals have been disproportionately affected by this pandemic. And even though the data isn't as good as we need it, it has certainly shown that there are huge inequities. And so um, when you look at language access, which is an area I've been focusing on, over 8% of the United States is limited English proficient or speaks English less than very well. And so what we did in our complaint is we gathered information from folks across the country. We put out an open call, a survey, online, we distributed as widely as we could, and we got information from individuals and organizations. Um, I think we have about 25 or 30 examples from different states listed. 
we found things like an over-reliance on the internet for communicating information, lack of translated information, lack of qualified interpreters at testing and vaccination sites, um, improper demands for social security numbers, lack of accurate information. Just as one example, um, Virginia used um, an automated translation software program to translate its English vaccination website into Spanish. And it was when it was first put up because no one reviewed that automated translation software, the Spanish website was actually telling people uh, in Spanish, you do not need a vaccination. It's a huge problem when we're in a public health pandemic. So um, what we did is we filed this complaint with the federal HHS Health and Human Services Office for Civil, for Civil Rights and also the Department of Homeland Security because of FEMA running many of the national test sites. And we're looking for systemic guidance to states and localities about a variety of issues, but in particular, trying to change the reliance on automated translation software. I'm not using any proprietary names, but you can ask in the, the question and answer um, because that's not gonna provide effective information. And so again, the Office for Civil Rights can be one more tool because they can investigate based on complaints that individuals file. The individual facing discrimination doesn't have to be the one to file. Providers can file, advocates can file, community groups can file, um, and the Office for Civil Rights must investigate. And the complaint resolution is another way to help bring broader attention, as we've heard other folks talk about, to these issues that can sometimes result in systemic change if you're looking at a broader event. So again, one more tool in the toolbox, in addition to trying, as Julia and I and others have done in DC, of trying to address these issues through federal laws and federal policies. But again, we need to use also um, those tools in our toolbox when we can proactively go out and try to address change in other ways. And so I will leave it at that. Thanks, there's so much now for us to sort of um, go through, but um, I guess the first thing that hit my mind, um, I'm pivoting a little bit, because I know I, I wanna be thoughtful about the time we have we have left and, and engage in some just conversation, but also picking up on um, our, our noon panel, Dr. Arwadi um, emphasized, who's the commissioner of the city of Chicago Health Department. Um, she emphasized data and you know the need for laws help and thinking about access and you know balancing with privacy interests and this tension between sort of individual rights and, and collective responsibility and several of you have mentioned today data and how if we're not asking the right questions and getting the information it makes it hard to have sort of meaningful should we say legal or sort of structural changes because we, we don't really know what context we're working in. So I just wonder if you have more thoughts or, or experiences um, using uh, data. Yes, and, and uh, Mara, I will start with you. So I just want to jump in because I do want to show progress. So when I started at the National Health Club Program 20 years ago, there was a myth that Title VI and federal civil rights laws prohibited collecting race, ethnicity, and language data. And we use the power of law to debunk that myth. Um, and it was the National Health Club Program and the Summit Health Institute for Research and Education did a huge amount of research, came out with a conclusion saying, no, Title VI actually supports data collection. We changed the tide on that, and that was huge. We still have a long way to go because unfortunately, not all of our systems and entities collect demographic data in the way that they can. And concerns about privacy are absolutely valid. We need to explain to people when we're asking for data, why we're asking it, how it's going to be used, and give people the option not to provide it. We often find when it's explained that more people wanna provide it, and actually more people of color in general are willing to provide it than white folks. Um, so I really think we need to be looking at explaining and providing those rationales and those explanations. We're not using it to discriminate. We're not using it to write unequal treatment. We need this data actually to help show that there isn't discrimination, or if there is, we're going to prohibit it. So I think there's a lot of education that can be done. We often say the gold standard is it should be required to ask for demographic data, but optional for individuals to provide. Um, can I? Yeah, anyone else want to jump in? Yeah, Brian and Sydney, yeah. Um, I would emphasize again the importance of uh, communities being involved in uh, even the design of data collection, um, them having co-ownership of that data, them being involved in how that data is uh, interpreted, disseminated, communicated. Um, so I love to listen to uh, the SIREN Social Intervention Research and Something Network. Um, incredibly smart researchers who care deeply about health disparities and how to address them. Um, and they had a number of uh, black researchers who were talking about the fact that they go into you know, black communities because they want to help and they want to do this research. 
and the people, and they just kind of assumed that there would be this, this trust and relationship. And the folks were like, what do you want it for? I, we give our data all the time. People come get our data. They never give it back to us. We don't know what they do with it. Um, we want to know, what do you want to do with it? And, and it was a real education for them. Um, they also learned when they were trying to prepare the report that the folks in the community were like, this is not giving us the information we want back like it, it, from the data, what you're interpreting, how we can use it. What's it. So I just want to emphasize the importance of communities in this process. Yeah, Sydney, yeah. And, and that's a perfect place for me to follow up because I think we've all talked about the need to have data. If we don't know what's happening, we can't address it. Um, and if communities aren't involved, we don't have the trust to get the information we need. I want to stress that with these racial equity tools, whether you call them a racial impact assessment or racial equity tools, they are founded on having this good data. And one of the things that both GAIR and PolicyLink have, have done with cities and counties is help them by providing a toolkit on how to involve communities in defining the information that's needed, how it should be stratified for that community, what information that community needs to begin a conversation to take positive steps forward. But in both, both of those toolkits really stress engaging the entire community and particularly engaging parts of the community that have been historically excluded. Uh, from these conversations. And that's a part of it, the trust building uh, that's at the center of moving us forward. I think if I could just add one, uh, one and a half additional comments here with regard to the conversation of disaggregated data. I think there is what, what I'm hearing both with the question and, and the responses here. Absolutely community engagement community engagement to provide the data, but to engage the community to understand why data is so critically important, especially in our American society at the local, state, and federal levels. Um, from a policy lens, I think what I wanna underscore is that if there are local or state governments that are interested, but still yet shy, to be more robust in their disaggregated data collection efforts, that is either an issue of number one, um, lack of education and understanding of what's permissible and not. Um, and so that actually should be, if, if, if there's a political leader and there's political will to do, do disaggregated data, you know what, the federal government at the federal national framework le level that's already been, uh, may I say, adjudicated. Um, there, the Office of Management and Budget has already created standards from the late 1990s. Um, and then even as more recently, fast forward through the Affordable Care Act, uh, for those of us who like to you know, read about different sections on the laws, there is section 4302 that does a whole heck of a lot better than OMB standards to drive and strive for disaggregated data. And HHS has been doing that for over 10 years. Um, I will share anecdotally from a narrative perspective, less than 30 states in our country, right? You look at federal policy and then state policy and, and check out where is everybody landing. Less than 30 states have committed to more robust collection of disaggregated data in the public health realm. So depending where you reside, someone who looks like me, depending what state I show up in, I will either show up and have the opportunity to respond as an Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander, or I will be like bucketed up, bucketed down, into the category of other. And again, in this friendly community, I would like to think that whether it's an AA and HPI community member, black immigrant, Latino immigrant, you know what? I think we count more than just being counted as other. 
Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And it sounds like, and, and what's interesting though, is it sounds like there's opportunity with education and using our tools wisely to sort of address that data point. I'm just wondering about, are there other sorts of best practices that we could be picking up on um, that might expand on some of the reflections you had earlier? Like, I don't know, Sydney, about the legal mapping or there are other, you know, I know we've mentioned toolkits, but are there other things we could be doing that are best practices, particularly at a local level that we might use that could help advance um, our equity goals? I'll jump in here. Um, I think that and this kind of is a, a, you know, continuing the last conversation, but I think, you know, it also goes to best practices. Uh, in terms, of, I, I love speaking with this group and it's kind of um, like preaching to the choir in terms of having, you know, community involvement. But I mean, in that is best practices of having the people that are gonna be impacted by the policies you're making at the table, right? Having them make those decisions. I think that is part of best practices. And I think every person here talked about it in some way. And, you know, the issue isn't a lack of trust, right? It's a lack of trustworthiness. We haven't really, the public health system hasn't really earned the trust of certain populations. And we need to have those populations represented um, in order to, to make sure that we are getting, you know, everyone talked about data. There, there's a whole history here where, you know, there, there's reasons for some of these communities to trust how the data is gonna be used. So having them involved, I think is really important because it's really e easy for well-meaning people, even, you know, people that are kind of committed to health equity, thinking that they know what, what certain communities need and want. Um, and I think having those voices at the table is a best practice. I just wanted to highlight, I, um, I put in the chat link, a, a link to a webinar series that we just completed this past year that actually kind of breaks down many of the issues that we talked about today. So employment laws, education as a particular focus, food systems, housing equity, um, you know, engaging community in planning efforts as we go forward. So I want to underscore, first of all, like data is essential. Um, that community engagement is essential. We learned a lot over this past year too, how community organizations showed up during um, the COVID crisis to actually fill in the gaps where government didn't um, meet the, these, the communities that we're talking about today. But this webinar series kind of, um, it goes a little bit deeper and it, it highlights some um, areas and places where people have been able to make meaningful change at this particular time frame and are really looking at how do you look at these um, challenges from a, a systemic level and engaging um, community and also building solutions that are um, geared towards addressing some of those structural inequities. Um, so I would just, you know, highlight that as a link um, at another time. Um, and then, and then we did do a report recently that looked specifically at how community-based organizations um, filled in the gaps in the COVID response. And it's really fascinating just to these challenges that like Mara was raising around data, you know, for the past 20 years. And yes, we've seen adjustments and changes, but it was still those same issues that like I've also been fighting for the last 20 years that just have gone kind of unheeded and that were really the crux of some of the problems um, that just got underscored in the COVID response. And so I think we know we know what we need to do. And, and I think of the folks in this room, um, there's a lot of tools out there and there's a lot of solutions out there. And I think it's, you know, it's time to, to really step up because we have an opportunity. Amy, I don't know if I can give you a, a check off best practice. That's what I've been sitting here kind of pondering. I think some of what our, our research uncovered, and we knew going in, um, we weren't sure that racial equity tools were going to be helpful. We were wondering if it was another quick fix. And I think what we found that was exciting as we surveyed and talked to these cities and counties is that they are being used as part of an ongoing process. And that is a process that involves engagement, engagement of policymakers with the community, thinking about the community, strategic planning, training, uh, changing internal small P policies, which can sometimes be an easier place to start, as well as uh, ordinances and laws. Um, evaluation and questioning. And one, I guess one thing we did find as an indicator of success is starting small, 
with the community. Um, but this really, we have been in this place, you know, for hundreds of years, and it's taken us hundreds of years to embed racism in our society. Um, and there are certainly important indicators and practices, but these are really processes of change, very complex change. And I, I think that's why we tend to very much focus on this language of systemic racism, because racism operates at so many levels and requires so many levels of change. And I don't wanna say that to be discouraging, uh, but it, it is a, uh, a road we are going down and it will take time. Um. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Amy, can I, and from when it's being used in terms of litigation from the outside, challenging, um, a couple of the things that were mentioned as really crucial uh, for the racial impact statement to be effective, um, at least from these, these attorneys' perspective, um, very clear data about harms that can be tied to the existing policy, number one. Number two, providing alternative solutions. Um, is key because what, what you want to do is create a situation where um, the government now has to explain why they're not doing the thing that would have the less discriminatory impact. Um, again, traditional civil rights law, that's, that's the thing we used to hope would be done in the courts. It wasn't, but we can do it in the court of public opinion. We can do it through administrative agencies and through state anti-discrimination suits in addition to federal anti-discrimination claims those policy solutions are not necessarily coming from the community. That's where you bring in the policy experts, right? So we're not trying to put on too much onto the communities that have been disadvantaged and harmed. It is this partnership that you wanna help kind of build up. I hate to have to start to wind down our conversation. I feel like I, you know, again, this is another panel where I did not, clearly this is like just, you know, we're just getting to the, the tip of sort of the iceberg on this whole thing. But I wondered, um, and I know you have so many thoughts, but if each of you could take one minute, just one minute, all right, but to think about like, what's a critical next step? If, if we want to think about how to either utilize the best practices or the great findings that we're having or some of the things that worked or, you know, try a new path or, or collect data, or whatever it might be, but what's a critical next step for us to think about as we try to most effectively use law and policy to advance health equity? And I'll go in reverse order. So I'll start with you, Mara, and go in reverse order if I had before. Gee, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I'll see what other people say. Um, never give up and never stop. You know, it, 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 it can be frustrating. Like I said, I haven't seen change in 20 years on some things, but I have. And so when we have those opportunities, we've got to seize them. When we don't achieve what we need, we've got to just get up, you know, fight another day and keep identifying all these leverages and involve everyone that we can from the communities that we're talking with to the advocates, to the lawyers, to the systems and fighting on because we, we, can't, we can't not do this. That wasn't very eloquent, but that's right. No, I love that. That's good. That is, that's motivation, right? Um, how about Juliet? Sure. Oh, it's so, it's so hard to follow Mara. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm just going to share this. Years and years ago, I, I actually had the opportunity to serve as uh, one of Mara's uh, 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 legal law clerks. Uh, so I am always going to tip my hat to Mara and the National Health Law Program. You know, what I would share is uh, community, and all the other speakers have already said this, and I think this is part of our DNA, community outreach and education, even if we did last week, we need to do it again and keep it up and bolster it. Number two, I think we need to collectively figure out a way, beat the drumbeat, create the drumbeat on community narrative for all of our communities and what their real experiences are day to day. So community narrative uh, is really, really important. And as a recovering lawyer in Washington, DC, I'm gonna say we, we need the advocates like the National Health Law Program and the other lawyers on this call to litigate. Um, at the end of the day, there are three branches of government, federal, national, locally, um, and we do need that litigation administratively or in the courts. 
Thank you. Thanks. Absolutely. Um, Bree. It takes a team-based approach to fix this. Lawyers with communities, with policy experts, with academics who can do the research. Um, it takes a team. Yeah, we have a, we have such a great team here. That's why I mean I think we we give each other support and energy, and I think it's it's a really great. I absolutely agree, uh, Sydney. Since this is a conference about local change, um, we have a toolkit of local laws that cities and counties can use that address systemic racism and improve social determinants of health. It's things like minimum wage laws, paid sick leave laws, inclusionary zoning laws, universal pre-K and dedicated tax funding for it. And you can find these laws in the blueprint from Change Lab at Living Cities at Robert Wood Johnson. Um, and not every local government can accomplish everything, but when you involve the community identifying possibilities, there are exciting possibilities for law. To That's great. That's great. And that's a great segue to you, Sarah, and, and the blueprint for change and, and things like that. So I will press one what Brie was going to say, because that, or less one what Brie said, because that's what I was going to say. And I'll add know the history. Um, so, like, go back and understand and look at, like, are you looking, coming from a city that had redlining? You know, what, what is sort of the local um, level of history as and laws? Um, because that can give you a grounding of how, what are the disparities and how they're affecting the disparities today to help you unravel and think about what are the solutions that are needed going forward. That's great. And, and Seema? Yeah, and I, I mean, I will echo what everyone said, but I would say, you know, being creative and I, I totally echo the fact that law itself is not going to get us to these solutions, especially, you know, in terms of some of our jurisprudence, the so-called colorblind constitution really hurts us in terms of being able to, you know, focus on certain communities. And so um, where I am in Dallas, we, you know, had an example where Dallas County, which has a huge history of redlining, is very segregated um, a place, they focused on the fact that they wanted to go to certain communities with vaccinations of the COVID-19. Well, the governor, you know, said that they weren't going to send any vaccines if they did it that way, if they, they um, focused on racial communities. Um, and, you know, there was creative solutions, which included, you know, the federal government and FEMA, and, you know, it was the right administration, but there are ways to get around some of these roadblocks. And I think we need to think about, it's not gonna only be a legal solution. We're gonna need to, you know, we're getting to a point where we understand that, you know, social determinants of health is part of health. And we need to make sure that we're putting, you know, as much focus in all of the other uh, determinants as well. That's really, you know, that's great. And all of these were such great thoughts and reflections and ideas and strategies. And I thank people for putting all the great resources uh, in the chat. Um, it was such an energizing session. Um, and I think we have lots of food for thought. And I'll just let um, the audience know that part of the reason I'm pushing on sort of these next steps is that we hope that this is not just a day of talk, but this can be a day of action. And we can think about how we can engage uh, in the Chicago community and similar communities to, to continue the great work that's already happening um, and to start new work based on some of what, these models that we're learning about. So I think it's a really exciting day. And I just wanna thank, th this is, these are, I, mean, I know Juliet mentioned M Mara. I mean, these are all people that I have, um, um, just loved the work that they've done. And so it's been a special treat for me to just sit here and listen to you and absorb it all. So hopefully, um, you know, you've enjoyed the conversation as well. And it's my deep appreciation. Um, Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Jenny Hebert Byrne. I'm um, from the School of Public Health here at UIC. Um, I'm the Associate Dean for Community Engagement, and I am the Interim Director of the Collaboratory for Health Justice, but as we said, our bios are elsewhere, so we can just jump right in. So I'm super impressed with those of you who are still here at the end of this amazing day and really grateful that you're here with us. I am have the best job on this panel. I get to just listen to my brilliant colleagues. Um, I'm just gonna give a little bit of an overview of what we're gonna do because Amy's right, we have a lot of really important insights to be shared on this. Um, and so this is really going to be a discussion among five individuals. 
um, and their insights and expertise around the role of public universities in academic medicine in health equity. So we're gonna start really with each of the panelists um, taking about five minutes, a sentence on who you are and some of your core considerations when you think about the role of public universities in academic medicine in really fostering health equity. And so what I love about this session is this really is about systems change. And thank you, Amy, for putting post-pandemic in the title of our session here. Um, that's super aspirational and, uh, and hopefully true that we have this real opportunity for transformation. What, one of the things we say in the School of Public Health is what will we grow from this crisis? This is just another crisis that intertwines with other ones, but what is really possible here? So we're each going to take five minutes. What are some of these core considerations um, when we really think about how public universities and academic medicine can transform at this particular time? And then we're going to shift into just a facilitated conversation. Um, those of us participating in this panel have talked about some topics that are really relevant to this conversation, and I'm just going to name them now, um, but then based on what emerges in these core considerations, we might kind of shift the conversation. Um, and speaking of shifting the conversation, this is one of our topics really thinking about uh, the counter narrative to the existing narrative on the role of public universities in um, fostering health equity. We might talk a little bit about structural violence, the ways in which systems do harm to communities. We may talk about transforming knowledge production. That's what we do in academia. So we have a real role here to think about what is knowledge and how is it produced. Uh, we have an opportunity maybe to reflect on uh, reparations. What, what might universities do in the name of reparations around health justice? And then of course, community engagement. And then we're gonna um, end after that facilitated conversation with each of the panelists really walking away with like, what is one particular action that can be taken? So I hope that works for everyone. Um, we're gonna start out with Keith. And Keith, if you don't mind, I'll be the timekeeper. And if you get close to five, I might just raise my hand or wave at you to let you know um, that, that we'll move on to the next person. So Keith is gonna go first, followed by Renee. So Keith, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Jenny, and thanks again for the opportunity. You don't have to worry about me taking five minutes. I'll be concise. <laughs> so, um, but again, my name is Keith Lewis. I'm the Senior Director of Community Collaboration uh, within the uh, Office of Diversity, Equity, and Engagement at UIC. Um, <clears throat> I previously, I've been in this role for about 10 months now, and prior to that, I was the Director of Community Relations and in, in Public and Government Affairs. I, I do want to give a, a, a slight disclaimer. Um, most of my work is, is, is in support of, of, of health and health inequities, but I'm not solely in that space. So I'm going to really, today, my comments will be more from a more global uh, perspective and not just, not just health, but I think the, the practices and approaches, all these things are parallel and, and connected. So I, I, you know, to, I think to, to answer the question, I think one of the core competencies that um, in terms of the work and some of the projects that I've been involved in, um, particularly in the context of UIC and its relation to community is this, this acknowledgement of, of history and, and, and what that history has been in, in those in surrounding communities and neighborhoods. Um, you know, for those that know, Again, it started off in the center, uh, uh, the Loop Campus or the um, the Circle Campus, rather, uh, that was in Navy Pier, and uh, then came to the near west side. And there were a, a number of families that were displaced, and that left that left a trail, a trail of of of, of harm. And so, when I first started about two and a half years ago, um, that was I, I created this framework for you know a community relations framework. And part of that framework was, was really to uh, around this uh, connecting with those. I really, I really try to seek out those individuals who, who had been a part of that history, who had experienced it and wanted to hear from them. And also, you know, really my, my intent was, was to show that there's things now, now to change. We're seeking to change. And part of that, and part of how that change happens is, is through its acknowledgement. It is through making these connections and, and to work to some form of, of redress. So I think, again, it all starts with, with history. And I think, you know, 
parallel with that, it's about what are those current practices and policies that, that are really creating uh, injuries and harm in, in, in communities. And uh, UIC is, is certainly not absent of that, you know, as a, uh, a perpetrator. And so I think that when you think about these core competencies, it also has to be sort of this analysis and examination of those current things that are happening that continue to inflict harm and injuries um, in neighborhoods. And I would say the, the last thing is, and I think Jenny, maybe I did go five minutes, so I'm gonna say this real quickly. The last thing I think you have to, as I said before, you have to have a plan for, with, for restoration and how you're going to, for redress. Um, I think those are like the three, uh, another core competency in terms of that connection to history and current practices. Thank you, Keith, that's great. We're gonna to go to Renee Hatcher and then Amanda Lewis is gonna follow Renee. Uh, so good afternoon. I wanna thank my colleague, Amy, for organizing this really wonderful event um, all day. And thank you to Jenny for um, rallying us all together. Um, I really appreciate going after Keith because I think the points that he made are so important in terms of uh, one, a recognition of the history, of relationships with the community in terms of uh, UIC or any public university. And it sets a, a context, I think, for so much of the work that we do as researchers or um, the applied work that we might do across uh, different departments here at UIC. So most of my work is um, as a clinic director at the law school and a clinic called the Community Enterprise and Solidarity Economy Clinic. And essentially what we do is provide free legal support to community-based organizations, community-based businesses. Um, and one way in which I like to think about that work, the best of what we do is really providing legal support so people and communities can determine their own futures and what their neighborhoods look like. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's so many, I think, contradictions or tensions in um, on the one hand, doing this work from a law school with law students who are by and large getting a lot of experience. And they're really seeing this work as a fundamental commitment to community and making sure that we are doing the work in such a way that is furthering agency, community agency, um, that is adaptive to the actual needs as opposed to what we might be interested in doing um, and really just trying to be uh, responsive and ensure that we're taking both cues and leads from our clients in some cases, which are really pretty straightforward in terms of the attorney client relationship. Uh, but then more than that, in the, the advocacy work that we do, you know, we're building deep relationships. We likely wouldn't be able to do any of the work we, we do without maintaining and really um, prioritizing those relationships. Um, so, so much I think of, of doing this the right way from a public university is really thinking about our commitment to the larger community in the context of what the history is. Uh, and so I guess with that, what I would say is um, really thinking about, again, where's the community in, in making the decisions in terms of the work that we do, um, being really honest and transparent in the ways that I think our work can be extractive when we're working in community and trying to be intentional about um, doing this in such a way uh, where we're really um, providing in support to as opposed to, you know, leading whatever the work is. Um, I find generally just in terms of equitable community engagement, it's, it's pretty simple. I, I think so some of it is is unlearning what might be um, problematic ways in which I think we've been socialized to think about these things like, oh, aren't we providing such great service to the community? Um, but I think so much of it really is just about uh, putting the decisions at the hands of community and then providing support and leveraging the resources of the university in support to the visions of community. Um, and moving beyond this idea of just like, okay, making sure that we're not doing harm, that we're recognizing the harm that has been done, but also how do we actually use resources as a public university to further those things that are the priorities of, of community and making sure that people can both articulate their own problems, priorities, and that um, those are the things that we're, we're lining up behind. So I'll stop there. Awesome. I love how these the, these speakers are going to weave together, and I'm excited to hear what 
Amanda is going to share and then Claire, you're gonna follow Amanda. Um, well, I also wanna thank um, Amy and Jenny for all the work on this. Um, and I, I just wanna make a few kind of big points. Um, I think, again, it's really helpful. Thank you, Keith, for that kind of setup because I think it's a really important beginning to any of the work we're doing. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about what it means to take the university's expressed values and commitments seriously. In some ways, the, the institute that I direct currently, the Institute for Research on Race and Public Policy, which has existed for a long time and this work has been ongoing. So I'm talking about the work, not as my work, but as work as the institute's been doing for a long time, has partly been a response to that and to try to kind of uh, effort to kind of help us realize this, this thing that we claim we're trying to do right now, the university has identified um, community engagement as one of its strategic priorities. Um, and this is both about um, being partners to address critical social and economic issues, um, to advance Chicago, to advance the city. Um, but I think there's lots of language in there about being equal partners in lots of different ways and about advancing understandings in order to improve conditions. Um, and so much of what we're trying to do is think about, okay, how do we make that real? Um, and, you know, I know we're going to have more time as this conversation goes on to talk about some of the ways that th that's contested. The university is a large and complex organization and then often speaks out of two sides of, what's the phrase, two sides of your mouth, right? So there is both lots of support. And um, I think the Institute is an example of support for this kind of real engaged research. And I'll give you some examples in a second. And then there are also lots of ways that um, maybe that's less true than we really would hope. So I'm happy to talk about more of those things as, as we go. Um, but I also, I wanna talk specifically for a couple of minutes about this role in particular of the university as a research institution, uh, cause I think that's, you know, kind of our lane in some ways. Um, and what does it mean to, um, to serve the community to really help advance understanding about what, um, what the city, what's going on in the city, about the conditions and experiences of communities in the city, and, um, and to work with community groups to kind of identify like, what do they need to know? Um, what do they want to work on? Um, and there's lots of different ways that that's happening. I mean, we, um, one of the things that the Institute does is support faculty, um, what we call policy and social engagement fellowships, where they work with community partners to um, do work. And, I think one of the important things about that is a lot of those projects um, are projects in which community organizations are, are sort of setting priorities, are kind of saying, this is, this is what we need help with. And the job of the university partner is to say, okay, I've got these skills and access to certain kinds of resources. Um, how do we make that happen? Another example is, is taking knowledge that comes out of work in the university and kind of, and using it to advance health equity. I mean, there's some great work going on out of public health here, not only by Jenny, our facilitator, who hopefully she'll talk about the amazing work that she's been doing for years, but also by other folks who, for instance, have been working on um, research for years around, for instance, um, Latinas and breast cancer and working with community organizations to actually develop workshops to help um, to, to put that knowledge to work to actually improve people's health outcomes and that sort of thing. Um, other kinds of projects that people are doing that I think are worth thinking about and that again come out of these kinds of collaborations are um, some great work that Diamacato did years ago with community groups on trying to understand access to, to medicine, to medicines to actually um, that, that came in the development of a whole new way of kind of thinking about pharmacy deserts, right? So not just food deserts, not just healthcare, but like and naming a problem that was persistent and mapping it around the city in a way that required a certain kind of policy um, policy response. Um, another example is work out of nursing from our colleague Phoenix Matthews, who did a work um, called Chicago Restroom Access Project that worked with a bunch of um, community groups around um, access to gender neutral bathrooms throughout the city, right? So mapping again. So I think there's lots of ways in which um, People are colleagues, people at the university are doing, um, I think what we might think of as the best of this kinds of work that are, that are um, working to uh, address um, real 
equity uh, challenges and doing it with community groups in ways that address issues. But I do think it's always important to kind of foreground that um, the work is really complicated and, and, uh, and that the university both supports it and often makes it harder. I mean, this is what we talked about a little bit at the beginning, makes it harder bureaucratically. <laughs> I mean, sometimes just the amount of paperwork one has, to, you know, you have to really want to do this. And the challenge is that we could be doing so much more of it. Um, I, I, um, I think we, there are, there are movements to making it more institutionally um, supported. I think the, the uh, existence of the office that Keith Lewis is in charge of is one, gen, one gesture in that direction. And I think there's lots of ways that, that this is a kind of really a substantive conversation going on, but there's lots of work to do. So I, hopefully I'm, you know, I think there's a lot of good, really good stuff going on and, and, but also ways it could be deeper and bigger and wider. And uh, so I'm sure we'll get into more of that. Yeah, I, I hope so. Thank you. I, one of the things I always recognize when we have opportunities to speak like this is the number of people who've been at UIC for such a long time and who believe in the greatness of UIC. And I think that you and public universities generally. Um, and so thank you for tying together so many of the topics that we're going to get to. And so speaking of great research, uh, Claire, dying to hear your, your core uh, concepts in this space of public university and health equity. Hi, thank you so much, Jenny, and thanks, Amy, for all the work that you've done. Um, I think, so I'm a, pro a professor in sociology uh, at UIC, and um, I think I'm here to really provide kind of an example of the ways in which university resources can be leveraged to think more deeply about health equity and what that means in the city of Chicago. So since August of 2020, I've been the lead researcher on a project that is analyzing uh, racial disparities and COVID-19 outcomes and how um, the city has responded to those disparities. Um, so we've conducted 100 interviews so far with um, residents of three vulnerable communities, uh, Albany Park, Little Village, and Austin. Um, and these interviews really reveal very on the ground struggles that vulnerable Latinx and Black Chicagoans are facing. Um, but they also provide kind of an audit of the city and state policies that were meant to redress these disparities. So, you know, did they work and in what ways were they unsuccessful or successful? Um, and in addition to that, we interviewed 45 state actors, public health officials, epidemiologists, and health providers. Um, and this is going to be published in an IRPP report um, later this semester. So um, our research really illustrates how um, qualitative narratives from vulnerable groups can be used to reveal gaps and challenges in existing policies, but also how data collected by the city to um, direct scarce resources um, can be sort of challenged from different kinds of data that are coming out of communities themselves. Um, so this, this might allow us to think a little bit about how community-based knowledge can be leveraged to critique state response, but also how we as academics can um, intervene to help communities um, by pointing to the failures of policy to uh, address their needs. Well, there are just two things I wanted to kind of say about this. Um, that might be lessons for this broader conversation about the university. So in its health equity initiatives, the city um, engaged local community organizations to help direct resources like testing and vaccines, as well as cash and rental assistance. Um, but the residents that we interviewed often didn't benefit from these very direct resources. And so one of the questions we pose in the, in the research is why didn't they? What, what went wrong? Um, in some ways, this is just a level of need, right? Like the level of need from structural inequalities that are historic uh, was too great um, to be addressed signif significantly by sort of small, small programming or, or just these kind of programming efforts. Um, but there were also ways in which sometimes the paperwork or bureaucracy that was needed to um, to access benefits were exclusionary. Um, also residents often spoke about how only large organizations were sort of given a seat at the table. 
Um, and this sort of begs the question of who counts as community, right? Like, what do we mean when we talk about community and how and which voices are listened to? Um, many times smaller organizations were better able to respond to complex needs, but they don't have the bureaucracy or staff to receive large um, government or philip philanthropic grants. And so they often were not able to sort of leverage themselves to um, get this kind of funding to support the work that they were doing to respond to complex needs. Um, another lesson that might be relevant for our conversation is what counts as data and for whom? Because um, often the definition of health equity that was driven by particular metrics that the city wanted to track um, was not how communities themselves were understanding health equity. Um, so the city did create really local census tract data to um, help organizers direct educational resources or vaccine information. Um, which is great, uh, but sometimes this missed sort of broader and more complex problems that communities uh, were facing. So in shifting the conversation about health equity, I think we just, uh, I think this research shows that we need to pay attention to the kinds of knowledge and data that communities need uh, to be responsive to complex vulnerabilities. And I suppose one other question uh, just to end on is, you know, what to do with this knowledge now? How do we take uh, what we've learned and the report um, that we are going to have on our findings and make it accessible and usable by communities to further their um, their work. Thank you, Claire. Completely, totally fascinating research. I'm I'm really on the edge of my seat as someone who's in those that space working with community-based organizations on the community response to COVID. Um, I, I share some uh, questions about what is community led response look like by whom um, and have all sorts of questions about how to connect to kind of organic movements like the mutual aid movement um, and, and to support kind of the, the, the organic community leadership that just emerged um, as part of the pandemic. So thank you so much. I've got a million questions for you, but Darlene really eager to hear from you. So we'll, we'll turn it over to you for five minutes. Thank you for that. Hi, everybody. I'm Darlene Hightower. I'm the Vice President of Community Health Equity at Rush University Medical Center. I really um, appreciated the comments that have preceded me on, um, on the topic that we're here to talk about today, and I was taking notes. Some of the things that bubbled up to me are, are twofold. Like One is when we think about um, academics and uh, the institutions that are really um, providing education to the next generation of leaders, it's an opportunity for us to dig deep into like how we talk about health equity, how we teach health equity, how we're getting um, the younger generation to kind of think about health equity as they go on in their medical practice, nursing practice, or whatever it may be. And so we've been working to develop specific curriculum in that regard um, so that we can start to address some of the ongoing tropes and disparities and things that we see related to race uh, within medicine. Um, so if you are uh, teaching the next generation about those things, the hope is that we can get at um, some of the ongoing um, uh, disparities and inequities that we see in the medical field, that's one. And then secondly, um, I'm thinking a lot about, um, is it an opportunity for us to rethink who is qualified to teach? Sometimes our institutions can be such ivory towers and we have specific ideas on who is you know, qualified to be in these roles. And like what we're trying to do at Rush is to broaden the definition of who uh, a academic professor or a teacher is and really thinking about how you bring in lived experience and community voices into the classroom to buttress some of the more traditional um, ways that we're teaching young people. And I'm really excited about that because I think um, the best comes from um, lived experience as well as, as you know, the, the typical academic work. So we will see you know, how, how these things progress um, and uh, you know, hopefully we'll get better outcomes with the young people that we're um, shepherding. I'll stop there. Thank you, Darlene. And thank you, I, I see in the chat, um, your role on the racial equity response team. And to, we'll hope to come back to that conversation too. I know from the School of Public Health, we are working with CDPH on that COVID response too. So thank you. So listen, there's so many places I'd like to jump in, but I think I'll just build off of Darlene talking about um, 
what are kind of common narratives um, around health equity. So, you know, there is kind of a, I guess I want to ask the group and Amanda, I'm going to ask you to go first. When you think about what is the common narrative or conversation about health inequities in the Chicagoland communities, um, what is it? Who's having that conversation? And how do we need to shift that conversation from talking about health equities or like Paula Braverman was saying earlier, talking about health disparities to really talking about health justice? Um, well, I was just going to say, you know, I, I wasn't able to attend all day, but I listened to some of the conversations earlier. And I think it, it raised so many interesting questions and juxtapositions about how we make sense of even what we've been through over the last couple of years. Um, the different stories that people told that were either about huge victories and successes or huge failures are so much situated in, in you know, as we know where we're sitting, right? Um, but I will say, and this is more of a general comment. I mean, one of the one of the big projects that we've been doing for the last five years is a, and this is part of the work that that Claire's doing that we're invested in and supporting is this idea of looking at what's the state of racial justice in Chicago, of asking that question and really looking at that in terms of a broad range of communities and trying to understand people's conditions and experiences and really trying to have a conversation that situates it historically and that offers a kind of you know, a structural lens into what's going on. Because exactly as you pointed out and as people have talked about earlier today, we still have, and this is not just about health, but really a, a wide range of outcomes, you know, far too individualized narratives about what's going on, right? Even, even when we think about violence in the state, like if all of us really care about people's safety and longevity, you know, interpersonal violence in Chicago, I'm not saying it's not a problem, but it's not the biggest problem. It's not the, it's not the biggest cause of premature death. It's not, I mean, there, there are lots of things that are um, that are a problem, but, but and, and the thing about it is there are huge consequences of, of a story like that. So if we think the story of the problem in Chicago around premature death is about interpersonal violence, then all we want to do is fund police, which I'm not saying is a very good strategy for that either. But that's what happens rather than thinking about funding mental health clinics and funding, I mean, what, what um, Claire's work shows, well, lots of work shows in terms of thinking about the, the kind of real gaps in terms of access to quality health care throughout the city, those kind of things. Um, so that's a big one. I think another one that came up earlier today um, is the idea of what counts as a crisis. And I think there, there are lots of ways in which um, we've identified a crisis now. And of course, we are in a crisis. I'm not claiming we're not in a crisis. But a lot of communities have been in like some of the some of our indicators of why why we as a kind of larger city state nation are in a crisis are things that have been true in a lot of communities for consistently for the last thirty years, and this is about you know and we can we can think about that in a lots of different ways, but it it there the, none of that is race neutral right I mean racism matters in all that in lots of different ways, and I think. Part of our job in the universities is to try to push a conversation that is much more grounded in, in, in what's going on in a kind of, it has, a, it has a, just a better analysis, better connection to the truth, better connection to history, all those things. Um, not that that's the only, you know, it's not just about ideas, but I think that's a big part of our job. Darlene, do you want to jump in, kind of building off of those ideas, talking sure. about the counter narrative? Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. And Amanda, I'm giving you like five snaps up for, <laughs> for the things that you just said. I was taking notes. And one of the things that stuck out to me the most is like this idea around narrative and context. And so um, in the last couple of years, like we have done some data collection around life expectancy gaps. And one of the things that we discovered was that if you were fortunate enough to live in the loop, you could live to the age of 85. If you lived in West Garfield Park, life expectancy went down to 68. So that's like a 16 year gap. And we built a lot of health equity work um, around closing that gap. Um, but the narrative around the why is something that's really important and goes back to what Amanda was saying. People think it's it's violence, it's gun violence, all these neighborhoods on the west side are you know terrible and that kind of stuff. 
And that's just not true. The biggest drivers of the life expectancy gap are around cardiovascular issues, maternal child health, opioid use. Yes, gun violence is among those, but it's not the primary uh, reason that people are dying prematurely. And so we need to think about the stories that we tell about the why, the stories behind the data that we pull as an academic institution, as a public health um, um, academic uh, place, uh, being able to tell the story behind the data in a way that's authentic and true and doesn't fall into the ordinary narratives and tropes about which neighborhoods are good and which aren't, which people are better and who isn't, I think is really important. And the better we do that, I think the better outcomes we'll be able to get. Thank you, Darlene. I think I'm just going to build on that. Okay, Claire, I see you. Thank you. Go ahead, Claire, then I'll, I'll move us to talking about structural violence, kind of this, this theme of doing harm, but go ahead, Claire. No, I was just going to say that, you know, I think that, um, you know, I think that existing structural vulnerabilities sort of got a lot of, has gotten a lot of lip service during COVID, but they haven't always been at the forefront of like thinking creatively about responses that would have prioritized vulnerable communities first. Um, and so, for example, like thinking about housing as health, right, like thinking about the ways in which securing people, you know, safe housing would have gone a long way to protecting vulnerable folks, um, in particular from getting exposed to COVID to begin with. So thinking about the prevention with a kind of structural inequality lens, um, as opposed to sort of, um, you know, after the fact, I mean, now there's all of this um, emergency rental assistance, which is great and, you know, probably doesn't go all the way towards resolving the problem, but it also came after the fact. And so I think that sometimes we need to think about structural vulnerabilities first and make that be the driving um, kind of point for thinking creatively about how we prevent further vulnerability as opposed to sort of reacting um, to what happens after, you know, the crisis has already occurred. Excellent. So centering structural vulnerability in a health equity response to a crisis. Thank, thank you for that. I wanted to see if we could talk, and uh, Renee, I think I'm going to ask you next, um, thinking about the role of academia. Um, you know, I did kind of want to name structural violence only because I really like the definition that structural violence uses the word violence, but to really point to the systemic harm that is done to communities. Um, and should highlight things other than um, violence or interpersonal violence, as Amanda and Darlene were pointing to, but, but harm that is woven into systems that reliably produces advantage to some and disadvantage to others. So I'm wondering, Renee, if you can think about what role does, academic, does academia, uh, the ivory tower, as Darlene was saying, play in structural violence as it impacts our partner neighborhoods in Chicago? Yeah, and I mean, I think that there's so many um, there's so many ways um, because, as you said, structural violence. You know, in Keith starting us out with the history, for example, of UIC, which is not uncommon. Uh, we have so many public land grant institutions in this country that have displaced people, that have um, you know, uh, dispossessed people of land, of relationships, and support systems that were very much rooted in their communities prior to that displacement. Um, and I think part of it as well is, you know, this extends even to, for example, the way in which universities police neighborhoods, uh, which has been an ongoing issue with UIC, uh, with many of the universities here in the city of Chicago, um, the ways in which um, we professionalize knowledge and access to knowledge, right? Um, and often, the way in which I think academics are incentivized to extract sometimes just data, sometimes um, other things, cultural things um, for, you know, for and what is ultimately the game of academia and in ways that are not generative or accountable. Um, and so, so much I think of what we need to really take a look at is being critical of the way in which academia has engage communities in the past for the harms that have been done, um, starting at that place and taking real stock of that, and then fundamentally making a decision, but also you know, being able to shift policies and um, processes to actually be able to do the work. Um, things like our incentive structures, right? Um, one of the examples that I wanted to bring up, certainly before we end the panel, 
was that I work with a um, a few organizations now that have created their own internal IRB process that they control, that they decide who gets access to actually talking to uh, the folks who are really doing work on the ground, or in this case, um, this is an organization that does different types of urban farming and land stewardship. And so in part because of really harmful um, relationships that they've had either with universities or specific academics, they decided to do this in part to be able to say, decide, and also to have control over their own stories and their own data. So I'll stop there. So Jenny, I think I, I just like to, to add to that. I think, you know, another way, particularly some of the, what I've heard from talking with various community partners, we talk about, uh, you know, the, the sort of economic democracy in the way that certain certain businesses, certain um, entrepreneurs, et cetera, are, are equipped and better positioned to be able to access, whether through supply chain or as vendors um, within public university, and I think particularly UIC. And I think that is definitely a way that it excludes certain groups. And so for me, it's always a question in, in, in some of the work I'm doing now is how do you build that capacity? How do you equip and really strengthen and create pathways to put those, those smaller businesses and, and, and local businesses in a, in a position so that they can enter that and within the supply chain. Um, UIC has a, as a, even though like, again, it has these sort of larger institutional goals around MBEs, but it's doing, it's, it's, it's doing woeful. And, and my question is always, okay, well, well, where's the accountability around this? It's one thing to, to acknowledge, but ultimately what's being done and what's the accountability around that? And, and I, I, I just, I, I'm, not, I'm not seeing any really, I would say uh, action uh, in, in that space or in that, in that thought. And so that's some things that I'm thinking about in terms of particularly with the work that I'm leading with these two neighborhood centers um, in, on the South and West side. And again, how is it that we, I think someone earlier about learning and, and responding to what community needs are, what are those barriers that, that public universities create and, and how do we dismantle those and, and, and really position them and change them in such a way so that it does create more access. So I think that is definitely one of the big things that when we think about those ways that can change economic conditions, noting that small businesses, particularly you know, in, in black communities, are the largest employers. And so I think this is a way, a role that the, that the universities can play in terms of bringing more into that pipeline um, for the local business and entrepreneurs. Yeah, and if I could just take maybe 20 seconds to make that real. Um, so for example, some of the businesses in my clinic, we have tried to uh, engage in contracts, like for example, for things like translation or sometimes for our new marketing materials. And it has been nearly impossible in part because of the university's procurement and vendor um, policies. And these are businesses that are based in black and brown communities here in the city of Chicago um, that are collectively owned, that are also trying to think about material ways to transform their neighborhoods and their communities. If I could piggyback off of that um, comment, the idea of supporting uh, small businesses that are led by people of color is like so transformational and, you know, makes so much sense. But to Renee's point, it's like our institutions are not built to do it. Like the policies that we have in place are built for institution to institution, not like institution to community. And I'll give a quick example. So we have like, you know, purchase local um, programs at our uh, organization and we work with small businesses to do catering and other things. Well, we have a 45 day payment period for businesses to get paid. Well, that doesn't work for the small, you know, community business it just doesn't work. And so we had to fight with our internal, you know, supply chain procurement and contract folks to say, let's do a net seven, get, you know, pay them in seven days instead of 45 if they're on our, you know, vendor list. And so we were able to do that, but it required a policy change. And so I think if when institutions are thinking about partnering with community on whatever it is, research, whatever, we really have to think about ways that we need to change, we need to change as institutions to be successful in those partnerships. 
Thank you, Darlene. Such a good example. I think you saw all the UIC people nodding with the, the similar kinds of barriers. Amanda, I'm, I'm guessing you have a lot to say here. You know, we, we are interested in naming these internal processes that we can fix to make us better partners. But the other thing I've heard is so that we partner in restorative, Renee said, generative healing ways. I'm wondering what your thoughts are. I know you've given a lot of thought to systems transformation in this area. Yeah, you know, I think um, there's this need, I mean, just listening to these folks, right? So everybody on the screen is like doing really important work, right? And and I and and I I named a few earlier. I could, you know, we I could name 30 people around the university just, you know, easily without, you know, who are doing really great. And but the challenge is like that work is often Renee's work, it's Jenny's work, it's Keith's work. It's not UIC's, it's the institution is not always the, you know, it's this kind of interesting thing, I'm thinking about relationship of the institution to these communities. And part of the reason why we, the institution doesn't always get credit is because the institution isn't always treating us that nicely. So we're not going out wearing our university gear saying I'm, you, you know, and or we're, having to do so much work to compensate for the bad actions of the university or other university people of the past that we don't wanna go and saying, oh, I'm here on behalf of UIC because you know, we know that a bunch of people are gonna be like, okay, well, you could just turn around and go right back in the other direction, right? So there's, it's, there's, there's a lot of relational work involved um, in building long-term relationships with people. Um, and I think, that is sort of the counter, but another exact, exact example of what Darlene was talking about, which is both like when we want to work with smaller providers and that kind of thing, we, there's like, we're doing a project right now, we're doing a report on Ever Americans in Chicago, and we're working with a bunch of community groups because we have to, we can't do this work if it's not with the community, but trying to, to get resources that we promised to them, to, you know, it's just like fax machines that nobody's checked since July and you know, it's just a large, or rules, like we find about rules in university, I was thinking about you saying when you said this, Renee, this is partly about the state of Illinois, when you work with a state that has a long history of corruption, there are these rules that have been passed because some person acted badly 20 years ago, and it's just like, what do you mean we have to fill out 10 forms to give somebody $100, I mean, you know, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but so I, you have to really want to do this work, and you've got to really and I, so I think, yes, there's so many barriers that we just need to be tearing down all the time. And we also, and Jenny, you and I've talked about this some, when people are doing it, institutional rewards have to like, have to bounce. You know, we say we want people to be doing it. Well, then we've got to not, we've got to build in, this is more internal work, but we've got to build in the systems through, through all the things that matter, tenure and promotion, merit reviews, all the different ways that we say to people, you're doing good work. It needs to acknowledge that this is way more complicated than just going to do archival work at the library or other kinds of other kinds of work um, that we do. And I realized I didn't I didn't even get into the part of how do we do. Um, I loved the phrase you offered, Renee, generative and what was the other word? Generative and you just said it, Jenny. What was this? Restorative. Word? Restorative. Yeah. I wrote it down. I yes. know. Um, and and like you know. The, the only thing I have to say, I mean, that really, to me, comes from having long relationships, and it comes from not dipping in and out of places. I mean, there's a lot of, and we, I, I want to hear what everybody else has to say about this, um, but I, you know, I remember learning about this from the, when I first started trying to do research in schools, I will say more than 30 years ago, the first time I walked, first five buildings I walked into said, no, we don't like researchers here, because this, and they started telling me these horrible stories about what people had done. So, you know, it's not unique to us by any means, but it is absolutely the case uh, that you know there's there's been a, there's been a lot there's been a lot of abuse. Let's put it that way. And I just want to speak yeah. to that because I, I I do want to I want to speak to about when it when it when it does work and it can work right in terms of so again as I mentioned I'm leading an effort around these two neighborhood initiative uh, neighborhood centers. Um, and one thing that we did uh, is that we convened, uh, we had a retreat this summer with about 60 stakeholders from uh, the greater Longdale area, uh, Auburn Gresham and UIC. And one of the things that, you know, we spoke about this earlier, one thing that we, that we at the outset was established about the, the institutional harms and injuries that had been created. Um, 
And that was something that was a core value that we that we we needed to do that to level set and 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 not say this is something that we we're gonna say that we're gonna hide from um, because those dynamics exist. And so I think that was all the feedback that I've gotten and received from that from that point back in June till now. And we've got a report that's been you know sent you know throughout the university and, and within community. And that's been again some of just the most the feedback was about I'm so glad that this was that you took the time and you that was an intention, that was an intention to call this out and name that. And so going to what Amanda was talking about is, is that that was part of our trust building. That we're 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 going to make this announcement, we're going to speak this out, we're going to call it. And and again, it's not gonna it's not gonna eradicate, but it is this 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 sense of, of again of naming. And this has also been able to again lend some stuff in terms of building that social capital. So we're still, you know, in that phase again. As the man who was saying, there's a lot of because there's a lot of different players. Because as much as I can tell you, I've had some strong experiences with that. But there's other players within this institution that have that have been regressive, have done regressive action, you know, in this process. But I do think again, starting off again with naming it, that 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 harm that injury. It does. It does create value and, and helps uh, build trust. Thank you, Keith. And I, I want to say, I kind of this is probably clear from my earlier comments, but I am one of those people who've been at UIC for a long time and feel so hopeful and believe in the greatness of UIC. And I do think, Keith, there's a lot of optimism about what you are bringing to the university right now. It's really exciting. You know, when we think about how Kamara Jones defines health equity, she names the the requirement to recognize and rectify historical injustices. And it does feel like you are starting us down that lane. So I just thank you for what you do. But I wanna see if I can shift to talk to Claire a little bit. You know, what I've heard from all of the panelists was um, this emphasis on lived experience on um, a counter narrative. Um, Darlene, thank you for talking about repositioning whose expertise is in front of the classroom. That's something we're focusing on in the School of Public Health too. But we wanted to see if we could talk about if academia has so much power in determining what is knowledge, if, if our expertise um, has some power, how can we fundamentally transform our scholarship such that it's firmly rooted in community priorities and in lived experience of our partners? In three minutes or less. Is that, that's for me. <laughs> That's yes, a huge please. question. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I have no idea. I mean, I think that what, <laughs> I think that what, um, I mean, I think that what ends up happening when we talk to people about their experiences is that we just get such a truer sense of what kinds of barriers there are. So I, what I mean by that is, I mean, so Keith, I love what you said about, you know, the first step is talking to people about the harms that have been done. I think that's so important. And I think that oftentimes, I, I'm just thinking, for example, about all the people that I've spoken to about um, vaccine hesitancy, for example. Um, and, and, you know, we often talk about that, that, you know, for communities of color in particular, that's rooted in a deep historical distrust um, that is very real and, of course, matters greatly. Um, but then if you really talk to people about what that means to them, you get these narratives that are that are really rich. And so I think that um, it goes a long way to both recognizing that it's there and recognizing that it's still there, right? It's still a part of people's experiences with healthcare institutions, for example, um, that distrust. But um, it's also you you just you can dive into more specific kinds of mechanisms that emerge that are that potentially make um, addressing those fears and concerns more possible. So I think that centering these lived experiences, centering narratives um, in particular, and really listening to what people are saying instead of just kind of glossing it over with something like, oh, well, that's just distrust. It's been here forever. You know, there's nothing we can do about it really gets at some of the things that that really matter and that we can a start to kind of uh, address because we can we can hone in on some of the the intricacies of where that distress is stemming from and um, and why I, I don't know if that's helpful but super helpful um, and and I think the kind of research you're doing which is qualitative and community engaged and iterative and all those things uh, really matter so thank and thank you you really did do that in three minutes. Um, so we have 10 minutes left. We're shifting this um, to now each of the panelists are going to share with us their critical next steps 
Um, and so we're really trying to think about um, systems transformation. We really want to think about what are the steps that, that need to happen such that public universities and academic medicine can foster health justice. And Keith, you are up first. We're gonna go Keith and then Renee. Um, what would be the critical next step that we need to take here or some bold opportunities that we should be stepping up to? So I, I think for me, it's, it's always been and continues to be um, with this neighborhood centers development process is about centering community. I think about it really in a, in a kind of symbiotic way, way in how that uh, community is centered within UIC, but also how we are integrating within community. And so that is, that is for me, is, is I'm, I'm constantly trying to push myself and, and talk with others about ways in, in which we enact that. Um, because ultimately we talk about some of these, you know, from with the health or, or economics and education, there are policy implications. And I was just in a meeting earlier today, kind of doing some map, you know, kind of looking at this, the structural of where decisions are made within the institution and how do we, again, how do we infiltrate and integrate community in those spaces to become influencers and raise their and uplift their voices? While at the same time, again, how do we embed into community and, and, and also hear their voices. That's a, it's, 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 it's nuance, right? But I think again, for me to the question, it's, it's, it's about again, being really intentional and being deliberate and being transparent um, about, ab about that, but also hearing from asking the question of community about what do you need and, and what will be helpful to work toward those ends. So that is very much about my, is again, about centering community and not prescribing and sort of have these answers, but really having community to provide those answers and strategies and, 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 and uplift their, their knowledge and expertise. Thank you, Renee, and then Amanda. Okay, I'll try to keep it under two minutes. Um, so I think in terms of critical next steps, I think there are um, confronting the challenges. And what, what I mean by that is I, I think, you know, UIC or any other public university has to really be clear in terms of what it values and actually reflect those values in the ways in which we incentivize faculty or um, allow for this type of community engaged work. Uh, you know, I think so much of so much of the work that I do that is with community is probably the least important thing from the perspective of the institution. It's nice to, you know, talk about it when there's a press release or there's something that happens, but by and large internally is not valued through our incentive structures or just the, the way in which academia works. So I think, you know, that's a real challenge um, just to, con to do the work. Um, and I think so many of us who, who are doing the work uh, with communities do it because we're committed to it outside of any role that we hold at the university. Um, and so I think, I think that's in part um, what needs to happen. But in addition to that, I think that there are a lot of, there's so many opportunities at UIC, as you said, Jenny, and um, there are so many opportunities really for us to address community issues, to provide community support that's led by community in an interdisciplinary way. And that's the part that I'm very excited about. So for example, with the Healthy Work Center, um, and the North Lawndale um, Healthy Work Grant that's really looking at precarious workers, um, trying to work on a team of folks who have other uh, or come from other disciplines or expertise to actually work on these projects, right, is something that's really exciting and I think also can uh, produce um, really a, a more uh, impactful results, right, for communities as they articulate their problems and as we provide support and leverage the, the resources of the university to actually implement the solutions that they themselves, right, are articulating. Absolutely, I share your enthusiasm. Amanda and then Claire. Um, so I, I wanna put exclamation points on everything that Keith and Renee just said, and I'll just add a new one. And I hope I'm not repeating something that, um, that Darlene was about to say. So I do think we need to institutionalize support for engaged research in lots of ways we haven't. But I also think we should take seriously not just the research mission of the institution, but the educational mission of the institution. And we at UIC educate so many health practitioners in a wide range of things. And um, this is not my bailiwick, but I, you know, my sense of things is that when we talk about health disparities, a lot of the time we don't really 
we don't really have enough of a deep understanding about why, for instance, race matters so much for health. And I think helping really building into the curriculum a much deeper, more robust, more nuanced, structural, a colleague of mine calls it structural competency, um, so people can think differently about what they're doing and how to, you know. So a lot of a lot of the stuff we're talking about is all the ways that health is impacted way outside the healthcare system. But I think there's also lots of work to be done internally, and we do we do a lot of training of health professionals, and I think we could probably also do do that a little better. I love it, Claire, and then Darlene. Um, yeah, these are all such great points. Um, I guess I would just go back to something that Renee said earlier, which was about how oftentimes uh, researchers' roles or researchers' relationships to communities is extractive. Um, and so just thinking a lot about how do we go, you know, we do the research and it's supposed to be helpful by exposing things, but then how do we actually take it back to community members and say, not just reporting back, but what's next, right? Like, what do we do with this information that we've collected? together. Um, and I think that, you know, UIC could also provide more resources and incentives to support that kind of work, which is to then say, okay, well, here's the research. And now what do we do? Um, let's talk about it, right? Um, so, thanks. So, so helpful, Claire. It, it reminds me, I'm not, I don't want to cut into Darlene's time, but um, Amanda mentioned Phoenix Matthews. And just those people who are doing this really a uh, novel creative knowledge dissemination. We can really learn from each other there. So thank you for that. All right, Darlene, you're gonna carry us out here. Sure, so my department sits within the hospital and uh, one of the things that the hospital is required to do is a community health needs assessment every three years. And so what we've tried to do is um, gather qualitative data from the communities that we serve and quantitative data and put together a roadmap identifying what the community needs are, and then putting together an implementation plan to address those needs. What we need to do, and when that report is done, and we are uh, the next one is due in June of next year, is make sure that that information that we've taken months to gather is shared with our academic colleagues, because it can be used as um, perhaps a new uh, research opportunities or new training opportunities because we've taken the time to go out into community and ask them what they wanted you know, us to work on in partnership with them. So how do we better leverage um, the community health needs assessment and implementation plan that we need to, to do in ways that can um, um, have us be better partners with the academic side of the institution in ways that will benefit community. Such a good point, Darlene. And you know, in the, in the School of Public Health, we call those the CHA and the CHIP. Um, the community health assessment and the implementation plan. And we also have one for the city of Chicago, Healthy Chicago 2025, that names these outcomes that Amanda was talking about, overall life expectancy, uh, and, and how can we work together strategically to address those structural drivers that produce those health outcomes. So thank you so much. Before I turn it back over to Amanda, I'm gonna see if Renee's puppy has anything to say because I'm pretty sure <laughs> that puppy wa wants to be a part of this conversation. Yeah, he definitely did, but I think I think he's uh, retired. Now All right, but I loved the enthusiasm. Amy, I'm just going to thank you in advance from all of us. We don't get a chance to talk like this very often. I'm I'm really I've I've learned so much, and I, again, I just admire the the talent on this panel, and thank everyone for being here. Yeah, thank you, Jenny. First of all, masterful job facilitating. And I have to remember sort of some of your tips and techniques because, you know, it's hard to sort of rain. I mean, we could talk forever. Um, and I wish we could. And I'm like you, I'm, I'm both exhausted, but also energized by this day um, and couldn't be more thankful and appreciative of you. Um, this was such a perfect way to really close this out. You're very concrete um, in, in sort of offering some challenges, but then optimism, right? Uh, 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 leaving us with a little dose of um, it could, you know, we have opportunities. And so I just wanna share with um, all the, the participants and the people that have joined us today, just a few closing remarks. And I know we're all exhausted and probably want to get along with our weekends, but um, I just briefly wanna um, offer some thank yous, um, some overdue uh, thank yous for the whole day. Um, if it takes a village to raise a child, uh, I cannot tell you how many people it takes to make a day um, like today happen. Um, and while I cannot possibly thank everyone who informed um, what we see today, um, I want to 
acknowledge at least some key people with uh, special mention. First, my deep thanks to members of our planning team at one point or another, which has included Peggy, Michael, Terry, Jody, Lauren, Patty, Edie, and Art. Um, I feel like, like the Oscars, like I'm just, you know, thinking throwing out these names, but, um, uh, and Judith, who has been a critical link, Judith Hamill was a critical link in our opening panel and her um, great government connections. We have had and been joined by amazing student research assistants throughout the day and who will be helping me with post symposium work, Natalie, Danya, and Jackie. Um, so I thank them. We also have been had some great student question and answer moderators and people who've just been filling in information on chat and, and been so much more technically savvy than I am. And that includes Alan, Megan, Momo, Maddie, Shayla, and Rama. Um, and I thank them all. Ma Rama actually comes to us from the Honors College. So we're hoping that maybe she'll be a future UIC law student, just putting it out there. Um, uh, and so we hope so. Um, another special mention, I mentioned Peggy before, but she has been integral all day. You, you've seen her, she's she's kind of been the person that's recorded and doing all this kind of work. And she has stepped up at key points throughout. And to Michael and Jody who have um, weathered constant questions for me and could we just and you know even as well like late as last night like ideas that I had that I'm sure um, caused them great frustration. Uh, another thanks to the Brond Fund for all their support of this and finally a huge debt of gratitude um, to those who accepted my rather long-winded Hamill lawyer what can I say but uh, invites to join this day um, including our panelists our facilitators um, our featured speaker um, all who have accepted sort of the twists and turns of this planning process with grace and great patience with me. Um, it really, it was, it was more than, than I even imagined it could be. Um, and now as we close our time together, I just want to offer a few thoughts. I have like pages. I'm not going to read you. I mean, I have so many notes that I printed out just now um, and it doesn't even capture. But I just, I was really struck by how we started the day um, with a uh, discussion about budget, right? And budget matters and priorities and, and policy priorities. And um, the fact that Cook County now has an equity um, fund uh, with federal resources that they're going to apply with an equity lens. Um, same with the healthcare transformation grant at the state level for communities to engage in um, innovative partnerships and reimagine how we provide healthcare, which really, and, and the social kind of determinants of that health. And, and these are opportunities where um, policy is saying, you know, we're not perfect, we're not doing everything, but we're trying to sort of match dollars with priorities and offering these opportunities. Um, and then sort of to keep us all real and grounded, we, we heard from some community voices Places of you know Chicago, um, sadly, like so many communities, it's a tale of, of two cities, right? And disparity and access to so many services, including mental health services, um, and and sort of where people end up if they have healthcare needs, and and the trauma just of this experience of pandemic, um, even pre-existing, you know, the trauma of racism and discrimination and inequity. Um, and that you know the, these things sort of matter, and and sort of calling us out, and the role of public institutions um, to understand how um, our investments um, matter, right? And what we do, and where we invest our priorities, does matter. Um, we heard um, in defining health equity um, that while words like um, we you know it should be uh, you know things that are avoidable, unfair, and just, we want a remedy. We also have to think about measurement because without measurement, we don't have accountability. And so efforts to think about when we're using the words we use and the language we use, um, is it measurable and how are we holding ourselves accountable so they're not just words, but they actually have action behind them. Um, and our obligations to each other and thinking about sort of interconnected rights and collective responsibility. How can we move to a place, um, particularly when we're speaking during sort of public health and health equity and health justice, how can we move a place of, of that sense of collective responsibility? Um, we heard from our health system leaders that um, we don't want to go back to the before, that, that this pandemic has been um, challenging and beyond, but that it has been an opportunity to rethink how we do things and, and to do them better um, and to do them with more engagement of the community. Um, and that partnership is so critical in that across all of the government, but also into the community. We heard about the, for instance, the Healthy Chicago Equity Zones, where um, looking ahead, it's it's more about telling us what you need, how can we do this better, um, how can we sort of have boots on the ground, if you will, um, and not just kind of sit in silos and, and, and sort of our offices and think about what is needed and what we should prioritize. 
Um, again, we heard more about you know, individual rights and, and sort of collective rights and thinking about that. And we heard about the, the importance of data. Um, I was really struck that when, one of the first emergency rules that we heard in Chicago had to report race and ethnicity relating to anything that had to do with COVID um, and how that was new and that's so important, right? And why aren't we doing that at all times and thinking about, because if we don't have the data, um, you know, we can kind of get away with sort of fuzzing around at the margins. Um, and so that was really, really important. Um, we switched to law and policy, um, sort of the bread and butter of what we've been talking about, but I felt really good after that, that there are a lot of interesting tips and toolkits and strategies that are emerging that have evidence behind them, that have all kinds of, uh, you know, communities using them that we can sort of um, borrow from. Chicago itself is actually sort of engaging in this work and using that, and that importance of the collaboration with these tools. I, I think, you know, even though we, we've seen how law has, has failed us um, at many times, there's still an opportunity and a power through that to engage in the structural transformation work, particularly when we are engaging in communities in that work and thinking about data, not just the number, but the data of narratives, right? The, the stories that go behind those numbers. Um, and, and finally, um, this amazing panel that we just had now, um, I, I can't even begin to start with all my notes on this one, but um, I just was really struck by sort of thinking about sort of our history and our context and, and being mindful of that and being intentional in our work and thinking of university resources as a value and, and how do we use them and to engage um, with the community and address the community's priorities and think about that when we're thinking of the research we do, how we do that research, how we teach, who we teach and how to bring in that lived experience and community voices. Um, and also I was really struck when, you know, sort of what counts as a crisis that our communities, we're talking about the pandemic, but this crisis has been existing, it's been around for decades and beyond. And so how are we sort of stepping up and saying, um, how do we kind of ground ourselves in that truth and that history and think about prevention with that structural vulnerability lens. I loved that language of generative and restorative. Um, I, th I think that offers us hope. And, and I love the next steps that, that came out from this in all our panels. Um, the upshot to really for me was that my hope for today was that we could situate our work in a context that we could emphasize that a myriad of voices, especially of those in the community, should be at the table in thinking about how law and policy at all phases of its formulation, implementation, and evaluation takes place. Um, we want to think about law and policy as a critical tool in efforts to advance health equity, but also recognize where it falls short and even more um, where it, when it actually impedes our efforts to achieve equity and how it has accountability to redress that. Um, and the same with public universities, how they can and should engage in communities to advance health equity um, and think about the proper nature of that role with some humility um, and sort of to seize opportunities, but also to hold ourselves accountable to the, the mission and vision um, and, and values that we say we stand by. Um, we've purposely included next steps throughout the day to guide another intent that this is not just a day, it's been an amazing day of conversation and insight sharing, but as a launch to additional action, right? It's not simply words. Um, we have been able to spread a spotlight, amazing people doing great things. And now it's time to sort of um, keep this conversation going and keep the collaboration going at, with the community and, and, and sort of achieve the, the goals and the ideals that we set out before us. Um, to that end, as mentioned before, today, um, UIC Law, we are officially launching our Health Equity Law and Policy Program as an additional resource in this work. Uh, we believe in law's key role in advancing health equity um, and obligation, our obligation as civil servants to partner in and with communities to advance these goals. Um, and being situated um, within UIC, um, as my colleague Renee mentioned, is just a great opportunity for us to engage across disciplines like those we had before us today and others um, and take our role kind of seriously as collaborative partners in this work. Um, we intend to take today's discussions and the resources that have been shared and ideas um, take them the next few weeks, work with it and create kind of a post symposium package of materials to get us started and, and sort of oriented in, in partnering in this work and invite your continued um, engagement. And so in very brief closing, um, you can't be raised in a house like I was raised and not sort of have a lot of Kennedy stuff going around. So I, you know, I always have these quotes, but to paraphrase um, Senator Robert Kennedy, um, who said so many years ago, some people see things as they are and ask why. I dream things of, that never were and ask why not. I invite you to join us today in moving from dream to reality and ask sort of the why not um, of an enduring health equity from the ground up community by community and structure by structure. So it's time to let the real work begin 
But perhaps first, um, as I bid you a wonderful weekend, I say, you know, maybe take the evening off and, and pop the champagne or something, do whatever, whatever fun activity you want to do right now. But I appreciate you all so much for, for all staying today and all that this day has been. Um, and I'm humbled by the day and excited to get to work. So thank you. <laughs>